All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, time being 5 p.m., I will uh, call to order the August 19th regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board uh, during COVID-19, during the declared local public health emergency, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board has transitioned to an electronic format for its public meetings and hearings. Uh, I'd also remind commissioners uh, that it is required to turn on your uh, audio and visual uh, when you are speaking. At this time, I will ask the secretary to please take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Here. Commissioner Muses. Point of order. Point of order. Uh, yes, Commissioner Corney. Yes, um, the district uh, six commissioners visual is not on. This does um, a violation of our rules and therefore disqualifies it as, as far as his attendance. I'd ask the district six, six commissioner to turn on his uh, visual when speaking. Uh, thank you, President Kogel. Uh, it'll take a little bit of time like in things like roll call to do that. So give me just a moment and I can turn it on. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. Here. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Hassan. Here. Yeah. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Severson. Present. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Meyer. Present. Commissioner Forney. Commissioner Forney. Present. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. Here. Vice President Vita. President Vita. Present. Madam Secretary, I hear a really bad echo. Yeah, we're just, that yeah, just started. started. Has anybody changed the settings on their computers? I did. Sorry. Sorry. President Kogil. Uh, present. You have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Secretary Ringgold. At this point, I would ask for a motion to approve the agenda. I move. Do we have a, do have a second? second? There's been a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Yes. Yes. I'd motion to amend the agenda to include the resolution encouraging prosecution authorities to dismiss charges against peaceful demonstrators arrested during the peace, during the clean of the Powderhorn Park encampment. Uh, okay. Commissioner, Commissioner French has made a motion uh, to amend the agenda, uh, and there has been a, a second uh, to the amendment of the agenda. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? President Kogil, who was the second? Uh, Commissioner Bourne. Okay. Is there any discussion on amending the agenda? Uh, seeing none, uh, I'll say that due to the fact that I just received the information um, a half an hour ago uh, and had asked for uh, the ability to see this uh, beforehand when I had a conversation with Commissioner French multiple weeks ago. Um, I would like time to look at this and I'm not prepared to put this on the agenda tonight. I have some legal concerns. I would like legal counsel also to look at it. Um, with that, I'll ask the secretary to take the role on amending the agenda. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Severson. Pass. 
Commissioner Meyer. No. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. No. Commissioner Forney. No. Vice President Vita. No. President Cogill. No. Commissioner Severson. Abstain. There are three ayes, five nays, one absten abstention. The amendment does not carry um, to the uh, agenda. Is there any additional discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on approving the agenda. Commissioner Bourne. No. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. No. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have seven ayes, two nays. Thank you. The agenda carries. Uh, I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, August 5th, 2020. So moved. Second. Uh, the minutes have been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the minutes, uh, approving the minutes from Wednesday the 5th? Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, I will ask the secretary to please take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Uh, aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have nine ayes. Uh, with the minutes being approved, we'll move into reports of officers. Uh, I will turn it over to Vice President Vita. Thank you, uh, President Cogill. Um, I just wanted to make um, an official statement about the work that I've been doing uh, out in encampments over the past week specifically, but I've been out visiting encampments this, um, the entire time that we've had people living in our parks. Um, so good evening to everyone. I just want to take a moment to share my perspective about the, outgoing, the ongoing situation with the encampments in our parks. On July 15th, I voted for resolution 2020-267. I voted to limit the number of encampments to 20 sites and limit the number of tents to 25 per site. In the history of MPRB, this kind of action has never been taken. All eight of my colleagues voted with me. It was the unanimous vote. I want to be very clear about why I voted this way. Prior to taking this vote, I visited encampments at least 20 times. During these visits, I spoke with many camp residents, quite a few of who I already know from my years of living and working in this city. During my visit, I saw drug dealing, a drug overdose, prostitution, violence, and absolutely unacceptable living conditions. I saw mostly black, black brown, and indigenous bodies living in the tent and white folks were hanging around the volunteer area. These advocates call these encampments sanctuaries. I can assure you that nothing I saw remotely resembles my idea of a sanctuary. Most of the residents I spoke to agreed with me. They told me that they wanted to find a better place to live, that they didn't feel safe, that there was violence, that they were scared, 
Living in our parks is not a solution to homelessness. No one should have to live in these conditions, especially when there are open shelter beds. Classifying these encampments as sanctuaries is misleading and predatory. It implies that people living in these encampments have what they need to lead happy and healthy lives. This is simply not the case. We can and must do better. In fact, there are options. The many shelter beds available right now. These beds are shorter term solutions to a longer, long term problem. Living in the park is not a solution at all. It is Minnesota and winter is coming. We must move people out of the parks to safer and more suitable housing now before the snow falls. Now I want to address what I've been doing to safely remove residents from our park. I've been on the front line trying to help residents leave the park with as much dignity as possible. Last week, I participated in the cleanups of Powderhorn, Elliott, and Kenwood Park. What I have seen is that camp residents, I in large, want to leave. We help them to find somewhere to go, and we connect them to services and resources. It is the protesters that are angry, not the residents. As a black person in America, you can believe I've had my fair share of run-ins with the police. None of those encounters was as scary as those encounters were with the mostly white protesters in the park. You might have seen the news reports about the park police using mace on protesters. The police had to use mace because the protesters were becoming violent. They were grabbing me and pulling me as I tried to leave Powderhorn Park. They were spitting, kicking, and banging the squad cars, smashing police body cameras, and throwing themselves in front of moving cars. After being asked to stop many times, Mace was finally deployed. I am sorry this happened. I didn't want it to happen, but I also don't know what other options were available. So I wanted to say to the sanctuary advocates that are protesting, I'm a black woman living in this country built, my, built by my ancestors who were brought here as slaves. I experienced poverty, trauma, scary encounters with law enforcement, racism, I spent my career trying to help others who look like me overcome these things. In this work, I've often seen well-meaning advocates fight for something that the community itself does not want or need. Well-meaning saviors who think that they know the answer to the problems of a community that they have never belonged to or even spent time trying to understand. So if you are here to speak against the clearing of encampments, I ask you to please stop and ask yourself why you are are against moving people out of these encampments? Is it because camp residents have told you that, that staying in park long term is what they want, or is it what you think these vulnerable people want? I believe it is important to listen to those we are trying to help. This is why I'm helping move people out of park. I've heard time and time again from camp residents that they want to leave. I personally babysat for a young man who was trying to get into a shelter and leave Powderhorn Park. While I was babysitting, I noticed that his baby boy was being swarmed by bees and needed to be cleaned immediately. Nothing felt safe about that to me. Not one thing felt safe about a baby being swarmed with bees to me. Those who are, those who, the, they want to go somewhere, they feel safer. They want to be out of the element. Those who are clean want to get away from drug use and drug dealing so they can stay sober. I would also like to assure you that park staff is not bulldozing belongings and are not bulldozing belongings. I witnessed our staff have conversations with folks living in encampments about their personal belongings and or abandoned belongings before anything was even touched. Park staff not only helped people pick up their items, but loaded them on cardboard vehicles, buses, and vans to be moved to other locations. I'll close by saying that I am proud of the way that NPRB has NPRB staff have handled this difficult situation. As chair of the Park Police Oversight Committee, I have been working closely with Chief Ohado. He has skillfully navigated through this. His force has done a good job of using de escalation and showing respect even while being disrespected. So thank you to our staff. I know this is not easy, but your efforts have not gone unnoticed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vita. Uh, Superintendent Bangora. Thank you, uh, President Kogel and Commissioners. I know we're in a time constraint here until 5, uh, 5.30, so I will do the best I can to get through 
the report that we want to share with you around encampments. So again, President Kogel and Commissioners, um, I appreciate this opportunity to provide uh, an update on park refuge spaces and temporary encampments for people currently experiencing homelessness. Uh, as, we have done the, as we've done since mid-June, I and other staff will provide information on a variety of topics with updates tonight on crime and safety, uh, the permit process, public comments, and an overview of current encampments and a financial update related to encampments. encampments. Um, so I know there's supposed to be a slide too, so I apologize, it'll come up here shortly. I don't see it. Um, next slide. So staff continue to work diligently to implement resolution 2020-267, which was unanimously approved by the board in mid-July, including reducing the number of parks with temporary encampments to no more than 20, limiting the number of tents per encampment to no more than 25, getting the encampments permitted and addressing those encampments that have documented violent and safety crime issues and safety issues. As of yesterday, there are 34 parks with temporary encampments down from 44 last Thursday and 12 of the 34 parks have only one to three tents. For the past two months, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board has committed significant resources to respond to temporary encampments in a humane and dignified manner. We have provided maintenance and hygiene station support, outreach and engagement, and assistance with the encampment permit process. When an encampment has needed to be removed due to crime, significant crime, its location within a school safe zone, or because it is not one of the permitted or designated sites, we have provided days of notice and on-site outreach and engagement so those living in park encampments are well aware and why they need to leave and what options are available to them. The use of law enforcement has always been the last option. So this is challenging work, both emotionally and physically, for all those involved. It's really disappointing the misinformation that has been shared by uh, several folks in the sanctuary movement in the pot or movement or the protesters. Mm -hmm. I was on site at all three, uh, at all three parks that were clear last week due to, uh, um, due to ongoing violent crime and the location of two of the encampments that are in a school safe zone. In all instances, our staff assisted in helping people on site gather and move their belongings. I was particularly disturbed by what I witnessed at Potterhorn West Encampment. People were living in unhealthy, alarming conditions at that encampment. I'm deeply concerned that the organizers of the encampment let it get to that point and that they wanted to perpetuate such terrible conditions for the black, brown, and white body people living there. And I could go further into that, but I was extremely shocked by what I saw. The protesters narrative that there was undue force and that was used, uh, that we used mace on innocent protesters is simply untrue. It is not true. After two weeks of notice to leave, daily on-site engagement and offers of transportation and even offering an alternative site for folks to go, there were still approximately 35 tents remaining on the West encampment last Friday. After we arrived on site, people were given several hours to pack up their belongings and staff assisted them. Some of the tents were abandoned and those tents were removed. Shortly after we arrived, two people were arrested for crossing the police tape and obstructing the process. Then at the very end, I'm sorry, um, otherwise the disbandment operation was calm until, pro until protesters showed up. Then at the very end, once the encampment was completely cleared and unsheltered people and belongings were gone, the protesters attacked park police officers as they were trying to leave the park, attacking, swarming, spitting, dirt being thrown on officers, grabbing at officers equipment, reaching into squad cars and blocking the path of officers. 
And again, if the dozens of the people who showed up to protest and to cause chaos had been done during the prior two weeks to assist people in moving, we would not have to have to use law enforcement at all. Having witnessed these events, I know our park police officers responded professionally and demonstrated admirable restraint. They did not create this issue of encampments within parks, but they're working hard to restore the parks to their intended use and to ensure safety for all that use them. As park staff continue to work towards getting permits for temporary encampments issued, we will also be working with Hennepin County to expand messaging about the availability of shelter spaces. Shelter is available daily for families through Hennepin County Shelter Team and for single adults through Adult Shelter Connect. There is no limit to family shelter capacity and there were recently dozens of private rooms available. According to Hennepin County, there are also openings in single adult shelter each day and there have been dozens of beds that have gone unused each night during the month of July. Hennepin County also reports that there are more than 100 openings each month for homeless designated housing programs, which are primarily rental subsidies and support services for people experiencing homelessness and are allocated on the basis of veteran status, disability, vulnerability, and length of time homelessness. Hennepin County Outreach staff has been, uh, has been at encampments on a regular basis to share this information. Park Outreach staff have been at parks daily talking to people living in parks about the permit process and informing people they will not be able to stay in non-permitted and non-designated sites. Park Outreach staff recently began distributing a resource guide from Hennepin County to help spread the word about shelter, spaces, and housing programs available. Despite all of our efforts, we have always acknowledged that the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board is not the agency to serve unsheltered people and that living in parks is not a dignified form of shelter. While I've been expressing MTRB's needs during routine conversations with our city, county, and state partners, and through participation in meetings with the Minnesota Interagency Council of Homelessness, today I sent a letter to the city and county officials to make a formal request for assistance and support in areas of housing, health and human services, and water and sanitation support. With that, I'm gonna turn this over to Chief Ahado for a crime and safety update. Good evening, commissioners. I'm gonna give a brief update on activities that have taken place since the last board meeting two weeks ago. Uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge Vice President Vita and Superintendent Bangora for coming out um, during the demobilizations that took place last week. Uh, my dad taught me that actions speak louder than words, and both of them have stepped up and have been there on the ground watching this very challenging work. And I admire them and thank them for that. Next slide, please. So as what's already been reported, uh, we demobilized three encampments last week. They were Elliott Park and Kenwood Park, uh, along with Powderhorn Park. Uh, the Elliott Park and Kenwood Park uh, demobilizations um, were successful. There were no arrests made uh, at each of those locations. Those took place on August 12th. Next slide. Um, we also provide a notice at PV Park on August 10th. Uh, we had plans to demobilize PV on August 12th um, when one of our officer, officers arrived along with an MTRB uh, equipment operator. Uh, they were uh, confronted and attacked by protesters. Some of these protesters physically climbed onto uh, the equipment operator's vehicle and equipment that he was towing, uh, preventing him from unloading. And we have um, left that operation in queue and have not moved forward to date. That is still unresolved. Next slide. Um, as what has already been widely reported, um, we did demobilize the Powderhorn Park encampment on Friday, August 14th. Uh, two arrests were made early during the operation for people who were crossing the police tape. Um, obstructing officers. One of those people uh, actually uh, damaged one of the police cars that was on scene. 
uh, significantly damaged the police car, more than $1,100 worth. Um, as noted, uh, Superintendent and Vice President Vita were, were present during the entire operation. Uh, throughout the operation, protesters began to amass on the 10th Avenue side of the park. Uh, they constantly berated staff, they spit at staff, uh, they threatened our officers, they unlawfully broke the police safe. As we were attempting to leave, they, they chased officers to their squad cars, uh, physically confronting them, including ripping body cameras and stealing two of uh, the officers' body cameras from their uniform. Nope. Um, the the office or the protesters attempted to prevent officers from leaving uh, by physically blocking squad cars and, and climbing onto those cars as well. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I'm I'm happy to report that uh, Powderhorn Park uh, is now encampment free. Um, we have uh, begun restoration of the park and the park is already being used uh, as it is intended. Next slide. Um, in the last two weeks, Loring Park has emerged as the most concerning location with an encampment. Here's a list of offense reports that have taken place during the last two weeks. Uh, particularly noteworthy was a shooting that took place last Friday, uh, August 14th. Uh, there was one man who was shot in the park um, uh, officers were actually in the park when the shooting took place. Uh, they immediately responded to the scene. They recovered a gun at the scene, uh, and they also confronted uh, another person um, as they were working that crime scene who also possessed a gun illegally, uh, and that person was arrested. So the, the shooting remains under investigation, and two guns were recovered um, last Friday at Loring Park. It is, it is important for commissioners to know that, that yesterday, members of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board Community Outreach Team uh, provided notice to the encampment at Loring Park, and we are currently working with outreach and social services uh, to begin encouraging people to relocate from Loring Park um, in advance of immobilizing that encampment. Next slide, please. I'll let commissioners um, review the rest of uh, these incidents uh, on their own time, in the interest of brevity, uh, what I've done is I've listed a number of um, crimes or offense reports that have taken place in various encampments uh, in the last two weeks. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, I think it's important to note that, you know, while these larger demobilizations uh, have gotten a lot of attention, our officers every day are working to provide notice at unauthorized encampments across the park system that are smaller, and we have been successfully providing that notice, and nearly all of those occupants um, have left and relocated on their own. Uh, I think that that is uh, one of the reasons why you have seen a uh, dramatic decline in the number of overall encampments across the park system in the last two weeks. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. President Cogill, do you want to wait to finish the report until after open time? Uh, thank you, Secretary Ringgold. Yes, uh, I think that that would be uh, the right move. I know we have a good number of folks signed up for open time. Um, we're going to begin with uh, those who uh, signed up to um, provide their comments uh, through the, uh, the call-in option. Um, and uh, so the time being 5.30 p.m., uh, I will uh, now uh, begin open hot time. Uh, this is the opportunity that the public has to uh, speak uh, to commissioners. Commissioners do not respond to uh, the comments. Uh, it's our opportunity to listen. Um, we uh, have many people signed up, and I will allocate one minute per speaker. Um, and uh, we tolerate um, uh, all kinds of uh, speaking on any subject, just we do not tolerate um, any harassing or discriminatory language uh, or any comments uh, on pending personnel issues. Um, I will ask uh, 
all uh, speakers to be cognizant of the one minute time uh, frame for your comments. Uh, I will let you know when a minute is up. Um, please do wrap up your comments at that point. Um, if you have additional comments, you can certainly submit them to the secretary of the board or send them to commissioners by email. Um, I would also ask for uh, those who are speaking in person, and I'll make a couple more reminders about this um, at the board, uh, in the board chambers, to speak uh, about two feet away from the microphone. Um, we found that when folks are closer to that, it's hard for commissioners to hear uh, the speaker. Um, and I'd also uh, ask that you uh, make sure that uh, we, we can have that uh, um, camera uh, up so we can see you um, as you're speaking, which is helpful um, for us to hear your comments and be able to see what you're saying. Um, so with that, I will move into uh, open time. Uh, our first uh, commenter uh, for speaking is Ms. Bowler. Uh, is Ms. Bowler uh, able to come on to the um, onto the virtual meeting and uh, provide her one minute of comment? Hi, this is the administrator. I do not have her on. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Lars Carlson. We have Lars on. We do not have Lars on. Okay. We'll continue down the list. Uh, our next speaker is Max Friedman. He is coming on now. All right, Max, if you state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have a minute to address the board. Uh, my name is Max Friedman. I live at 3132 Cedar Avenue South, a few blocks away from Powderhorn Park. And I'd like to express my absolute disgust at the park boards and superintendents violently displacing our neighbors the way the board has done time and time again is morally repugnant. Why do we continue to criminalize the most vulnerable in our society? Why do we continue to punish these human beings for being unsheltered? Why are we simply moving the problem around violently instead of solving it? It's like withholding food from a diabetic as punishment for having low blood sugar. It's ass backwards. It doesn't make any sense. Housing is the solution. Public housing, not more shelters. You're going to shove people into shelters during COVID? Winter is coming off. Evil or are you stupid? I'd like to uh, say that you should amend Resolution 2020-267, guarantee no evictions, do not move anyone without their consent, uh, discontinue the use of the police force and machinery to terrorize and intimidate residents into leaving their homes, revoke the unilateral power of the superintendent to evict any encampment at will, and immediately make public demands for funding and support for residents of encampments and housing solutions from higher bodies of government. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Panetta. Do we have Elizabeth on the phone? Elizabeth is on now. Elizabeth, thank you. You can uh, start your one minute of comment now and you can state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Panetta. I live at 2844 Columbus Avenue. I'm a Phillips West community member. I'm also a clinical social worker for youth experiencing homelessness. The fact that I'm seeing such extensive traumatizing and violent evictions against many of the black and native youth that I'm working with is absolutely horrifying. I have been asking the Parks and Recreation Department to take a stand against these evictions and I have not seen these actions happen. Right now, I am asking you to uplift the following demands and repair the harms that you have allowed to happen. MR MPRB must immediately amend Resolution 2020-267 to guarantee no evictions of the encampments. No one in our parks will be moved without their consent. No police force or machinery will be used to terrorize and intimidate residents into leaving their homes. I also am asking to revoke the unilateral power of the superintendent to evict any encampments at will, and you must immediately make public demands for funding and support for residents of encampments and housing solutions from higher bodies of government. There should be no evictions on stolen land. Thank you. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Our next speaker is Frederick Turan. Uh, Frederick, are you, uh, is Frederick on the line? Frederick is coming on. Great. Frederick, if you could state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record and you have one minute to address the Hello? Hello, Frederick. You can go ahead now. You have one minute. Well, my, my name is, uh, I'm, hello, my name is Frederick. I'm an envision leader and also the consultant. Um, also a research, on the research team. Frederick, did you have anything else to say? No, um, no, 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 that's it. Thank you, Frederick. Our next speaker is uh, Samantha Priestinson. Uh, Samantha, uh, is Samantha on? Samantha is on now. Thank you, Samantha. You can go ahead and state your name if you're comfortable. Your address for the record. Yes, it's Samantha Cree Gonzalez, formerly Simpson, and my address is 3338 Benjamin Street, Northeast. Um, so I'm here again today to talk about this, what I now found out today to be no variance procedure with the Parks Board. Um, and I don't think that it's incredibly difficult or anything that you have to create a lot of bureaucracy around. I think it should work as any other function in this city when somebody is requesting to do something that's outside of the scope in which has been prescribed. In this particular case, I don't see why it's this difficult to get what I'm requesting in front of the Parks Board members so that they can take a vote. Because according to your staff, Michael Schrader, it is the Parks Board themselves, the commissioners, who get to decide. I've already been waiting two weeks, and it's dangerous to continue to be out like that under these conditions. We are at that location for a very specific reason. Remember, women were being raped over at Powderhorn, and that site was selected for a very specific reason. School is not in session right now and is not going to be by the time that um, the permit expires that I asked for, which was October 1st. In addition to that, state law dictates, as you know, what can be in or what kind of businesses or activities can be in a school zone. People simply being unhoused is not one of them. So I'm trying to figure out why this board would create more red tape and criminalize homelessness and then further attach homelessness to crime and violence by saying that the reason for um, harmfully removing people from their homes um, in their tents, that somehow that is related to crime and violence. Let's be real here. The crime and violence that's been happening at Loring Park, at other parks, has long been standing there, way before there were people camping in it. So to associate the unhoused with criminal activity and say that if the criminal activity in that park doesn't go down, then that's a reason to bulldoze it, I don't think that that's acceptable. I also don't think it's acceptable that your park police, because Minneapolis Police Department has come out and tweeted um, and, and other communications to say that they are not the ones that have been helping with the bulldozing and getting people out of the encampments. That is, it has indeed been the park police. So why you're allowing for them to carry an arsenal like rubber bullets and to be macing people, there are various videos showing them macing people who are not doing anything. They were simply trying to get out what they could. Tens of thousands of dollars by your community members, by your constituents that elected you, and some perhaps not, have paid for those things out of their own pocket. There is no grant money or other relief coming from anywhere. And when you bulldoze those camps like that, whether you give 24, 48, or 72 hours notice, you are wasting thousands of dollars that the community has put forward to try and partner to be part of the solution. The other thing that I want to tell you about our camp if is you, that 21 you, women... Beyond the minute, if you could wrap it up, please, Ms. Priestman. 21 women, one child, two women that are pregnant, 15 of them have been housed in treatment or both. What we're doing at our camp works. And without this permit, you force us to have to de-escalate in ways that nobody should have to when we have to ask people to leave. The same de-escalation that the police that you send there with rubber bullets and mace and other um, caustic chemicals, the same thing that they refuse to do with the community that they serve, which is to de-escalate. But you're forcing us to have to do it in ways, like I said, that are unimaginable because you simply won't grant a permit. And I'm asking for you at this next press board meeting to grant the variance. This is ridiculous. Thank you, Ms. Priestinson. 
Our next speaker is Loretta Arandando. Uh, is Loretta on? They're on now. All right. Loretta, if you'd like to state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hi, my name is Loretta Arandando, and you said you needed my address? You, if you're comfortable, you can state your address. Um, my address is 9200 Golden Valley Road, so I am a Golden Valley resident. I'm getting ready to move into Minneapolis. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I would like to discuss briefly um, the topic that you all tabled on August 5th um, regarding the residents, the community that are housed in the encampments. Um, and I would just like to say I'd like to see um, some real planning <clears throat> and more serious conversation around um, being able to house some of those individuals in the encampments <clears throat> in um, that building that's located in Northeast Minneapolis. So I just want to commend the council members that are trying to pursue that mission. Um, I am a former, former housing case manager, and I know the importance of families and individuals being housed and how much joy it brings them and stability. So that is really what I'm pushing for. Also, um, I have a friend <clears throat> by the name of Stacy Bell um, who is going into the parks. I just want you to know. Um, she's going into the parks, and she is making um, um, vegetable soup from her gardens and her gardens around um, the city um, with people at the uh, Mill City Market and um, people from U of M. And the, the unsheltered community really appreciates um, what she's doing down there. And, you know, it's, it's fresh vegetables. It's, we're bringing in masks. And we're doing the work that we can do to make sure that the, the individuals that are unsheltered down there are feeling, you know, like they're still a part of the community. So if we can, you know, really try to push for getting that temporary uh, shelter or housing and that building that you all were talking about on uh, in northeast Minneapolis, we would really, really, truly appreciate it and we would stand behind that work. Thank you, thank you, Loretta. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, I believe, Ruby Gosha. Ruby, are you on? We do not have Ruby on. Okay. Uh, our next speaker then is Dwayne Parker. Is Dwayne on? Dwayne is on now. Dwayne, if you'd state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to, it's imperative for me to give all thanks, praise, and honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Without him, I wouldn't be here before you today. Secondly, I would like to thank the Park Board and everyone in attendance at this meeting. My name is Dwayne Park, and I'm a member of Street Voices of Change and the Indigenous Community Leader. We are so delighted that the Park Board is considering the development of Indigenous communities at the 1720 Marshall Street site. We know the Park Board wants to do everything we can to help people experiencing homelessness. Developing and vision community is one tangible way for the Park Board to provide that assistance. As you may know, Envision is designed and led by people with lived experience of homelessness. It is truly a grassroots effort. Everything from the design of our micro homes to the operations of the community were designed by people with lived experience. We have a shared unit at Eden Church, and we would absolutely love to have each of you come and see our micro home and learn more about Envision. Thank you, God bless. Thank you, Duane. Mm -hmm. um, our next speaker is um, Cam Winton, uh, Cam, is Cam on? Cam is on now. Fantastic, Hi, Cam. Cam. Go ahead, you have one minute to address the board, Cam. Great, 
Thank you. My name is Cam Winton. I live at 1715 Logan Avenue South near the Kenwood Park. And I wanted to share briefly the experience that I and other neighbors had near Kenwood Park in order to say thank you to the Park Board Commissioners, Park Board staff, and Park Police officers who addressed the really serious violent crime that was occurring there. There's a different discussion to have on a different day about the underlying legality of what the Park Board has done by allowing encampments into the park. And, and respectfully, I submit for your consideration that it's not legal and it's not appropriate to have encampments at all in the park system. But that's really not my focus today. I respect the experiences that a, a previous speaker said when she said the crime has always been there and that when the encampments came, that was not adding additional crime. Uh, I respect that, that may be the case at the encampments that she's familiar with. That was not the case at the Kenwood Park encampment, and I know it's not the case at plenty of other encampments across the city. The trafficking of disadvantaged young women into uh, really sexual slavery, the, the sex trafficking that occurred there, the sex offenders engaging in violent conduct, the pistol whipping of a woman, the bleeding encampment residents showing up on house neighbors' doorsteps in the middle of the night, all of those things were new due to the encampment. And neighbors here have realized that there is a deep moral problem with our fellow human beings being unhoused. And so neighbors in this neighborhood and plenty of other neighborhoods hard to, in the short time that this has been front and center for everybody, try to get going with a tiny house village. Press on all levels of government to provide additional funding for unhoused. So in my very short remaining time here, I want to say that those efforts will continue to try to find housing for our fellow human beings who lack it. But to come around to the thank you, when park board commissioners realized that there were significant unintended consequences here, they and park staff and park police worked to humanely place fellow human beings who had been in that park into another place, into shelter. I watched it with my own eyes. And so it's disappointing to me when well-intentioned activists describe how these cops are always horrible. It's simply false. It's simply false. I've seen the humanity that they brought to this very difficult job. And so I ask you, if you could wrap up your, your comments. Thank, Thank you. you for what you've done. All the best. Thank you, Mr. Winton. Our next speaker is Pastor Paul Olson. Is Pastor Paul on line? They are online now. Pastor Paul Olson, if you would uh, like to state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record. Hi, and you have, uh, one, you have one minute. Paul Stephan Olson at Elam Church. Elam Church is located at 685 13th Avenue Northeast across from Logan Park. Uh, I reside at 16 Tyler Street. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking some comments tonight. You heard from Dwayne, who is one of the Envision uh, leaders for Envision Community. Um, Elam Church for many years has run cold weather shelters, hosted temporary shelters, and we are supporting uh, Envision by hosting their show unit in our parking lot because we want to support underrepresented communities as they organize themselves in innovative ways. Too often we focus on the criminality of homelessness. We focus on what homeless uh, people experiencing homelessness uh, do wrong. Uh, but in this case, uh, they have organized themselves in an innovative way, creating space for people uh, to advance equitable housing practices and systems in our city. And I think we should pay attention. Uh, in that sense, the vision community is much uh, more than just housing people. It positions un underrepresented communities to shape housing policy for a city and to participate in their own liberation in, in, uh, in that sense. When such Thanks. communities and groups create innovative... You can wrap it up, please. ...for our city and our government, uh, we should take notice. We should uh, pay attention. Um, Northern Church has been a part of the housing movement for many decades in Minneapolis, going back to uh, the early 80s and uh, even before that. Um, our ministry of health continues to serve folks affected by lack of adequate housing. We are directly affected by this as a church, and we see it as part of our mission. Uh, we're partnered with groups like MICA and groups like Envision because it fits our mission, and we want the park board to be a part of this bigger movement by allowing the development of vision, uh, Envision Community at 1720 Marshall Street. We're excited and 
and happy that uh, the Park Board is considering that development and would ask for your support tonight. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Our next speaker is Robin Bruggeman. Uh, Robin, is, is Robin online? They are online. Thank you. Robin, if you'd state your name, if you're comfortable with your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hi, uh, my name is Robin Bergman. I live on Logan and Lowry Hill. Um, I want to thank the Park Board for fulfilling their promise to remove the encampment at Kenwood Park and the other encampments that were identified as being dangerous. I would like to point out that the mere idea of having vulnerable, unhoused people, some of whom have mental disabilities and chemical dependencies, to live in a park is inherently dangerous. There has been violence, prostitution, and human trafficking in many encampments. Crime is up 70% in the parks and is directly attributable to the encampment. The park police are not funded, equipped, or trained to deal with the problems associated with homeless, uh, homelessness. We are living with a pandemic, a pandemic that requires significant isolation. The parks are more important than ever. Having a safe place to get outside and get away from those you're confined with is crucial to the mental health and physical health of all Minneapolis residents. Kids especially need a safe place to go given that many camps and pools have been closed all summer. The dangerous and illegal activities that have been identified in the encampments are a deterrent to those who wish to use them for gathering and recreation, thereby limiting their use to one group. The Robin, if you could, if you could wrap parks, it up. All right, the parks were not established, nor have they been maintained to provide for just one group of people. Um, I want to give out to the, give a shout out to the Park Police. Thank you for all you're doing. I know it's been very difficult. Um, please end this illegal and unwise use of the park so that we all who wish to enjoy them can. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Our next speaker is Margaret Berg. Margaret, are you online? They are on now. Margaret, if you'd state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. All right, attention, I would Am I on now? Yeah. Okay. Um, you have one minute. Margaret. Oh, this is Margaret Berg, and I am this evening wanting to represent the League of Women Voters. I personally live at 1201 Yale Place near Loring Park, and we um, know that the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board staff are asked to perform services on a daily basis for which they have been unprepared, such as removing unprecedented levels of trash and providing and cleaning sanitary facilities. And we've been hearing a lot about the demobilization tonight. And we know this they're doing this in sometimes stressful or dangerous circumstances. The League of Women Voters of Minneapolis Parks Committee commends and thanks all the Minneapolis Park and Rec staff members, including the planning staff, the administrative staff, and the park police for their exemplary service to those in need and to all who love and use our beautiful parks. And on another note, we, are, we hope the commissioners will continue to use the video as much as possible. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ms. Berg. Our next speaker is Jacob Kerrigan. Is Jacob on? They are on now. Great, Jacob, if you... Jacob, if you would state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Yes, Jacob Kerrigan from South Minneapolis. Um, yeah, I am here once again to advocate for the removal of the ordinance PV2-21. Um, Ultimately, this ordinance reinforces uh, sexist culture. Um, it looks like we had dropped the caller. Okay. Um, if he gets back on, we'll come back to him. Good. Um, Moving forward, our next speaker is Allison Townley. Allison is on now. 
Allison, uh, if you'd state your name and if you're comfortable your address, you have one minute to address the board. Okay, thank you. Um, it's Allison Townley, and uh, we've, uh, you probably heard many of us been kicked out, so I'm sorry I haven't been following the meeting anymore. Uh, but thank you for hearing me. Um, in Minneapolis, we are fortunate to have one of the best urban public park systems in the world. Through thoughtful stewardship and hard work, the park board staff create and maintain beautiful, safe, open green spaces for all residents to recreate and to emotionally recharge during extraordinarily stressful times like now. The parks are the great equalizer. Unlike many cities around the country, there is no requirement to prove your residency to play tennis, to set up volleyball nets, to paddle, meditate, or meet a group of friends in a socially distanced picnic. I want to publicly thank and acknowledge the park board staff who are unsung heroes who steward our precious park system for us to enjoy now and for future generations. They have a huge responsibility that most of us take for granted. I venture to assume the folks who work within our park system choose this path for many different and very personal reasons, including they value the social importance of public access to urban green spaces for all especially underserved groups and children. I will guess that that decision process, they never imagined they would be told to redirect their services from providing children's recreational programming or maintaining a delicate green ecosystem tasked by millions of visitors a year to the work of cleaning up excessive needles, excessive amounts of human feces, responding to excessive amounts of violence, fires, and significant increase in sexual violence and exploitation of women and children that have come alongside these park encampments. The park police report a 70% increase in violent crime directly related to the encampment. The park encampments are not a solution. Simply put, it is irresponsible and inhumane and possibly trauma-inducing to tell park staff who did not choose this line of work and do not have sufficient training or the resources to manage the social, emotional, and often illegal activities of the people in these free-for-all, under-resourced, lawless encampments. We can all agree that homelessness is a complicated humanitarian crisis, and that it is why there are not-for-profit and government agencies that have the skilled staff and resources, the budget, and the mandate to address this important challenge. The parks and the people who steward them play their own very important role in society, creating a healthy, safe environment for us all to share. And when we divert this staff and this limited budget, the important work of the park suffers. And not only does the work suffer, the people suffer. At the top of that list, I place the staff themselves and the children who rely on the parks now more than ever to deal with this historically stressful time. Please continue to shut down these illegal encampments and redirect your resources back to your important mission. Stop allowing the parks and the encampments to be used as pawns in a political agenda. Reports from the unhoused residents, residents themselves, the neighbors, the police, sex trafficking victim groups cite an unmanageable lawless free for all, which is dangerous for the people who occupy the encampment, the neighbors, and all who rely on the parks for safe recreation. The facts prove this was a well intended yet failed attempt. Please wrap it up. Okay, You're I will. I ask the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to get out of the encampment business and consider redirecting those resources to hiring unemployed high school and college kids stuck at home due to the pandemic to work with your staff to help greatly expand organized activity, mentoring, and tutoring for our young children. This is more aligned with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board mission and will provide youth jobs and critical support for parents, caregivers, and children struggling to cope with the ongoing COVID reality. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Our next speaker is Dana Alpeter. Uh, Dana, uh, if you, is Dana on? Yes, I am. Great, Dana, if you could state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Dana? Is Dana on? Dana is on. Uh, 
I can't hear her as, um, I don't know, can others hear her? We cannot, it does not seem like she is speaking. Okay. Well, Dana, is that, are you on? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Dana, okay. we can. Please, uh, I'm sorry. Hey. thank you. It's all good, thank you have you. one minute to address the board. This is Dana, uh, Al Peter, I uh, am on, live on Lake of the Isles Parkway. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minneapolis Park Board and staff and Minneapolis Park Board Police for nobly trying to fill the need for additional homeless shelter upon the governor's request, despite the fact that uh, the details that were stated tonight, that there were beds available at that time and currently. The Park Board's mission is to provide, provide safe parks for all. This is what they are funded trained and staffed to do. However, the 70% increase in violent crime demonstrates clearly the need for the government agencies that are trained, staffed, and funded to support the homeless in our communities that are the most in need, need to do their job in a dedicated fashion to provide safe environments. The idea that the park board can now step in with the lack of training, staffing, and uh, funding is not the answer. We cannot just push this off onto another entity because the entity that is dedicated to deal with the homeless in a responsible way may not be doing the job in a way that serves all needs. But it does not mean that the park board and the park systems that are supposed to provide a safe place for all is the answer, as has been clearly demonstrated by the very significant increase in violent crime. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dana. Our next speaker is Madison Vale. Madison, is, are you on? We do not have Madison on. Okay. Um, we will come back to, to Madison if she does get on. Um, our next speaker is Margaret Hastings. Is Margaret on? Margaret is on now. Great. Margaret, if you'd state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, you have one minute to address the board. Yes, well, my name is Margaret Hastings. I'm at 4520 First Avenue South. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I wanted to uh, urge you to consider supporting the use of uh, undeveloped parkland for the tiny homes and vision community. Um, at the start of your meeting, uh, one of your commissioners mentioned to providing dignified housing, which also includes what people experiencing homelessness need and want. And Envisions has worked very hard over the years to do a thoughtful analysis and development of this community. And it's not simply putting people into housing, it actually is that social fabric as well as healthcare. Uh, so Hennepin Healthcare has been an important partner in developing the Envisions community. And what I am asking that you do is make thoughtful consideration for the sort of dignified homes that we all deserve. And again, this also means that the park land being used has not been developed yet, so it is not interfering with current park land that is being used. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm told that um, Jacob is now uh, back on um, is that accurate? Jacob is on now. All right, Jacob, you have a minute to address the board. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, please vote to repeal the discriminatory ordinance PB2-21. This ordinance is sexist, transphobic, and outdated. It reflects an unhealthy perspective on female and trans bodies and criminalizes thus breastfeeding. It's not right that men can be shirtless at the parks and no one else can. Thank you. Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. Our next speaker is Eloise DeWitt. Uh, is Eloise on? 
We do not have a liaison. Okay. Come back. Uh, our next speaker is Anna Blaine. We do not have Anna Blaine on. Right. Our next speaker is David Greenberg. David is on now. David, if you'd state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, you have one minute to address the board. Thank you. My name is David Greenberg. I live on the 2700 block of 40th Avenue South, just a half block from the Brackett Park, Safe Haven Encampment. And I'm speaking in favor of the board granting a permit to OA Strategy Solutions for operation of this encampment. As a neighbor and someone who is seeing homeless, clo homelessness close up and personal in a new way, I believe this permit should be granted. I volunteered at the, in, at the encampment, as has my wife and many of my neighbors. I've talked to many of my neighbors who live immediately across from the encampment. Overwhelmingly, we support this encampment. It is well run. It is safe. It has not led to any serious issues in our neighborhood. We have seen how many volunteers who live throughout the city are stepping up in amazing ways to ensure the safety, security, and well-being of those in the encampment. While we know this encampment is clearly not a permanent solution for homelessness, it is a safe, temporary place for many women and children. So there's the question of it being close to a school. Yes, a high school is across the park over three blocks away. As a parent of a high school student, I do not see this as an issue. But for the high school, it is doing remote learning for the foreseeable future, so students are not even there. This encampment is well run. It is safe, as noted by the data presented by Chief uh, Otto. The park continues to be active and used by all in the community. Basketball, softball, park equipment, skate park, tennis. This park is alive and well with the encampment here. And the park, the encampment has not impacted access to this park in any way. The folks living at and volunteering at this encampment are good neighbors and they are welcome in our community. Please grant this permit now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Carrie Jo Felder. Um, Director Felder, if you'd like to, uh, are, are you on? We do not have Kerry Felder. Okay, we'll come back to Director Felder um, later. Our next speaker is uh, Karen Peterson. Is Karen, Karen is on. Karen, if you'd uh, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, you have one minute to address the board. Um, my name is Karen Peterson. I live at 215 Broadway Street Northeast. I'm the current president of the Sheridan Neighborhood Organization. Greetings, President Calgill, neighbors, uh, board members. Um, over the last several months, Sheridan Neighborhood Organization has gotten to know the Envision Community Partners and their proposal, and we've become very strong partners and very much in support of this project. We welcome the opportunity to join the Envision Community Development Team as we further engage the neighborhood and surrounding 1720 Marshall Street. We feel strongly that the entire area will be greatly improved. A safer, more beautiful neighborhood will emerge with the construction of the environment Envision community. They have our Envision has already uh, completely been responsive to everything we have asked. There will be no impediment to the future riverhood bike path. A new open community park will be developed, again, with much broad community engagement. Uh, in conclusion of my remarks, I point out that we are facing the obvious. We are in stark reality. Hundreds upon hundreds of our neighbors are facing trauma of unsheltered life. Thank you. Sir. Does that mean I'm done? Uh, yes, that does. That was the one minute. Okay. I just want to thank you for opening up the parks. I appreciate your um, uh, providing a refuge. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Karen. Our next speaker is Victor Martinez. Is Victor there? We do not have Victor on. Okay. Our next speaker is Jace Kester. Is Jace on? Jace is on now. Great. Jace, if you could state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hello? Hello. You have one minute to address the board. Hi, my name is Jace Koster. I live on the south side of Powderhorn Park. I've lived here for three years, and I'm calling to express my enormous pain and disgust at the use of armed disgust at the use of armed law enforcement and heavy machinery to evict the human beings that seek sought refuge in the park two blocks from my house. 
I'm calling today as a Jewish person, as a Minneapolis resident, and as a child of someone who has experienced homelessness and housing insecurity. Watching the horrifying violence inflicted on people in our parks, I truly wonder, would you do this to your mothers? My mother spent a significant time as a young person in and out of housing security. And when I stand in an encampment, I'm acutely aware that these people are our families. They are our families and our children and our parents. I'm calling today to ask some park commissioners and leadership to meet the following demands and stop hazardous evictions, including the Minneapolis Parks and Recreation Board amending resolution 2020-267 to guarantee no evictions, not to move anyone without their consent, and not to use police force or machinery to terrorize and intimidate refuge residents, revoking the unilateral power of the superintendent to evict encampments, and immediately making public and actionable demands for more funding and support for residents of the encampment. I appreciate the time to speak today um, and hope that you continue, that you will do the right thing and protect everybody in our city. Thank you, Chase. Our next speaker is Alicia Price. Is Alicia on? We do not have Alicia on. Next speaker is Constance Pepin. Is Constance available? Constance is on now. All right, Constance, if you'd state your name and if you're comfortable your address for the record, you have uh, one minute to address the board. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I'm speaking for a coalition of local bird conservation groups who are very concerned about the amount, type, and timing of pesticide treatments in Roberts Bird Sanctuary by the Metropolitan Mosquito Control District. These treatments are harming non-target animals, including birds and frogs. We urge commissioners to direct staff to suspend any MMCD treatments in Roberts Bird Sanctuary for the rest of this year and until data is obtained and analyzed that shows a need for these treatments. We first submitted this request before the pandemic began. Fall bird migration has started. We have learned that MMCD is continuing to apply methoprene an even more toxic chemical than the BTI that is claimed to affect only mosquito larvae. Even the widely used BTI may not be as environmentally friendly as previously thought as studies reveal adverse effects on the reproductive success of birds. Methoprene kills a wider range of insects that are food sources for birds. Methoprene is known to, talk, to be toxic to amphibians too. Many toads and frogs live in the sanctuary. Methoprene may have severe developmental effects on frogs and cause disformities. We have looked for data. Wrap it up. Okay, thank you. We have looked for data and not found any documented cases of mosquito-borne disease in or near the sanctuary. Please suspend treatments for the remainder of this year in order that data can be obtained and analyzed so that any treatments are based on science and on need rather than on habit or on perceived need that is not proven. Thank you. Thank you, Constance. Um, I'll just note to um, the, those that are uh, waiting to speak uh, virtually as well as those who are waiting to speak in person that there is a time certain public hearing regarding the ecological systems plan at 630. So we will be moving over to that time certain public hearing, uh, and then we'll come back to uh, open time uh, after that is done, and that will be at 6.30. Moving on, uh, our next speaker is Ari O'Sullivan. Is Ari, Ari on? Ari is not on. President Kogo, we don't have any more callers remaining. Okay. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will move into uh, the in-person call, uh, the in-person speakers uh, that we have. Um, our first uh, speaker um, here is Lynn Gaspardo. Lynn, if uh, you'd be comfortable coming forward to the dais and stating your name and your address. Uh, if you're comfortable and you have one minute to address the board. Gotcha. My name is Lynn. I live across the street from Franklin Franklin Square. The park board is happy to trot out a resolution 2027 to the press. In reality, at Franklin Steel Square, they are in violation of 10 out of 16 of these resolutions. 
Franklin Steel Square is a small 1.5 acre park situated in a residential neighborhood, neighborhood with many low income housing buildings, one of which actually abuts the park. Other, all other designated encampment parks are well over five acres. For many years, my neighbors and the neighborhood association worked closely with the park board to decrease violence and drug use in state Franklin Steel Park. This was the first year we had seen our neighborhoods take back our park. Kids were using the playground, neighbors were walking their dogs, playing catch, and using the half-court basketball court, which is now surrounded with a fence for the encampment. As of August 10th, the park board sent us, set up this fence, taking more than 10% of Franklin Steel Square for an encampment without a permit. Meaning there is no oversight at the encampment. Two days later, the evicted people from nearby Elliott, PV, and Powderhorn Parks due to increased violence, according to them. Many people were transported directly to Franklin Steel Square. Within days, there were multiple calls for a 911 regarding shots fired at 17th, 17th and Portland. The, the encampment is right there. Um, our residents have been harassed. They're, the playground is deserted. Encampment residents block trails and sidewalks. At least 50% of the tents are not within the encampment area. Our residents go completely un our, our, ans our questions go in unanswered by the board. We've left voicemails, emails. Nobody talks to us. Nobody gives us any direction on how to help when all of these resolutions and your rules are not being followed. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the comment, Lynn. Our next speaker is Jim Hurst. Jim, if you are there, uh, you could approach the dais and uh, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have one minute to address the, war the board. Good evening, uh, Mr. President and council members. For the record, my name is Jim Hurst. I'm a resident at uh, 600 East 16th Street, Minneapolis, across the street from Franklin Steel Square. I have lived there for 30 years. That park is an acre and a half in size. And you have determined that that is an appropriate spot for an encampment. I don't understand the rationale or the reasoning of this. It is too small to accommodate. Not only that, it has had a history of problems. We have worked very hard in our neighborhood to try and turn that park around. And now it has been deemed as an encampment and it is going to bring a host of problems and is gonna put us backwards for all the hard work that we have done. I am not saying, oh, exclude my park and put them somewhere else. Quite honestly, in my opinion, it is not appropriate to put these encampments in any of these parks. You are going against your own mission. Every one of you should be ashamed. This is something for the city and the county and the Met Council to deal with, not the park board. It is taking away scarce resources from you that should be allocated for other purposes to your core mission. Jim, if you could wrap it up. I will. Thank you. I don't know what made you do this or how you even, you know, even thought this through. In closing, you know what, hindsight is 2020, but I would say hindsight should have been 2019. You should have seen the warning signs of pursuing a policy like this when we had the Hiawatha encampment and the problems that were associated with that. But instead, you went roughshod through, didn't think this through, and now you're paying the prices for it. And it's going to be even uglier when you finally do shut down these parks, uh, these encampments. With that, I'd love to take questions, but my time has expired. Thank you very much. And in the future, could you all please respond to my emails, especially my own commissioner, you, President Cowgill. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Our next speaker is Lisa Clemens. Uh, Lisa, if you'd like to come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record. Um, and uh, I might, one moment, oh, it looks like we do have now visual, great. Um, if you state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you do have one minute to address the board. Okay, my name is Lisa Clemens. I'm the founder of a Mother's Love Initiative, initiative a boots on the ground organization. My office is in South Minneapolis, 3451 Cedar Avenue South, but I do boots on the ground work in North Minneapolis and citywide. 
I just want to uh, stand in support of a youth center, at-risk youth center, combined with an African-American museum inside the Gordon Center, 16th and Queen. And I'll just say this. Uh, Commissioner French, you said, when, when you first moved here, you said that kids listen more to those who are former gang members. That would be us who are boots on the ground. You said you recall the time when the parks and teamwork programs helped at-risk youth. You said you want a program to focus on kids who don't get their shit straight, that need the help, and I want that to come back by creating jobs and activities for kids to do to get out of trouble, because they get in trouble for some dumb shit that they do, so let's keep their asses busy. Right. Hassan, you said we need to push for better youth programs. I'm willing to work with everyone to have a voice in this city. Hassan, you also said our youth people are in crisis, like teen teamworks and rec centers. They need activities. The city's own blueprint for action preventing youth violence in Minneapolis, the strategic racial equity action plan, both says that increasing youth programs are among the most effective ways to reduce crime and violence. You said our kids can't wait. We agree with you. We would like to give that building back to the youth and the families in that community. I would also ask, since our time is so short, that Chris Myers recuse yourself from the board, from the commission board, because you have already spoken your vote and tried to influence people on this park board to support what you believe should happen. Our voices have not been heard. Kel Severson, every one of you who ran, you said you were running on the youth voice? making things better for the youth in our community, and we're asking you to stand on that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Clemens. Um, our, uh, I want to remind uh, speakers uh, in person to please uh, stay about uh, a foot and a half, two feet from the mic. Uh, when we get too close, it gets a bit hard uh, for commissioners to hear comments. Our next speaker is K.G. Wilson. K.G., if you come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you do have one minute to address the board. Uh, K.G. Wilson, uh, Mother's Love Outreach, um, 3316 First Avenue South. So um, I'm here also, along with uh, Lisa Clemens, uh, to speak on this youth center that should be built over here on 16th and Queen. Uh, the reason why I say this because I think that instead of taking from, you should always add to. Um, there's a park there where kids are playing. If you was to go through there, visibly they're playing every day there. Um, there's a school building next to it. I think that might be closed that I think could also be used also uh, for those youth. And so um, I personally think that um, a youth center, like I did hear her say early, would be a great place for the youth that where they could be fed there. There's a kitchen there also. Uh, positive mentorship uh, could be done there. Uh, future leadership, uh, teaching the kids future leadership there. Uh, and I'm personally somebody who will actually be a part of that. So thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, KG. Our next speaker is Cheryl Anderson. Cheryl, if you'd come forward, uh, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record. You have one minute to address the board. Uh, my name is Cheryl Anderson. I'm very comfortable with saying where I live in the North Minneapolis Fifth, fifth Ward, 1710 Russell. I live right around the corner from Gordon Center Willard. And I'm just going to say that um, we shouldn't have a shelter there. You should be looking for something to house for the children for them to have something a learning center right now the children are in a disarray because they have nowhere they have nothing they have no direction because you have not placed anything i and i stand with lisa in saying that everyone should recuse their self off this board and when saying what you're saying towards what you said it doesn't matter i live right there and you're taking away a park from children that i see 
every single day playing. And I see elderlies, elderly men and elderly women walking every single day for their exercise right there. There's no way you should have some kind of shelter there. Be something for the children that would be helpful like we had when I was there. That's where I'm born and raised there. And that's where I live. And I vote no for no shelter. It shouldn't be no shelter. At risk center for children or youth, that's what you should be count that's what you should be counting on. That's what you should be concentrating on. That's all I got to say, Northside. Thank you, Cheryl. Our next speaker is uh, Karina uh, Bowler. Uh, Ms. Bowler, if you could come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Uh, hello, I am Karina. Um, I live in Elliott Park neighborhood. Um, I want to say I agree with Lisa. Um, the children uh, need some resources, and that's where that funding should go. I'm a mother of five, so I know. Um, and I agree that you guys need to step down because you are not doing your job. Um, also, um, what's happening? Y'all need to get out these little cabinets and go in these cabinets because y'all look real ridiculous right now. Every last one of y'all. It's a shame that these folks are out here like this and y'all are sending bulldozers in these parks, tearing up these people's stuff. Shame on y'all. Shame on y'all. Step out y'all seat and let somebody else get in these seats. Y'all time is up. That's it. Y'all time up. Y'all don't need these seats. Y'all don't need all this little celebrity y'all do prance around the city. Y'all time is up because it's a shame that we the people got to keep coming in here time after time and keep telling y'all how to do y'all damn job. Don't make no sense. It's ridiculous. These are taxpayers that's paying your paycheck. It's ridiculous. Thank you, Ms. Bowler. Our next speaker is Nadine Little. Uh, Nadine, if you'd come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have uh, one minute to address the board. My name is Nadine Little. I've been homeless since March, and this encampment stuff, you can't keep moving this around because you know what? Where did the money go for us to have homes and everywhere to go? It hurts my heart, like I said this morning, to still have to be out here homeless and have to keep moving around. Tomorrow morning, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to have nowhere to go. It just hurts my heart that I'm still having to speak up for every homeless person out here in the world. And it's just, it's ridiculous. It's getting ridiculous to the point, like, really? Come on now. It just hurts my heart that I'm still out here having to speak for us homeless people. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Little. Our next speaker is Kim. Um, I apologize if I get the last name wrong. Uh, Griffin. MG? Griffin. Is, Griffin. Oh, great. Kim, Kim, if you come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. My name is Kim Griffin. I represent Minneapolis, um, uh, Fifth Ward, to be specific. And I just want to say, as an adult that once resided in North Minneapolis as a youth during the 70s and 80s era, uh, we had options. We had community centers. We had North Glenwood Lindell Community Center, North Commons, The Way, Bethune, Harrison. We had structure for, our, for uh, us to go, which helped, helped us develop into productive adults. Nowadays, our children are running rampant. They need somewhere to go. They need structure. We all know that. Uh, I don't mind is a playground for the devil. And we have children running around out here wild and, and wicked and, um, you know, picking, uh, finding guns, drugs, and I mean, this is their lifestyle. Um, I believe that um, the, the Gordon Center should stay what it was there to do and provide. That's a place for our at-risk and non-at-risk youth to go to. 
I am raising a grandson who I had to look at all summer because schools are shut down, parks are shut down, and I'm looking at this baby that is just really have a strong desire for something to do and somewhere to go. I can only give him so much. But I just want to say that the Gordon Center should stay what it's provided to do. Um, homeless shelters, yes, we need those. Gordon Center is not the place for it. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. You're welcome. Thank uh, you. At this time, it is it is 6.30. It is the uh, time certain public hearing uh, within the planning commission or planning committee agenda. Um, so I will recess the full board and turn it over to Chair Meyer. Just note to those who are in the audience that uh, this is a time certain public hearing uh, on the ecological systems plan. We will come back to uh, general public comment after that is finished. Thank you, President Kogo. <clears throat> time being 631, I will call the order of the Planning Committee. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Present. Commissioner French. Here. President Cogill. Here. Vice Chair Forney. Here. Chair Meyer. Here. You have a quorum. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have an agenda. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, August 5th, 2020? So moved. Second. No, no. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. All right. Um, can we please have the staff presentation on the ecological system plan? Chair Meyer, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'd like to maybe spontaneously give you an option um, uh, to break from custom. I understand that there's people there in the boardroom still speaking during open time. I'd certainly be willing to provide the presentation when we return to the actual action item um, and, and uh, we could get directly to the public hearing at this point and then go back to open time more quickly. I'll of course, leave the decision to you, but I just wanted to offer that as an opportunity. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that if no one else objects. Um, and then we can proceed to the time certain testimony. Um, for that, first we have Tia Williams. Is Tia Williams on the line? We do not have Tia Williams on. Okay. And second, we have Constance Pepin. Is Constance Pepin on the line? Constance is on now. Constance, you have three minutes. First, we have Tia Williams. We do not have Tia Williams. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm told I have three minutes. Yes, I'm yes. speaking on behalf of a coalition of local bird conservation groups who submitted detailed comments to the planning department on the draft ecological systems plan. And we were encouraged to see that some of the changes we requested, primarily related to protecting birds and wildlife, were added but we still feel that the plan fails to recognize the ecological crises that we face and the dire consequences for all living beings, including us humans, unless we take concrete actions that demonstrate a commitment to protecting and enhancing ecological functions. Dramatic declines in insect and bird populations are a strong signal that our human altered landscapes are losing their ability to support birds and other wildlife. People are talking about an insect apocalypse. 30% of birds have disappeared 
in North America in the last 50 years, and the trend is continuing. The plan fails to mention the Mississippi Flyway or the two important bird areas in Minneapolis. Both of these IBAs have international significance for birds and our environment. Our state legislature has even mandated that cities along the river from Anoka to Hastings enact specific ordinances to protect the Mississippi River corridor critical area. But the Park Board's own ecological systems plan offers no special acknowledgement or protections for this ecosystem along the Mississippi River or in the important bird area by the chain of lakes. Millions of birds use this flyway a year and face increasing threats. I sent an email to all of you earlier today, and I hope you received it. And I, I, I urge you to add these provisions in your plan to protect birds and enhance bird habitat, and also to protect wildlife and enhance wildlife habitat. Our own survival depends on this. I, it's just, it's really discouraging that, that in some ways the planning department seems to just be doing business as usual, as if we don't have a climate emergency and as if we don't have the sixth extinction happening, and as if all these ecological systems are collapsing around us. So I really hope that you will take another look and have the planning department add in more protections for the ecosystems, ecological function, and the wildlife that we all depend on for our own survival. Thank you. Thank you, Constance. Are there any members of the audience who came to speak specifically to the ecological system plan? Right. If there are none, um, then we'll go ahead and uh, wait to read the comments that were submitted by email until we resume. So for the time being, I will recess the planning committee. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, we'll, uh, Call back to order the regular meeting of the park board. Uh, we are in the middle of um, our open time. We do have a good uh, additional number of speakers. Um, and our next speaker is Sharon White. Sharon. You're present if you come forward to state your name, if you're comfortable your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hi, I am not Sharon. Um, uh, I am Donna Morris. Sharon gave me her number because she had to leave. Um, I am here to speak on behalf of the Gordon Youth, uh, Youth Gordon School location being turned into a community center. I sent out emails to all of the Ramsey County Commissioners, Park Board members, City Council members, of the petition that the community residents have signed saying that they want a youth center in that location versus a homeless shelter. We're not against homeless shelters, but what we're saying is that we have that age group of 16 to 25 and even younger, they're tired of being thrown away. We had places to go and hang out at. We had places where we developed our talents, our skills, our desires, our dreams. Our young people, our children, our grandchildren, I am a great grandmother. I have five grandchildren and one great grandchildren. They deserve a place to go where they can do drill team or learn how to cook, learn about how to debate. All of that is important to them. A temporary shelter in a residential area is not conducive for anyone. So I'm asking that you consider our petition. We've had 803 signatures and we will be emailing more to you this evening. Please consider not having a shelter in that location, but turning the Gordon location into a youth center. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Our next speaker is Chris Brim. Chris, if you're uh, in the audience, if you could come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Is Chris present? President Cogill, we Please. do not seem to have that individual present. All right, thank you. Uh, our next speaker in that case, moving on, is Catherine Rose. Catherine, uh, if you are present, will you come forward and state 
your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record and you have one minute to address the board. Thank you. Thank you for being here, for listening to us. And my name is Catherine Rose. I live in um, St. Paul, Minnesota um, on Lake Hill Circle. So I am here regarding the women and the toplessness law. And I'd just like to say that I'm advocating for the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment, which forbids any state to deny a person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. It's the major constitutional restraint on the power of governments to discriminate against persons because of race, national origin, or sex. So I'd like to ask what is the purpose of this law as it stands now in our time? Does it discriminate based on sex? And I'd say yes, it does. Is it for the benefit and protection of someone or group? Are you able to defend that group? Or does it serve a particular government interest? And then it was interesting to note that nearly 100 years ago, there were laws against men going topless. Three men arrested on Long Island. And in 1935, 42 men were arrested in Atlantic City for the same. So I just think it's women's time. Please hear us out. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the comments. Um, Catherine, our next speaker is Paula. Uh, Paula Chile. Um, Chile. Uh, it's Chesley. <laughs> Chesley, all right. Uh, Paula, if you'd say your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, you have one minute to address the board. Yeah, my name is Paula Chesley, and I live in East Isles. On July 10th, I was cited for toplessness by five or six police officers at a Minneapolis park. I am asking you to repeal the Parks Board Ordinance banning exposed female breasts in Minneapolis Park. This ordinance discriminates according to gender since men can be topless in Minneapolis parks and is also transphobic since it profiles people based on assumed binary gender. Last meeting, we heard from several people speaking against female toplessness. Their arguments are summed up as three points. They are concerned that if female breasts are allowed to be exposed, what's next, male genitalia? They were afraid that people would be exposing their children to pornography, and they were afraid female toplessness at parks would lead to more sexual violence. About the first point, we are not asking that genitalia be allowed to be exposed. We are simply asking for equal treatment of all people. If some people have the right to be toplessness, to be topless, all people should have this right. If some people need to cover their chests, all people should have to. As to the second, female breasts are not sexual any more than male breasts. Female breasts are functional. They produce milk for babies. In many cultures in the world, breasts are not sexualized. Children see them and are no worse for it. This can be how it is here too. Changing the rules can change cultural norms. Finally, the way to reduce sexual violence is not to police women's bodies. The way to reduce sexual violence is to change perpetrator attitudes. The way to reduce sexual violence is to give men and all people meaning, purpose, and adequate ways of dealing with emotions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paula. Our next speaker is Frank Yellow. Frank, if you're able to come forward and state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record, and you have one minute. Uh, I'm not seeing Frank at the moment. I'm seeing Frank. Um, in that case, I will uh, move forward uh, to the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Janelle Anderson. Now, if you come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, um, and you have one minute to address the board, and I just recommend uh, stay about a few feet back so we can hear all your comments. You have one minute. My name is Janelle Anderson, and I live at 617 Lowry Avenue, uh, PPL building in about to be put out because it's no work. I work at the uh, stadium, and as you can see, the stadium is not. Nobody working at the stadium. I'm a cook. 
But what I'm here for is I am a coordinator of uh, a park at Logan Park and a coordinator over at Vitrami. Um, another thing is that I have a problem with y'all is, is when y'all have people with the yellow or brown shirts on, threaten people to put up, um, sign the, the whatever you did, the petition or whatever that is, and you do it, and then you and your police officers won't respond to it. I have somebody that's on Vitrami Park that is speaking I mean, racist things, telling me that I can't be in charge because I'm not her color. Um, I ask you to start, I mean, to get that done. And the police officer looked at me and shook her head. I have people from the New York Times following me, so they did see your police officers doing that. So y'all gotta get y'all gotta get y'all game together because you know what y'all will be on TV acting a fool because if you don't hold it and um the uh, another thing is that y'all open statement was not right because everybody don't do drugs we are trying to find a place they are trying to find a place because I'm gonna try to find a place because I've told you I'm gonna be put out so. Everybody do not do drugs. So I wish you get that out your mind and stop talking about it. Like you, like it's some, like it's something to be joking with. It's nothing to joke with. If these hospitals was open and these other places was open, people will get their things together. Do you know how many volunteers that we have to drive people to place to place? Money that we had to spend out that we asked for people to donate to get in and I had to spend it right back out. Y'all don't know that. Y'all do not know that. Y'all think that all of this is fun and games? It's not all fun and games. We are taking care of people that is mental ill. We are taking care of people, um, other things going on with them. At one point in time, the, um, the Route 25 wasn't even open. So if you can joke on that, joke with them. Because one one time it was not open with this pandemic going on. Thank and you, I'm going to tell you this. Andrew. I give you eviction. There you go. Vic, you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Our next speaker is uh, Kaylee Smith. Uh, Smith. Kaylee, if you'd state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record. And um, again, if you'd stay a little bit back so we can hear you from the mic, that would be helpful. And you have one minute to address the board. Sure. Um, my name is Kaylee Swift. Um, I am a resident of Minneapolis. I'm here today to uh, reiterate the demands that we have for the Minneapolis Parks and Recreation Board in regards to violent evictions that you've been enacting against unsheltered folks um, in our Minneapolis parks. Number one, you must immediately amend the resolution to 2020-267 to guarantee no evictions. Do not move anybody without their consent. Do not use police to force or machinery to terrorize and intimidate refuge, refuge residents into leaving their homes. Revoke the unilateral power of the superintendent to evict any encampment at will and to immediately make public and actionable demands for more funding and support of re residents of encampments and housing solutions for higher bodies of government. And I would like to add in regards to demand number five that maybe you consider, actually I demand that you consider uh, taking the $6.5 million that you spend on park policing every single year and put those towards encampment residents. I think it's obscene and obnoxious that you claim to support um, breaking an agreement, uh, breaking a relationship with the Minneapolis Police Department, have refused to do so, use those same Minneapolis Police Departments to violently evict people from their homes off of park land, and destroy the only belongings that they have in the midst of a global pandemic against the CDC recommendations, um, and, then, and then claim that you are in, in some way in support of dismantling police. I think that's a joke. Um, we delivered an eviction notice this morning to your superintendent. We're delivering the same eviction notice to all of you. Um, we want you to know that we see you. We see what you're doing, despite what you think that you're saying, to try to try to convince us that this is not what you're doing. Um, and yes, as Janelle said, eyes are on you right now. So act accordingly. Thank you, Ms. Swift. Our next speaker is Gary Stewart. Gary in the audience. 
not seeing Gary. Our next speaker then is Iman Hassan. Is Iman Hassan there? Yes, sir. Iman, if you come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hello, my name is Iman Hassan, and I have been a witness to the violent evictions of our parks and on our, of our unhoused um, fellow Minnesotans. And I just want you guys to know that state-sanctioned violence in the form of evictions of unhoused people is still state-sanctioned violence. It's violence that I, as an attorney, see, that I document, and that we will recognize to be directly connected to you guys. So if you think that sending the police or the park police to collaborate with your guys' efforts to dehumanize our brothers and sisters who are currently unhoused and incredibly vulnerable, that it will not be recognized by the legal community, by the black community, by the uh, indigenous community, you're very wrong. And until this day, I've lived here my whole life, I've never entered this building. And I will make sure that people like me who are very uninterested in your seats, in your power, in your bureaucracy, will become very interested. Because the one thing that we will recognize is that you guys are collaborators in the state-sanctioned violence that we see every single day when you have people's houses there. There's few p things that belongs to them, bulldozed, violated, and discarded as if they're nothing. So if you think that we as house people, as the petite bourgeois, as attorneys, as people that are housed, do not recognize the violence that you guys commit, you're very wrong. We will organize, we will get you guys out, and I will definitely know the address of this space that you guys currently occupy because you guys are doing an awful job at it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Iman Hassan. Our next speaker is Rebecca um, Kavanaugh. Sorry if I get that last name incorrect. Rebecca, are you in the room? Uh, seeing none, our next speaker is uh, Sarah Thompson. Sarah, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address uh, for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hi, Sarah Thompson, 32nd and Columbus. Um, a quick thank you to especially um, Commissioner Vita and Commissioner um, French and Superintendent Alvangora for being present on Friday. I'm sure that you have um, the accurate view of what happened Friday. Um, quick aside, I would really like the whole tits to the wind thing to just be put aside. No one has the time or energy for it. Please don't repeal it. Okay, so um, today I'm here to address PV Park. Um, I wanna remind you that May 31st, 2019 was when um, the park was opened with its new, um, it had been newly remodeled. $1.95 million went into that. Funders included Hennepin County, Ventura Village, Phillips West, U.S. Bank, Minnesota Vikings, Franklin Area Business Association, and Hope Academy. But the biggest funder was the NPP 20, which is the 20-year neighborhood park plan, which was all about equity and inclusion. This initiative was about equity. I'd like you to understand that there are currently 125 um, racially and economically diverse children who cannot play rec soccer through PV Park this fall. That cannot happen, not because of COVID, but because of the violence and the encampment at PV Park. Also on September, also our varsity and high school, our high school boys and girls varsity soccer teams at Hope Academy have to pay to play on a different field instead of the beautiful $1.95 million park that was just put in place for equity. Also, I'd like you to understand that um, September 2nd, our students will be returning to Hope Academy. There will be about 350 students in the hybrid version of school. They will be in person and they get no recess. This is not equitable. They get no recess because of the violence due to the encampments at PV Park. This is a failure in equity for these students. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Our next speaker is Chris Thompson. Chris, if you come forward, state your name. If you're comfortable, your address for the record. Chris we Thompson, 32nd in Columbus. Uh, again, thanks to the commissioners who were there on Friday. I was there as well. 
I know this is a difficult process and I just had lots of good conversation with folks. We don't agree on stuff and that's okay. Um, but I do applaud you and the law enforcement officers who, of the park police who were present there. During the peaceful movement of people out of the encampment to licensed shelters or other encampments, these officers endured two and a half hours of what can only be described as sustained harassment, including two younger white people calling an African-American officer, an Uncle Tom, multiple times, swearing at him and calling him a traitor that he, they, he should cross the lines and be on their side. This same group proceeded to antagonize officers and the park commissioners to their vehicles, impeded the movement, pushed with them into their body, pushed their bodies into them like this without their hands, kind of like in basketball when you don't want to be called for a foul, but you definitely want to push somebody, um, in order to cause chaos. When the cars did begin to move, this group followed and got in their way and in order to not run them over, causing permanent injury officers mace them to provide an exit. I recount this because I was there. I have videos of this and this is what happened. And the narrative of a vocal minority seems to want to create a dishonest account of what actually happened, such as the police came in hot or that there was no warning uh, of an eviction or that they were all peaceful protests. That's simply not true and we have videos to show that. This is important to call out now because no doubt there will be similar groups and similar activity at removal of unlicensed encampments as we just heard that are unsafe for our community. But despite the undem undemocratic and chaotic actions, the park is now in a place where all this park in Powderhorn, where all people can enjoy. By Saturday afternoon, the places that were an encampment were full of soccer players and kids at the playground who could no, no longer use it in the previous two months. So thank you for doing a difficult job and I encourage you to continue to find areas to help those without homes. I wanna say that on behalf of everybody in Minneapolis, literally hundreds I've talked to that agree on this one point. Let's find ways to do that that follows a democratic process, including listening to those we don't agree with, involves a wide variety of stakeholders and prioritizes the health of all citizens of Minneapolis. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is Marguerite Mill. Marguerite, if you come forward and state your name, um, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Marguerite, Marguerite are you there? No. Okay. Our next speaker is Kevin Ehrman. Uh, doesn't seem like Kevin is there either. Uh, our next speaker is Monique Flowers. Monique there. Uh, Monique, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have one minute to address the board. My name is Monique Flowers. I live off of 25th and Farwell over towards the Willard Hay neighborhood. I am here about the rec center or the shelter that's getting put at the Gordon Center. I believe as a parent of an at-risk youth that a youth center is more sustainable in that area only because that is the only area and the only park that we have west of Penn Avenue North, which is north of Olson Highway. Um, I hired, I am the outreach worker for A Mother's Love, so I hired 10 youth. We had to go all the way up to the 46th neighborhood in order for them to reach out to their community and not be harmed. That's all that I have to say. Thank you, Monique. You're Our next speaker is Jeanette Takata. Jeanette there. Yeah. Jeanette, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Jeanette Takata, 36 and Nicolette. I am a staff at Hope Academy, and I'm speaking on behalf of asking as a parent of Hope Academy students and a staff member to please clear the encampment specifically at PV Park. On June 9th, I was performing staff duties outside on Chicago Avenue, and I was threatened with a knife quote, this is a knife for killing people. It was put down on the table in front of me and I was threatened by someone who is um, homeless and I'm not advocating for the removal of all parks or all encampments. I'm not anti-homeless, but I was personally threatened by someone specifically related to the encampment at PV. On July 1st, there was a shooting. It was a third shooting in three, in third shooting in one week at PV Park. And I was out there again, performing my staff duties. On July 2nd, I did not feel safe because that, that shooting happened at a time of night where I was asked to be outside working. Um, on Monday, August 17th at 11.13 a.m., that's this Monday, there was a report uh, that there was um, a person threatening 
to harm themselves and others with a gun. This encampment is in a school zone. There are very serious no drugs laws in school zones. And this encampment goes against the amendment asking for school zones to be clear of encampments. So please remove it for the safety of our students and staff and our community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeanette. Our next speaker is Christopher Johnson. No, it's not Christopher Johnson. My name is Rodney Williams. Um, okay. No, I'm, I'm but y'all call them, y'all giving this, out numbers. This is called, bro. But y'all are giving out numbers. We're not giving out numbers. Y'all were giving out numbers. That's it's how I got up here. Sign. Sir, it's just, it's just called, sir. It's so, just, I think uh, y'all the next speaker. Is Johnson, please. All right, I'm going to let, I'm going to let him come up here. Okay. But they call them by, they giving out numbers down here. And then they're calling names. And it's a mixture. Okay. Everybody will get to speak. If Christopher Johnson could come forward here. Hello. Thank you. Christopher, you could state your name if you're comfortable, your address, and you have one minute to address the board. All right. My, my name is um, Christopher Johnson. Uh, most people know me by Coach Pete. Um, I live um, on 16th Avenue near um, North Commons Park. Um, and my issue is, um, dear Minneapolis Park Board, Board of Directors, as a citizen of the Northside community, I'm outraged by the lack of support and interest in, in the leaders of the Minneapolis Park Board to come with the guidelines and the proper things needed to have facilities open for youth in North Minneapolis. Suburban facilities are being used by out, outside entities. I believe that they will continue to work with the suburban youth organizations to provide them space to use facilities in their communities. Meanwhile, in Minneapolis, Minneapolis Public Schools and Minneapolis Park Board have closed their facilities to the youth. There needs to be a plan to return to safe play as determined by the medical professionals to prevent the spread of COVID, such as mass temp checks, one entry point, and for to ex and exit another entry. So um, I'm on board for helping in any way that I can. So thank you again, Coach Pete, North Minneapolis. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Kelvin Christopher. Is Mr. Christopher in the room? Yes. Come forward and state your name if you're comfortable, your address, and you have one minute to address the board. Thank you. My name is Kelvin Christopher, and I'm currently homeless. I would just like to say, I know the park district is not in the business of housing, right? that the situation into which the tents are placed at parks is, is unfortunate. But I ask that the park district reach out to other departments of the city and say, give us some help. Let us relocate these people to somewhere indoors, permanent parking, not another park. You know, Cause you see how people feel about homeless living in their parks. The parks are to be enjoyed by the kids and everybody for sports or whatever, right? Everybody got an issue, right? But by the same said, the snow's coming, it's going to get cold, you know? And these people, you know, you're always going to have issues with them not wanting to leave, you know? Because they don't have nowhere else to go. They didn't got comfortable. So reach out to other departments and ask. The housing department, the police department, and say, where can we put these people? Not all in one place, you know? Is there somewhere four or five of these people can go? Thank you, you know? Thank you very much, Mr. Christopher. Our next speaker is Michael Tate. Mr. Tate, if you'd come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have uh, one minute to address the board. I actually took his place, but um, my name is Shante Cosby, and I live a block away from Fireview Park. I'm here to talk about opening up the parks for our kids to play sports. Um, I'm not understanding how the suburban cities can have their parks open and have their schools open for their children to play, but our children in the metro inner city have to play outside. We had to practice outside. We had no gym to practice in, and they're still closed. My son came home six days ago crying and running home because they were shooting, did a drive-by by Farview Park, and 
my son is scared to go practice and go play at the parks. And it's just, it's ridiculous that the kids in the suburbs who are more privileged are able to have their parks and schools open, but our children in the metro city have to play outside where it's dangerous for them to be at. And it just, it makes no sense. And it's bad enough that our children got our state tournaments and our nationals taken away, their seasons taken away, and now they have nowhere to practice. We need our parks back open. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the testimony. Our next speaker is Director Carrie Jo Felder. Uh, Carrie Jo, are you on site? Yes, I am. You come forward. Great. You state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record. You have one minute to address the board. Hi, my name is Carrie Jo Felder, 4300 Russell Avenue North. And I just want to point out that the woman before me, her son, there was a shootout while he was playing outside. This is North Minneapolis, and we need things to do for our youth, period. We have a lot of gang violence going on. We have a lot of shootings going on. We are moving into Murderopolis once again. And so we need a youth center for the Gordon Center. And so I'm calling um, to ask you to talk with your representative, who has already stated that he is for the shelter, to think about the youth center, because North Minneapolis is different, and you have to fairly represent Everybody, we have over 700 signatures of people who are for the youth center and not for the shelter. We have a lot of shelters coming up in North Minneapolis already, and we need to do that homework. And it is up to you guys. You guys have a vote in this. It's very important. I want to thank um, Commissioner Severson for standing with the community and listening to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Director Felder. Our next speaker is uh, Rodney. Rodney, if you come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. I got you. Uh, my name is Rodney. I'm homeless. Um, I just want y'all to focus. I I've heard so much in the past few minutes just from everybody. We got to remember that you're dealing with people. All right? Y'all can put a label on it all you want to, but you're dealing with people. It doesn't matter. It may not be your relative right now. It may not be your relative tomorrow. But at some point, you're dealing with a person. Okay? Let's stop just using these labels because nobody wants to say it. They just want to say homeless. They don't want to say that this is another person. Okay? Because what your police are doing are going around the same thing that they did to George Floyd, they're doing it to people's tents, to people's livelihoods. That's the last thing that they have. So if y'all care that much about soccer games and being on the grass like that, then y'all really need to evaluate yourselves because you're dealing with people and you're a person yourself. So if you think that you're not, you think you're above that, it's your life. Thank you, Rodney. Our next speaker is Ari O'Sullivan. Uh, Ari, if you come forward and state your name. Uh, not seeing Ari here. Is Ari in the room? No. Um, Sorry, right. I, I'm a little oh, late. Here we are. Um, oh, Hello, Ari. If you state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have one minute to address the board. Yeah. Uh, Ari, I live in Riverside. Um, I provided a little note. Um, I believe that we're all in agreement that homelessness is not within the purview of the Parks and Rec Board. Clearly, the board does not have the funds, resources, or staffing to realistically, pragmatically, or responsibly address homelessness in Minneapolis. That said, by enforcing the permitting process, subsequently defaulting to eviction, policing, and violence, the MPRB um, is clearly engaged in unproductive efforts towards addressing this crisis. I don't imagine that any of the demands leveled at the Parks Board today are unreasonable. Um, amend the resolution to, um, as we understand, evictions risk the mental and physical safety of residents. Do not allow or move anyone without their consent. Revoke the unilateral power of the superintendent so that de decisions to relocate are democratic and reasonable, and 
immediately make public demands to the necessary bodies, bodies of government who hold the power and funds to enact real steps towards solving homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Our next speaker is Courtney Sanders. Courtney, are you in the room? Um, not seeing Courtney. I will move on to the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Wayne Bug. Wayne, if you'd come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hello, everybody. My name is Wayne Bug. I stay in South Minneapolis. I'm a parent at uh, Hope Academy. It's a, uh, near PV Park in South Minneapolis. Um, this, this year has been traumatic, uh, dealing with COVID, George Floyd's murder, watching Lake Street burn, and we've made it thus far. School is about to start, though. And so I was sending my kids to school at Hope Academy, and there's PV Park there. And right now, the, the drug use rate, the drug dealing rate is high. I don't think anybody should be able to have to absorb all the trauma that we had this year. So we need your help. Homelessness is, 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 is not right. Everybody needs stable housing. But I don't believe that the parks are the answer, and particularly the parks that are known for drug dealing. So uh, we lean on you. Uh, you are our voice. As we come here and meet today, we ask asking you to, uh, to, to take a stand, to stand for us and stand for our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Our next speaker is Russ Adams. Russ, if you come forward, state your name. If you're comfortable, your address for the record, you have one minute to address the board. Hi, I'm Russ Adams. I live at 3317 14th Avenue South right across the street from the east side of Powderhorn Park. Um, I just wanna say both sides in this debate are right. Um, when you uproot folks from their temp tent encampments is clearly traumatic. Um, and yet the folks who are saying you cannot ask people to live in unsafe conditions uh, where things have deteriorated so bad that volunteer security have pulled out that no one wants to touch a permit and take responsibility, then somebody has to step up and do something about that. Um, we as advocates have to acknowledge when things aren't working. And as an affordable housing advocate, as I've said to you before, occupying the parks was a brilliant strategic move tactically, but when things started to fall apart, advocates really didn't have an answer for it. And they split from managing and volunteering to advocacy and the folks stuck with managing and volunteering have become overwhelmed in Powderhorn. And it sounds like the same in PV and it sounds like the same in Loring Park. You have a resolution, you have a permit process, you need to follow it. You need to follow it to keep people safe. Most importantly, the folks in the parks, in the encampments, but also folks who wanna use the parks and folks who live nearby. Uh, and finally, I'll say it again, as I did last time, Find a solution to Brackett Park. That's a well-maintained, well-run uh, encampment. You gotta find a way to put them in a place where uh, they feel comfortable and maybe that's not moving them, but if you have to move them, work with them to get an agreement on where to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Our next speaker is Alex Stein. Alex, can you state your name, uh, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have one minute to address the board. Yep, my name is Alex Stein. I live in Beltrami Park. First, I want to comment about the dysfunction and the finger pointing that I've personally heard from members of the park board, employees of the park board. Um, the dysfunction is just incredible, and that's something that I think that we should all be ashamed about, especially citizens. Um, first, I, wanna, I mostly want to comment about the kids and what the forgotten people in this whole situation are the inner city youth. Um, Right now, I know one of the processes for applying for application is that they can't be within a block from school. Even though schools, when their kids are in session, which they're not, are completely guarded, nobody can get in. Right now, you are, are concentrating, putting people who are admittedly have their issues that need to be taken care of, but you're putting them in parks where there's multiple playgrounds, multiple basketball courts. And that's all that inner city kids can do right now. This is, we're talking about COVID. 
They, all they can do is go outside and visit parks, and that doesn't mean they're going to go with adults. So what you have right now are populated, dense inner city parks, and you're actively putting homeless people in there based upon flawed rationale, which was not voted upon by any citizens. This is something that was enacted by you guys. There's no community input to it. And basically you're saying, okay, it's unsafe for us to have homeless people next to a school, which you're openly admitting, but you're saying it's okay for these kids to go hang out in parks, playing playgrounds without adults. And who's being most affected? It's not people in St. Louis Park. It's not wealthier people from Minneapolis. It's inner city kids who are being having their peacefulness taken away, their only way to really enjoy themselves. So I really hope you guys start to consider that. Start talking about our youth, please. Thank you uh, for the comments, uh, Alex. Our next speaker is Victor Martinez. Victor, if you'd come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute yeah, to address. Yeah, 1619 Thomas Avenue North, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55411. I'm a pastor, a small business owner in North Minneapolis, two blocks from the Gordon Center, and uh, I've done a lot of work in the community for about 15, 20 years. And uh, our young people need uh, somewhere to be. And right now, it's a small park, Willard Park is where our young people are. And we want to see a rec center. We want that space to continue to be a center for young people and not for homeless, uh, for um, sheltered. It's a park and having uh, single women there that identify as women, um, it sounds like a, something that we don't really want in our community. We've done a lot of outreach there and we all care about the shelter and we, they need help, but not in the middle of our community. Uh, we're already under resource. Uh, our parks are falling apart and by adding this, it's just adding another black eye. So please, we want a, a center for young people in our parks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Martinez. Our next speaker is Don Esther Morris. Is Don Esther Morris in the audience? Okay. Um, moving on, our next speaker is um, Nona Champ Champion. Apologize if I'm getting that wrong. I'm having a little trouble reading some of the writing here. Nona, are you on site? No. Uh, our next speaker is Shantae uh, Cosby. Shantae. Um, our next speaker is Nolan uh, Furlick. Nolan, are you in the audience? Um, seeing none, our next speaker is uh, Jenna Severson. Jenna, if you'd state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hi, my name is Jenna Severson. I live in the Elliott Park area of Minneapolis. And I have seen firsthand, just driving around, there's still people at the parks. Even when there are encampments, there are the football fields, the soccer fields are full of kids, any ages, playing. The playgrounds are full of kids, very small, playing. They're not afraid of homeless people like adults here in Minneapolis are. I think the criminalization of people who are experiencing homelessness is not what we need to be focusing on and making our decisions with. Fear-based decision-making is, is fueling discrimination against people experiencing homelessness in Minneapolis, in St. Paul, all across Minnesota. Right now we have multiple crises happening at once and homeless people, people experiencing homelessness need to be included as community members to be cared for and accepted and loved. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jenna. Our next, uh, our final speaker actually that I have signed up here is Alex Samuelson. Alex, are you in the room? 
I'm not seeing Alex. I'm Kelly Krogstad Latner speaking on behalf of Alex and myself. Um, a lot of these parks have already had high crime rates, and I think associating with all the, all the crime that's happening at the parks with homeless people is wrong. We also have to understand that the people complaining about these things and not doing anything to lift a finger because they have to go outside and see somebody less fortunate them, than them that might have just struggled really hard, might have had an accident at work. Not all homeless people are crazy and on drugs. Um, I've driven by plenty of parks. I volunteer. When there's things that are well managed and when we don't have to spend our time fighting for permits and being given the runaround about what we're going to do and who you have to contact, that could be putting more resources into the women and to the men and to the children, having a place to live, getting them mental health services, signing them up for insurance, housing. If we're always fighting the park boards or whoever to get homeless people equal living, then we're not going to get anywhere. Thank you. Uh, we have maybe a, one more speaker in the room here. Um, is there another speaker uh, in the room? There is. Um, I already had spoken earlier um, via the phone call, but since I, am, I, I thought that there wasn't going to be a uh, in person. Uh, so what I'll just say real quickly, this is Sam Priestenson again, Wake Park neighborhood. Yep. Please don't allow for children to be used as political fodder. Now everybody's concerned about the children. This parks board, as I and remember. Vincent, if you could step back uh, from the mic, we can't hear you. Uh, and you have, if you step that's a little better, just a little bit farther back so that commissioners can hear you and you have one minute. How Go about ahead. now? That's good. Okay. If, as far as I remember, please don't allow for the youth to be used as political fodder. Because if I remember correctly, when I worked at the city, uh, Commissioner Bourne, you tried to fight for, along with other several others of you, to get more funding for the youth. You actually have done your job to try and do this, and this is not an either or, it's a both and. You're, you are involved in this now. You weren't before. I don't think that it's necessarily in your purvey, but you're the first line of defense to partner with community and to do it well, and we can combine together, put the pressure on the higher ups at the state and at the city and at the county to do their job if you're bold enough to stand with us and do it. Thank you, Ms. Priest Vincent. Uh, that concludes uh, our open time uh, comments. Uh, thank you, everybody, for speaking. Our, uh, we will move on with our agenda. Um, moving on. Um, here, we're going to return to uh, the uh, reports of officers. Um, I'll, I'll ask for uh, uh, officers to be as succinct as possible here, um, and I'll turn it over to the deputy superintendent to provide an uh, overview of uh, the permit process. Thank you, President Cogill and commissioners. Um, as we have done in previous meetings, we give a quick review of the comments we've received. So since um, the August 5th meeting, we've received 116 comments regarding homeless encampments, 78 were received by customer service, 38 were received um, as open time submissions, 25 of those were in support, 14 of them were a form letter that had um, the points of no evictions, no police force, machinery, um, moving individuals by consent, revoking the superintendent's power, and demanding funding from other agencies. 81 were opposed to the encampments overall, and 10 of the comments were neutral. In terms of an update on where we're at with the permit process, we currently have four active permits, the Mall, Boom Island, um, Lake Harriet and Marshall Terrace Parks. For clarification, all of these parks are capable of encampments. I know that's a question that's coming up in terms of the difference between designated as capable versus permitted. Um, one permit is in waiting, William Berry Park. The same permit holder has the mall and William Berry Park, and we're working first um, and foremost on the mall at this point. Uh, this past week, we had set August 17th as the um, deadline for permits for most of those parks that had been capable of accommodating an encampment. 
The two exceptions were Franklin Steel and BF Nelson parks. Those were parks that were identified as relocation parks and that relocation was active. So this Friday is the deadline for Franklin Steel and next Friday would be the deadline for BF Nelson. Um, we have eight active applications um, that we're reviewing, one for uh, kind of the main part of Riverside, one for the Annie Young Meadow portion of Riverside, Beltrami, Logan, Lake Nokomis, Minnehaha Falls, Lindell Farmstead, and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Parks. We have not received um, any applications for Bryn Mawr Meadows. Um, here is a map that shows you where the temporary encampment permits are active. Um, so Lake Harriet, Marshall Terrace, the Mall, and Boom Island. Oh, I will now turn this over to Assistant Superintendent of Environmental Stewardship, Jeremy Barrick. Good. Thank you, uh, thank you Deputy Superintendent Ringold, and good evening, President Colvin and Commissioners. Um, I've got a real brief couple of slides, uh, all maps, to give you an idea of the current uh, situation. So this is a map of the lone encampments, and you'll see down the side there, um, we we have our, our latest tent count as of yesterday uh, for each property, but I would note that on the, uh, the, the powder horn west shows up on there. Um, and that would, no, it doesn't, never mind. So you can see uh, we're seeing, we're about 34 parks, 409 tents in total, uh, four permitted encampments, 11 identified as capable, and then the 19 other encampments. Uh, if we go to kind of just a series of, you saw the map of the permanent encampments already. You see the maps that were designated, that's overlaid. And then if you go to the last slide, um, one more, um, you can kind of see our rundown of the four permitted sites and those. You'll note that um, a lot of those that we've identified as capable of accommodating uh, encampments are full, uh, with the exception of BF Nelson, Bryn Mawr um, and Lake Nokomis. So um, that is our current state of affairs with, um, with, with the permitting process. We are able to get into, you know, the best hand washing stations and trash and uh, help to support the encampments in a, in a much better way. Let's go to the next slide. I believe I'm turning it over to Director of Finance, Julie Weitzman. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I'll just have a very brief financial update on the encampments as of July 31st, uh, 2020. Please switch the slide, please. So for revenue streams, we have the temporary easement of 94,800. We've also received our first payment from the Minnesota Emergency Response Funds of $78,000. We have submitted a second request uh, for $89,354, which is estimated um, through the end of August, and we received notification today that that amount has been approved, so we will be expecting to receive uh, that payment as well. On the expenditure side, we have um, spent $63,000 almost $64,000 on wages and fringe, uh, specifically asset management staff, uh, material and supplies of just under 12,000, fifths and hand washing stations of $34,000 uh, to date. I will mention that, um, that the city of Minneapolis has been providing fifths and washing stations um, within our encampment. So that has kept our costs for BIS and washing, uh, washing stations down um, overall. Uh, we're starting to transition those out of the city and into the park board um, um, expense. So you'll see that expense starts to rise. And we're also starting to see some site restoration um, expenses with the um, in uh, industrial hygiene cleaning, uh, wood chips, and uh, seed mixes. So we're starting to see those expenses showing up. So that's the end of the financial report. Thank you, 
Thank you, uh, superintendent and staff, uh, for the overview. Uh, Commissioner French uh, has his hand raised. Yeah, uh, Director Wiseman, how much of this, how much, of, how much of these uh, funds would have been used without the encampments? Would, would there have already, would we have already had spent some of this money if we didn't have encampments? So uh, the money, so the material and supplies, BIFs, hand washing stations, and the site restoration, all of those expenses are uh, directly related to the encampment. Uh, wages and fringe, so the staffing uh, that has been assigned to do some additional cleanup and maintenance around the encampment, these are our full-time and certified part-time employees. So at this point, we haven't hired um, additional new employees to service this. So it means that um, there's work being directed to the encampment that is um, um, being redirected from other areas and Director uh, Assistant Superintendent Barrick would have to speak to that. Thank you, Thank you Director Wiseman. Um, Looks like we have uh, Commissioner Boren as well. Good question. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, going back to that same slide, Director Wiseman, um, mine is more of a comment, and I think I'm following Commissioner French's line of question. Um, the, the wages and fringe were already allocated or sunk costs. I, I would see allocating some of those funds if we hired additional staff specifically to do this work. Uh, but our maintenance crews are largely general fund expenses, and we have that we have that cost. Every, we have that wage and fringe cost every day, and and the board made a specific action on taking the revenues for that temporary easement for ninety four thousand eight hundred specifically to support homeless and highly mobile populations in our community. I, I don't, I, I hope that that 63,000 is coming from Minnesota emergency response funds and not from the, not from the 94, eight that the board allocated. And, and I'm wondering if I could just get a response or some clarification on that. President Cogill and uh, Commissioner Bourne, that is exactly correct. Uh, so with the state and federal dollars that are being allocated uh, through CARES and COVID and other, um, other areas, if staff is being reallocated to a service that would normally not be provided by an agency, it qualifies for reimbursement of those emergency response funds. So the 63,000 is being directly reimbursed through the $78,000 that we are receiving from the Minnesota Emergency Response Fund. Okay, as I'm, as I'm just looking at this, when I look at BIFs and washing stations, those look like, and maybe materials and supplies, those look like they might be the only valid things to build towards the temporary easement revenue. Um, the site restoration, we also do site restoration after 5Ks or Pride. And again, those are general fund expenses when people are, uh, when people are in our parks and do damage to them, we restore them with that. I think that was also the case after the, after the polar plunge. So I, I just want to make sure that the that the will of the board is being carried out and followed with that uh, temporary with that temporary easement and it looks like there's maybe 45 five in in eligible expenses towards that 94,000 is staff doing math the same way president Colgill and uh, and commissioner Bourne um, I would agree with that statement Okay. Okay. So if we wanted to do like a, if the board wanted to do like a food relief program for folks experiencing homelessness and expand a program like that, there is still 40, 49,000 available in, in this temporary easement revenue fund. Uh, 
um, President Colgill and Commissioner Bourne, I would agree with that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Director Wiseman. A point of order. Um, I, once again, we have a rule that is not being, um, it's being violated. We need visuals. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Forney. Uh, just remind staff or commissioners to have their cameras on. I don't think having your camera on to a black screen is any different than having it off. I would ask for everybody to uh, turn their cameras on. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, <clears throat> I, I believe that Assistant Superintendent Barrick is on the line, and I, I have some questions about um, the site restoration and wages and fringe that are listed as expenses. Um, <clears throat> do we have staff that are specifically doing work that's being generated by the encampments that's covered under the wages and fringe that's represented here on this document? Uh, Commissioner Musich, uh, we don't have, how do I say this? So the, the staff in the respective service areas that are impacted, when they're working in an encampment, they're billing their time to a budget code, and that's how we're tracking it. So, okay, so if they weren't having to deal with encampments, they would be doing their typical job duties that support the ability for people of Minneapolis to recreate in a in the park spaces that we provide for them. President Bourne, Commissioner Musich, correct. Uh, and then under site restoration, if we did not have encampments, would we be needing to spend forty six thousand six hundred and four dollars restoring sites where they? Uh, were previously located? Again, President Kogel, Commissioner Musich, yeah, yeah, this was turf restoration in areas where we, we would not be doing turf restoration. Um, and typically, um, when there's an event that, depending on the, the level of the restoration, um, is often charged back to the event organizer. Right. So this is directly related to encampments. We're not just going out and doing site restoration for the joy of it. It's done because it's required to be done due to the wear and tear from an encampment being in that location. President Kogel, Commissioner Musick, correct, correct. We would, this, after the tents are there for so long that it kills the turf. So we have to replace the turf through overseeding and aerating. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that additional information. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, seeing no more questions. Uh, can move on. I believe there's one more piece of um, information that the superintendent would like to share uh, regarding uh, the budget. Uh, President Gokil, uh, commissioners, uh, apologies. I know we had a lot that we wanted to share uh, during report of officers. We were hoping to be able to squeeze it in, uh, but it's. I know we're late into the meeting now. I do have highlights that I wanted to share with the board around all the programs and offerings that we have in our rec centers. We have an IGR, um, Pamela Gokemeyer, our IG, IGRA, was going to give a report on um, highlights and funding. And then uh, with Director Weissman at the end uh, with a budget report. Um, President Cogill, would you like us to kind of go through this or would you like us to focus on a particular area at this time because of uh, time constraints? Uh, unless I hear any uh, objections from commissioners, I would like us to uh, be very brief and move into the main headlines. Okay. Thank you, President Cogill and Commissioners. Uh, I'll go as quickly as possible through this and so we can save some time here. So quick things, um, which I'm always excited to talk about the great work that we're doing in this organization. Athletics, Aquatics, and Ice Arenas uh, hosted the first youth hockey tournament since closing uh, COVID-19. Uh, the tournament, um, tournament operations, hourly sanitizing, and games went well. 25 different teams played over 34 games. Uh, aquatics, aquatic sites have had 16,847 uh, guests uh, for the month of July. Uh, athletics, uh, adult and softball and kickball leagues began uh, play this week. Currently 100 teams registered to play uh, 16 different leagues at Boston, Bryn Mawr, Northeast Athletic Field and uh, Carew Field. Um, fun on the run. Fun on the Run program is going well. We have been creating a lot of positive relationships with youth and families in our 12 locations. 
is had great feedback from more than uh, 700 participants. Golf. Golf rounds are up uh, over 28,000 from 2019 at the same point, and golf-related revenues are up over $750,000 from 2019. Courses continue to be extremely busy, and a big thank you uh, to all the golf staff for their great work during the 2020 golf season. And I would echo that again and say, I've been to the courses and they're amazing and fantastic work and pride that our, um, our golf team has been doing out there with our golf courses, it's been outstanding. Recreation centers and programs. Night Owl continues to operate at four recreation centers uh, and attendance has been steady at each site with typically 20 to 30 youth attending per night. Recreation centers are planning to uh, a modified reopening for program at a scaled back number of sites in September and we'll be offering preschool, youth, teen, and senior programming at many sites. Youth Development, Rec Plus and Minneapolis Kids School Age Care Programs are partnering uh, to promote each other's school year programs. Minneapolis Kids is offering all day, no cost care to tier one families from 8.30 a.m. to 3 o'clock p.m. They are not offering wraparound care before or after school, independently of the day long care. Families aren't using the all day program uh, the after-school care is not available to them. Red Plus will offer after-school care uh, from 2 o'clock p.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. And the uh, uh, MP kids, families who want, uh, who just want those hours are welcome to register as space permits. Both programs open registration August 12th and families receive information about both options so they can register for the program that best meets their needs. Forestry. Forestry crews worked last Saturday and Sunday uh, responding to tree damage caused by last Friday's night storm. The initial focus was on clearing streets and removing trees from houses and cars. Over 160 calls were received by the end of the workday on Monday. Uh, cleanup work is expected to last through the week. Maintenance. Maintenance staff continue to prepare the park system for visitors, uh, completing much needed repairs and maintenance work throughout the park system while navigating the very real impacts of COVID-19 related issues. Some of the maintenance activities include demo of old steps, installing new footings and uh, steps with a handrail to follow at the Loring Maintenance Building. The second installation of the pad with ADA access and curb for grade at Towerside Park, a project completed with the assistance of the planning department, environmental management, Beach water quality map updates. The MPRB's new beach water quality map has been updated to include information about the presence of blue-green algae. Blue-green algae are normally present in bodies of water and common in Minnesota. This type of bacteria thrives in warm, nutrient-rich water, but at high levels of growth can produce unhealthy conditions. Observations made by staff at the beaches and wild lake samplings are being used to determine whether conditions are right for blue-green algae to grow to levels of public health concern. Staff use a numeric ranking system to compare data collected by the state of Minnesota and a method of systemic observations from a long-standing blue-green algae uh, warning program to decide whether our lakes or beaches should have a warning about the presence of blue-green algae. Planning Department, Bassett Creek Park Playground Project Update, the Bassett Creek Park Play and Picnic Area Improvements, Near Morgan Avenue is currently under construction and taking shape nicely. Staff have been spoken to neighbors passing through and all seem very excited about the new amenities. The project is funded by MPP $20 uh, and uh, work will be complete in the fall of 2020. Hiawatha Golf Course and Area Master Plan. The draft of Hiawatha Golf Course Area Master Plan is currently out for public comment. The comment period runs through December 15th. Any informational presentation uh, I'm sorry, an informational presentation of the draft plan to the Board of Commissioners will take place at the next board meeting on September 2nd. Uh, so check out the project page at NPRB's website at www.minneapolisparks.org backslash Hiawatha Master Plan. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this quickly over to Pamela uh, Gokemeyer, our uh, IGRA uh, uh, administrator, and she will give a quick uh, report uh, for slides. Go ahead, Pamela. Thank you, Superintendent Bangora and President Coville and Commissioners. 
I just want to touch on a few things in each of the government areas. Um, at the federal level, um, with an impasse and trying to come up with agreement between the Senate and House on a uh, COVID package, number four, um, President Trump on August 8th signed four executive orders, which are listed there. The one that is under some legal review is the uh, unemployment, um, $400 a week federal unemployment aid, uh, which would be uh, funded a quarter by the states, which will be difficult uh, right now. And only Congress is authorized to um, spend, so that's why that one is up for a possible legal review, but that remains to be seen. Um, in July, Senate Republicans passed their own trillion dollar HEALS COVID relief package. It didn't provide any new funding for state and local governments, but it did extend um, the deadline for spending the, the existing CARES Act money, and it would have allowed for spending on budget deficits. In May, the Democrats passed a, House Democrats passed a $3 trillion package, so they're $2 trillion apart, um, and it would have provided more money for states and cities. Uh, then also at the federal level in July, Congress passed the Great American Outdoors Act. It was signed by the President in August, and it would permanently dedicate $900 million per year to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It's for state parks, but it does include funding for the recreation grant program, which could assist uh, local and community parks. And so it's something that we can look at next year. Next slide, please. At the state level, Governor Walz called his third special session on August 12th. It was one day, and it was just used to extend his peacetime um, emergency authority another month. It's um, likely that this will keep going as long as we're in the COVID um, situation. And in September, um, there will be another special session. It's possible that they would take up the bonding bill. It's still in play. That would be great, but it remains to be seen. Um, MMB released their 2021 LGA certification for cities. Uh, you can see there how much Minneapolis is receiving, and the park board will receive uh, $9 million. Uh, it's $391,000 less than 2020, but earlier estimates had us at um, $493 less, so that's good news in that sense. Uh, we worked with the governor's office, and Director Wiseman already touched on this, about um, assistance to help us with the powder corn encampment expenses that we've been enduring. Um, and then we have been approved for 17000 per site for um, COVID-related child care for 11 sites. And um, we were just uh, notified that LCCMR is recommending our Above the Falls uh, Park Acquisition and Restoration Project for 950000 And that will be taken up in next year's session. Met Council also um, was recommended at, I think it's two point, just over $2 million for acquisition. Uh, next slide, please. At the county level, um, we worked with Hennepin County uh, to receive funding for the Save the Summer Youth Program funding. Um, to date, we've received, you can see there, 487000 um, For adjustments we had to make to our, um, you know, rep programming to adjust the COVID um, procedures. And we are in the process of submitting a second round. It's a rolling grant process. Uh, final slide, please. At the city level, um, the city received $32.2 million from uh, the administration at the state level in COVID, federal COVID money. We've been in negotiation or discussion, excuse me, with the city, and we should be receiving up to $2 million in assistance for our COVID expenses to date. We are, we've been working in partnership um, on housing shelter alternatives for our current Park encampment residents, the state, county, and city have funded three future housing shelters. Uh, we have a new city council ward, or will have a new city council ward six um, representative in Jamal Austin. And the mayor just delivered last Friday his 2021 proposed budget. 
And you can see there he's recommending a maximum property tax um, in 2021 that represents a 5.75 increase, and that would result in a 1.18% property uh, levy increase for the park board. Thank you. Do commissioners have do commissioners have questions? Uh, I see Commissioner French has his hand raised. Yeah, uh, I, I, I got a question about the night out program. I guess this is for uh, Superintendent McGore. What sites are the night out? What sites are where the night out? Uh, what, what sites are those? Uh, President Cogill, uh, Commissioner French, I will uh, pump that over to you. Uh, make sure that uh, Assistant Superintendent Cox will give the specific on those uh, sites. Do we know what days they're operating on? Assistant Superintendent Cox, can you give a quick update to Commissioner French, please? Uh, is that on? Assistant Su Superintendent Cox, are you on? I she is there. Well, I can, I can, I guess I can give her a call if I can ask. But yeah, yeah. my apologies, uh, Commissioner Cox, sure. I don't have that off the top oh, of my head. That's okay. Uh, do you know the times? Then, then, the times for the night house program. Um. I don't specifically know what the hours are right now for a night out. Well, usually, um, I believe it goes eight to eleven. But again, I would defer to uh, Assistant Superintendent Cox because they are working on the program for the fall and designing the times for that and for the programming. Um, I again would have to defer to her to make sure that those times are correct. Uh, I, the reason I'm saying night out is a very good, very good program. Uh, long I started off working in our parks. It was, a, it, was a, it was called Fat Summer back then. Uh, with the uptick in violence in our city, I'd really like those programs to be uh, substantial. I, I really like them to be uh, have the resources they need to be su to be successful. Uh, with the uptick in violence, I think programs like Night Out and Fat Summer are extremely important right now. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And my apologies, Mr. French. We'll get that information to you uh, as soon as I get. Uh, uh, oh, muted by Hope. Oh, is that you, Sister Brandon Cox? Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, there we are. Now we can hear I'm you. I'm sorry. I was muted, and then I can't get the video back, so I apologize for that. Um, we are currently operating in four locations this summer with the plan to extend the number of locations in the fall, which starts uh, day after Labor Day. What? Uh, please don't quote me. I tried to look it up. I know that in our, on the north side, I believe we are at Farview. Um, we are at MLK. And unfortunately, I can't tell you in the moment what the other two are. I will tell you that we are operating at earlier times than we have traditionally because of what's happening around the city. We typically would let out on weekends around 10.30 or 11 o'clock. But because of the... Um, instability of the city around us, we don't want kids walking home um, after dark. So we are releasing at around 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock. What type of activities are we doing with uh, the night hours? So uh, it ranges. So we are doing things that could include uh, pre-COVID. Um, could, they could include cooking um, activities, which not only exposes kids to a variety of foods that they may not have experienced before, but we also incorporate a little bit of math. In it. So we're, you know, challenging kids to, to do their own measuring and to calculate a cup of this minus, you know, that, so that we're, it's kind of a dual purpose um, activity. There's some of that, but then there's also a recognition that sometimes kids just need to be in community. Given all that's happening right now, we may spend some time with kids just kind of hanging with them and letting them be vocal about what they're experiencing or related to COVID, related to uh, George Floyd, or other things that's happening in both our local community and our national community that kids may be, uh, have some feelings and thoughts about. So, Are we, are we doing anything intentional to, to uh, kind of address some of the very sensitive top topics and subjects that we have to do, we've had to do in the last couple of months. Are, are we being intentional about bringing in maybe folks who have dealt with trauma or maybe the, the youth workers aren't talking to folks who have dealt with trauma and, and what, what we should and what we should be saying to young folks 
who are dealing with an extreme amount of trauma right now? Are we doing anything like that? Uh, Commissioner French, I would uh, submit that having intentional conver having conversations well about what kids are feeling is intentional. Okay. Um, we are not bringing in speakers at this point because to the extent possible, we want to keep the groups relatively close so that we aren't um, you know, risking additional exposure. So as we progress into the fall, we will start to examine what some um, virtual conversations might look like with local and national leaders around a particular topic. But right now we are we are doing what we can to keep kids physically safe, both from what's happening around us and safe from COVID as well. I, I would I would encourage, I don't know if this, is, this exists or anything, but I would encourage uh, for some type of like uh, trauma training for, uh, for some of our staff uh, who have to have conversations with kids so they know what to and what not to say. Uh, just, Recommendation. You could kind of see what that looks like. I, I trust your, uh, I trust your work, Terry. So, and thank I, you. A final comment. We have done some of that earlier in the year, but um, as you know, we are um, always willing to do some repeats to expand our expertise or our level of, level of proficiency in any of those areas. Okay. I just want you to know, uh, Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent Cox, this is a very, this is very, very important at a very, very important time. So thank you for all the work. Agreed. Thank you. Understood. Thank you, Commissioner uh, French. Commissioner Severson. Uh, thank you, President Colgill. Uh, very happy to get that report. I have a question. I believe I, I heard um, her say that we're receiving seventeen thousand per site, or seventeen thousand a month for uh, child care. Um, Commissioner Severson, I'm not sure if that was a question for me or a question for Director Wiseman. It is not no. seventeen. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It is not seventeen thousand dollars per month. Uh, that is, and I I can't speak to how the calculation was developed, but that is per site, not per so, month. So, okay, that's what I was trying to figure out. So we're getting seventeen thousand per site for Rec Plus. So with that. Uh, I received an email that we're going to close down multiple sites, possibly close down multiple sites, including Bryant Square, Brackett, Fuller, Corcoran, Key Wade, and Nokomis Northeast, and possibly Wyndham, Kenwood, Weber, Sibley, and possibly McCray, and possibly Wait. So would that mean that we won't receive that $17,000 for those sites? Um, Commissioner Stevenson, that, does not, that is not what that means. That is a look back, I believe. So based on revenue that we've lost, since the top of COVID. Okay, well, I have high concerns that if the sites that we're gonna keep open include Lynnhurst, Matthews, Armitage, and then Harrison and Wait, that money looks uh, awfully high for uh, one uh, set of, of parents and parts of the community compared to the other. So I hope that that 17,000 uh, that we accept uh, is equaled out, um, or, or excuse me, distributed fairly uh, and equitably, because the way I'm looking at it right now, it would probably mean Southwest Minneapolis is going to get huge chunks of money while other parts uh, will not. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Um, seeing uh, no other hands raised, I'll move on to Director Wiseman's uh, financial update, um, hoping that we can be succinct and uh, I will. Um, Turn it over to you, Director Wiseman. President Colgill and commissioners, uh, thank you. If you'd like to advance the slide, please. So as of July 31st, uh, we have quite a few uh, changes in the general fund. First of all, I would like to point out that we've received 52% of our property taxes uh, through this point. This this year, which is um, promising. Um, we usually receive uh, more because there are a lot of property owners that pay 100% of their taxes at the beginning of the year rather than splitting it between the two payments. Um, we are still estimating a, a reduction in property taxes, and unfortunately, we won't know until December 
uh, how much those second half collections are. Local government aid, we've received 50%. Uh, we have um, lowered our expectations for local government aid just in case uh, there is a end of year reduction in local government aid. And then I'm just going to uh, drop down to all of these funding sources that are starting to pop up. Hennepin County CARES Act uh, for youth programs, we've received our first payment of the $477,993. We received that in August, uh, so it's not being reflected here in the, as the actual. Uh, to just further define this COVID uh, relief for child care, it is um, a $17,000 payment per site. So each of the 11 sites that are operating in the, in the summer are receiving this one-time payment of $17,000. And it helps supplement uh, REC Plus because during COVID, there's, uh, there was a lower child to student ratio. Uh, and it also provides for the cleaning at the sites uh, for, for um, those sites. So it's a one-time payment just for the summer programming. It will not continue um, into our fall. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. And we have received half of that in July, and we will receive the second half um, in August, at the end of August. Again, the EFT encampment dollars are showing here and uh, FEMA disaster relief. Uh, Pam Bokemeyer also talked about uh, the CARES Act funding for the city of Minneapolis. We have um, been given the directive to start um, providing information to the city of Minneapolis uh, for reimbursement of, of qualifying expenditures for the City CARES Act funding. Uh, it is um, going to be treated as an actual expenditure. So uh, we have been told we can get reimbursed up to $2 million. Uh, So once those uh, billings start occurring and we start receiving those dollars, those will also be reflected on the revenue side. On the expenditure side overall, we are at 49% uh, um, of expenditures. So at this point, we are showing our loss for 2020 at 2.5 million. That's a little bit of an improvement over the last um, update that I gave in June, largely due to uh, the increase in property taxes and uh, this child care funding that has come through. If you do for the next slide, so um, our goal was to have a fund balance of 2.5 million, uh, so we're well on our way to uh, meeting that goal uh, with a difference of 271,000. In the enterprise fund side, Golf, again, is going uh, really well. Uh, we are showing uh, a, just a loss at this point of 239000 I am hopeful that by the time we get to the end of August, uh, that's further going to further improve. We are 27% um, increase in the number of rounds uh, and are adjusting our revenues accordingly. In the other areas, uh, we have seen some slight revenue adjustment, um, again, in the ice arena area, and then also in the sculpture garden area, we had actually some revenue that came in in July for the sculpture garden, so we were able to up our projections for the sculpture garden. Uh, we are still monitoring concessions um, and we think our um, estimates at this point are, um, are meeting what is, what is currently happening with our concessions. So our total operating in income now for our operations is we have an operating income of just 195000 
We have all our one-time payments for improvements, our MERF payment and our debt service. So we're still looking at um, a little over a million dollar loss in the enterprise fund uh, with a projected fund balance of 2.7 million. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Director Wiseman. Uh, do any commissioners have questions on Director Wiseman's presentation? Commissioner Steeperson. Hey, thank you, uh, President Colgill. Um, just a few questions, um, if I could help get a better understanding. Why do we think that um, LGA is going to be cut that much? President Colgill, Commissioner Severson, uh, I we it's, I'm being very conservative on the revenue side uh, with the next forecast not due for the state of Minnesota until November. Uh, during previous recessions we have experienced a end-of-year local government aid cut, so I'm not saying that it's going to happen. I'm just being conservative and putting in an estimate just in case it did happen. Okay, and that, that same explanation would be about the $2 million property taxes? That is correct. And what the revenue from the enterprise? Uh, as far as golf? Or what do you yeah. mean? Well, just, uh, it, the, the yeah. revenue from enterprise altogether, you, you don't think it's going to be more than the numbers you projected because of golf? Mm, um, I believe that in the enterprise fund, we will continue to see improvement. Again, when I make projections to year end, I am conservative in revenue estimates um, until, you know, facts are known. So again, um, if weather shifted, if, if we get an early winter or an early fall or, you know, or if there's COVID outbreaks and different areas need to be shut down, that could impact um, our ability to generate revenue. Okay. So I, I know I've said this before, but I want to put an emphasis on this again. We're doing very well uh, with golf, correct? That is correct. And do you think that we can continue to build on this capacity in the future? President Colgill and Commissioner Severson, I hope that this is a resurgence in golf that will continue. Um, okay. I just, you know, my, my biggest concern about management and our planners uh, and some of our leaders is the, the attack on golf or the war on golf, as I have mentioned it before. And I hope that my fellow commissioners or folks out there listening, uh, golfers or non-golfers, uh, supporters or non-supporters, how this provides uh, funding to continue to operate our parks and, and, and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. So, again, I, I hope that people take interest in supporting golf moving forward and helping us build it. And, and, and like I said, this is a great opportunity for us to continue to build off of and to uh, add to our enterprise fund. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Um, any other questions? Seeing none, so uh, thank you, Director Wiseman. We will move on with uh, the agenda. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion for uh, resolutions 2020-280 through resolution 2020-286. So motion. motion, is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Uh, is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on the consent agenda. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. 
Commissioner Meyer. Uh, aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have nine ayes. Point of order. Thank you. That carries. Mm -hmm. uh, President Mr. Music. Yeah. Thank you. If you could please remind commissioners to turn on their cameras so that people can see their faces when they're speaking. Per our board rules, I would appreciate it. Thank you. I have done that twice. Uh, I suppose I'll do it again. Um, hopeful that uh, commissioners will follow the rules of the meeting. Uh, it is in the board rules. It's something that is consistently done across all levels of government. Uh, it is uh, an action for transparency. It is just honestly very strange that some folks aren't showing their faces. Uh, it's, it's weird and kind of creepy. So hopefully people will uh, maybe get in the frame uh, when they speak uh, for uh, the point, good. Point of order. Um, I don't believe that you can even recognize somebody unless their their face, their their I mean, our, our rule is very, very specific. And so I don't think that even their vote should be even calculated unless that will, is present. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. I will defer to Council Rice on that question. Mr. President, um, yes, I think the, with the rule that was adopted at the last board meeting, um, I, I would say that the procedure should be when the secretary is calling the roll is not record the vote unless she can actually see the commissioner's face under the rules to record the vote. Thank you, Council Rice. Um, moving on with the agenda uh, this evening, we will go into uh, the administration and Finance Committee uh, reports. Uh, I will turn it over to Chair Forney. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Meyer to please read Resolution 2020-269. I believe, no. Is this correct? Yes. He was the one who tabled it, so that's why it's appropriate for him to be lifting it from the table. Mm -hmm. So give me one minute. Um, I move to um, that the board take from the table resolution 22, uh, excuse me, 2020 69, a resolution approving a new lease agreement with Latowski LLC leasing uh, commercial space at 1828 Marshall Street Northeast, units 8, 10, and 19, uh, located with, uh, within the above the Falls Regional Park uh, for a term of one year, effective September 1st, 2020. And I would Second. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Or the, no, we have to we have to untable it first. So we got oh. that first and then uh, the motion to untable has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion to untable? Commissioner Meyer? You can't debate that part. Okay. I'll ask the secretary to take the roll on uh, untabling resolution twenty twenty two sixty nine. Commissioner Bourne. Pass. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Abstain. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Aye. French. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Bourne. 
Abstain. Point of clarification. Am I meant to not record until I can have a visual? No recording. Uh, just a uh, point of clarification or privilege. The are you guys talking about me? Yes. My my camera. You you can't see me right now. No, Commissioner Bourne, we cannot see you. I did uh, say that specifically to you earlier in the meeting. I didn't hear you say that specifically to me. Uh, I heard you say something after I was done speaking. Is there, could I get some, I, I'm not sure what's going on. It looks like my camera is on. Is this, feel me? Is that? Commissioner Warren, we can't see you. And uh, in Zoom, you're able to see your own reflection. So I'm sure you're yes, aware. I'm not of sure. It. I'm not sure what's going on. Can we recess while I log out and log back in? I can. Commissioner Bourne, it's up to you to get on here. Uh, you are on until you show your face. We'll just continue with the meeting. Does the so this shows that my camera is on. Is that what you're seeing, President Kogel? Commissioner Bourne, I'm not here to litigate this. We can't see your face. Well, I'm not trying to litigate anything. I'm trying to solve what might be a technical issue. Are you, uh, are you, is this showing that my camera is on? We can't see anything. You can chat, you can test your video, Commissioner Bourne, by clicking on the arrow in the right-hand corner of the video icon at the bottom of your screen. The arrow in the right hand corner. So it'll say stop video, start video. Yep, bottom so I just left did hand that. corner. And then there's a little air up arrow. And then under video, if you click on that, you should be able to see yourself there. If you cannot, then you need to click on the camera drop down and verify you've selected the the camera that's on your laptop. It it looks like there might just be something wrong with my Lap or, thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, we're going to move on uh, this evening. Uh, I'm uh, going to uh, strongly request that you figure out your uh, camera problem. Uh, I noted it in the last meeting as well. Hopefully, uh, you take it upon yourself to navigate that by the next meeting. Um, I, would, I would motion to uh, recess the meeting until Brad, uh, Commissioner Bourne, uh, re can restart his computer and rejoin the meeting. I would like to second it. Uh, I just want to note that the rule that we passed does make allowance for people with technical difficulties, so I feel like it's unnecessary and we should be able to proceed. Uh, there's been a motion and second to recess the board. <sighs> Can I have a motion? Am I allowed to vote on this motion of to recess? Oh man, um, Commissioner Warren, I would way rather just continue with the meeting right now. Clearly, you're having technical difficulties. You tried very hard to uh, figure out how to use your camera correctly, and it just doesn't seem to work. So, I think that we'll um, continue with the meeting. But there is a motion and a second before us. Uh, you'll be able to vote on that. Uh, and we can uh, continue here. Uh, so I'll ask the secretary to take the role on recessing the meetings. Commissioner Bourne. Uh, no. Commissioner Musich. Just a moment while I turn on my camera. No. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. No. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner, well, Commissioner Hassan. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. I couldn't hear if it was an I or a nay.
say something. Commissioner Hassan. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, thank you. Uh, Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. No. Vice President Vita. No. President Cogill. No. You have three ayes, six nays. Okay, thank you. Uh, that does not carry. Um, we have taken from the table the resolution 2020-269. Um, I would ask now for a motion on resolution 2020-269. President, so President Cogill, just yep. to clarify, um, Commissioner Bourne is an abstain on that one? Uh, that is what he said. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Okay. Commissioner Meyer. Yes. Um, so I uh, toured the 1828 uh, Marshall site um, with our staff. I uh, toured the entire building, um, which is a large uh, building that used to be um, a sawmill or a lumber mill. And uh, the site in, in consideration for this item right now is a gym, you know, that's um, fully stocked, owned, uh, it's a woman-owned business. Um, you know, the, the staff put out a report um, with, with their opinions um, about, uh, like, you know, the difficulties with using an industrial space like that um, for housing. And I just feel like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to remove um, all of all of the gym equipment. Um, so I, I will support uh, this lease. But during the same tour, um, I, I toured the rest of the building, and, and there are actually uh, two residential units on site administered by us. Uh, one of them has two people living in it, and one of them is vacant. Um, it's apparently not up to code. Um, and like, I don't know all that it would take to, to get it up to code, um, but I feel like it certainly um, would be better than, than being in a park. So I feel like you know part of that building could be used uh, to house people, and I, I support that. Um, so I, I will support um, this lease as it is uh, now for that uh, gym space and also the other ones coming on the agenda for Take Action uh, Minnesota and um, I believe there was a third one. Um, but also would like staff uh, to work on <laughs> what it would take to get that um, residential space available for people. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, Commissioner Bourne. I, I, it's still not working, but thank you, uh, President Coville. Um, the, I, I do have some I still have some of those same reservations I had on this resolution uh, when it was first brought before us. Um, we have what is in effect a health club that we're renegotiating a lease with a new owner because the previous owner couldn't afford to pay rent, and the so so we're we're lowering the we're lowering the amount of revenue that we're going to be taking for this lease, which is a pretty nominal amount to begin with and it's a and it's a roof with with showers air conditioning and heat um, i i read the same staff report that said that there would be difficulties with bringing this into um, uh, pressing this into service to house some of our homeless and highly mobile folks um, that that said those were very similar to the reports that um, this board had received 
prior to the multiple outdoor resolution sanctuaries that we passed, uh, resolutions that we passed. So, and to me, a, a roof and showers and air conditioning and heat is a more dignified alternative than a tent and possibly mace and possibly possibly bulldozers. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm still, I still have some real reservations about this. I know that there are some also concerns about the concentration of where we are looking at putting shelters in the city with some of our partners and congregating them in specific area codes and not in others. And this just seems like it is an underutilized asset that could be pressed into service for a greater good. Uh, so I, I see this as different from the resolutions that are coming up in a little bit, which are renewals for tenants that have been paying their have been paying their leases. But this is a change in ownership. It's a reduction in revenue. I, I think we have to ask ourselves what is the highest and best use of this space here and now when we have not only a COVID pandemic, we have a homeless pandemic in our parks. And we stated multiple times our, our commitment to doing the best we can to be of some relief and support in that area. And this seems like a perfect opportunity. So I, and unless I hear some very compelling reasons from my colleagues, I, I'm not sure that I can support this. Our next speaker is uh, Commissioner Forney. Thank you, President Coco. Um, I couldn't um, disagree more. Um, it, it, I think it was very clear in the staff report that the amount of resources it would take to make this into uh, residential um, are significant um, uh, for the fact that also we are not in um, sheltered housing business. Uh, that is not our business. It's not our mission. Um, I know that there's some disagreement by some commissioners here, but um, I, I this Building is in a holding pattern until we can develop it into a park. And um, the highest and best use is as it's commercial building. Um, and more to the point is the resources um, to convert the property um, to a safe um, uh, and compliant uh, property. Um, <laughs> I don't want to ask staff to, to even come up with a number, but I have been in housing for quite a few years. I can tell you, it would be costly. And I don't believe that that's something that we should be even remotely considering in our budget um, now or in the future. So I will be voting in favor of this lease as well as the other two leases that will be coming before the admin and finance. Thank you. Our next speaker is Commissioner Severson. Uh, thank you, President Colville. Um, it's quite interesting to hear uh, Commissioner Forney say that we're not in this business when she most recently voted to be in this business by allowing encampments at Powderhorn. Um, but I guess we're, we are uh, human and we can change our minds. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner uh, Meyer for doing the due diligence on this property. Um, I, I surely do hope that uh, as the city that we find a place to uh, house people and that's why I would like to thank Commissioner Meyer for for doing just that um, I believe I, I am teetering on supporting this this evening um, because of uh, Commissioner Meyer's uh, due diligence but I would also encourage us for us to uh, have uh, more conversations on what an, an open space may look like and if there's money to help pay for that uh, and uh, that's all I have. Uh, appreciate you uh, recognizing me. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Uh, Commissioner Meyer for the second time. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify two things. Um, you know, first, uh, in, in, in response to something Commissioner Forney said, I mean, we, we, we already have the housing there that, that we are administrating, and, and there is a vacant unit in there that is designed to be housing that is owned by us, and I, I think uh, we should use that. Um, to clarify something that Commissioner Bourne said, that, however, um, the um, lease agreement coming up is, uh, one of them is an expansion uh, for take action. It's not just a renewal of, of 
uh, the existing to take action lease, it would, it would uh, expand into more space. And if, if we're if we're going to not deny um, the lease for the gym, then I think to be consistent, you would also have to deny it for take action. So if, if that's the um, the the direction that that you want to go on that, then I, then I hope you'll be consistent on that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Meyer, Commissioner Bourne, for the second time. Thank you, uh, President Colgill. Um, just in response to the uh, First District Commissioner's uh, call for consistency, I, I do see these as significantly different leases. Uh, again, on one hand, we have a have a partner that has a very similarly aligned mission uh, that is working on some of the same progressive policies to um, to combat homelessness that um, hopefully we are and we all support. Uh, they have a good track record of paying the lease uh, amounts that uh, they're required to pay and they're requesting more and additional space to do more and additional good work. Uh, this lease on this health club is a failed enterprise that has been sold to somebody else that hope, hopefully they will be able to make it a success. So I see, I see a fundamental difference. Um, I, I certainly would, um, if the first district commissioner is sincere in his efforts to press the other spaces in, uh, the Marshall property into shelters for our homeless and highly mobile populations. If he were to put forward an amendment to go along with this resolution, providing that direction to staff, I, I would certainly support that. Um, and, and I do also appreciate uh, Commissioner Severson's work on and comments about Commissioner Meyer putting forward the due diligence, but I just wanted to respond that I do see these as, as fundamentally different issues um, and I and I do want us to govern and vote towards what our stated values are. Uh, so I will leave it at that. Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I was under, under the understanding that this is a commercial property. Can someone explain to me why there are people living in the commercial property and whether or not that's a violation of their lease? President Kogo, uh, Commissioner Munich, there are two uh, properties. One is a holdover from the previous owner, and the other was the uh, caretaker unit for the, the building. Uh, the caretaker died recently, and that's the reason that that unit's empty. So when the current leaseholder's lease expires, then does that, or when they choose to move out, does that then become a commercial space for rent versus a residential one? President Kogo, Commissioner Musich, that's what we would uh, pursue. Okay, thank you for the clarification. I appreciate it. So, thank you, Commissioner Musich. Seeing no other hands raised, is there any other discussion? Any other discussion? Seeing none. President Kogo, I mean, I've already spoken twice, but I'm, I'm, I'm receptive to the amendment. The Commissioner Warren forward um, I I don't necessarily I, I don't think it should be tied to this lease though I just wanted to say that so I'm I, I'd be happy to put it forward at the next meeting though or or, or a staff directive after this one um, but it shouldn't be like a tied condition of the lease right I guess that's a question for, for council rights if it should be separate from this Council Rice? Well, yes, I, I would recommend you do it. I mean, this is a fairly simple lease transaction that under the charter, the board has to vote on it. Um, it. It sounds like there's been several questions about what the status of this property is and whether you could accomplish a housing purpose at a uh, commercial location. So, um, it's, uh, yeah, I think you're right, Commissioner Meyer. If you want to bring it forward, I bring it forward in a separate motion at another meeting. We'd have time um, for the staff to evaluate it and, and determine whether it's legal to even do it. Okay, so what I would propose is that we vote on this lease now, and then after that vote has been taken, 
um, consider a, a staff directive to uh, give direction to start working on on the suitability of, um, of making that vacant space um, available. Um, we have uh, Commissioner Musich for the second time. Commissioner Bourne, you've already spoken twice, I believe. Thank you, President sure. Kogo. Um, I would ask that any additional resolutions to modify the use of properties owned by the Park Board in terms of housing be put on the agenda for people to be aware of those in advance. Um, I, I can't even count the number of emails that I have gotten from constituents that were furious that they not only were not consulted about changing parks into encampments, but that we didn't even have it on our agenda the day that it was voted on. So I would ask that any sort of action on this topic of housing people on properties that are meant to at some point become parks uh, be put before the people in a way that, that demonstrates transparency and an opportunity to give feedback to the board on what they're talking about doing. Thank you. Point of order, Commissioner Cogill, the, the first district commissioner can speak to a resolution three times, but the sixth district commissioner cannot. I'm not familiar with that point in our rules. Commissioner Bourne, uh, the, the first district commissioner did just start speaking. I guess I'll allow you to speak in uh, response, given the fact that he was allowed to do that. Uh, thank you for your flexibility, President, uh, President Cogill. Um, I'll, I'll remind the first district commissioner of, of a little bit of history, and I'll, I'll also remind the first district commissioner that a compound resolution is in order. Um, and just a few weeks, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we passed a resolution uh, and did not give explicit directions then, and even tonight, as we're getting feedback on where ninety-four thousand dollars of uh, services for that this board and I believe the first district commissioner voted to do this too to allocate towards services for homeless and highly mobile vulnerable members of our population. We received a report back that there's conflicting reports from our director of finance and our assistant superintendent for environmental stewardship as to whether those funds have been gobbled up by administration and uh, general operating chargebacks, or if those funds are available for the use that the board intended. Uh, so I, I would, I, I would trust the first com district commissioner to move this as a separate action following this, but I would also expect the first district commissioner to follow up with that and ensure that uh, the will of the board is being followed with, uh, if they do so choose to allocate some of those spaces towards some of our most uh, vulnerable populations, because sometimes when something when these things go out, they they quickly they quickly morph through the bureaucracy away from what what was intended on this dais. And I just want to make sure that if the first district commissioner is trying to do something good and noble and pure, that it doesn't get swallowed up through some unintended um, unintended bureaucracy after the fact. I would be much more comfortable with a compound resolution, but I would trust the first district commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, Commissioner Forney. Uh, I'm sorry this is being so deliberated, but I do need to remind people that this is in the above the fault master plan. Um, and I, anything that we act on differently than what the properties have been used for, um, I think that we need to. <laughs> We have been fighting for years for that uh, master plan, and it, it is not, um, uh, this whole conversation is not in line with that plan. Thank you. Seeing no other uh, hands raised, I will ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2022-69. Commissioner Bourne. Pass. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Can you see me? Yep. Yes. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. 
Commissioner Hassan. Abstain. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. You have eight ayes, one abstain. That carries. Uh, moving on to unfinished business, we have a study report. Uh, well, it's really a study item uh, pertaining to the Northern Columbia Golf Course and Park Water, Park Storm Water BMPs project. Um, and I know we have uh, Mr. Schilling and uh, Director Swenson here to discuss this, uh, give us an overview of the project uh, and get commissioner guidance uh, and questions uh, regarding this project. So I will turn it over to Mr. Swenson and Mr. Schilling. Thank you, uh, President Cogill and commissioners. Um, this is, uh, as, as you mentioned, this is a, a discussion item, so there's no formal action that we're requesting on this, um, but we are really interested in getting your input on um, the project and also um, uh, we'll be covering, covering some of the uh, background and moving into um, what we'd like to most input on you uh, from you is um, for the um, kind of long-term agreement or easement considerations for this project uh, and uh, hearing what uh, your questions are and what you have to say. So um, first is the uh, outline here. We are, we'll be looking at six different areas. First, the uh, issues and goals we'll be talking about um, that flooding is a big issue for Columbia Park and Golf Course. Uh, and it is also a shared issue with the surrounding neighborhood and communities. Um, the, the, there's also in within Columbia Park and Golf Course, there's a aging in infrastructure issue that we have there. Um, so that those are the, the issues we want to tackle. Uh, goals were identified as um, that we'll, we'll talk about uh, to improve playability of the golf course and park use. Uh, reducing flooding and improving stormwater management, um, reducing pollutant loading to the Mississippi River, and uh, improving both the ecological function within the park and the golf course. We'll go through those goals in a little more in detail and the issues. Uh, we'll cover the project partners on this project. We are in partnership with um, the uh, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, as well as uh, the city of Minneapolis. Um, to implement this project. Um, what we've done so far in the timeline, we'll cover, um, this has been a long project, a long planning effort and design effort. Um, we'll go through the uh, three different approvals that have happened on this project since 2017 by the board and, uh, um, and I'll outline uh, the, the next approval that we need in order to build the project itself, uh, the uh, an easement or long-term agreement consideration. Um, We'll take a bit of a step back to the last agreement that was passed, um, the construction cooperative agreement that was passed by this board in March of this year. Um, just to really dive into the um, uh, design um, where we're addressing flood reduction, improvements of the golf course, uh, ecological um, benefits of the project and also water quality benefits. Um, we, we, we heard from the July 1st uh, so July 1st board meeting, we brought an easement agreement to the board um, to committee and that was defeated. And I think we've, we've gleaned some, you know, we, we were able to understand a little bit of, of um, where some of the questions are. And so hopefully this design and some uh, other aspects of this presentation will hopefully address some of those questions and also help us get a better sense of, um, of uh, as a board, what what you're thinking of, what we're proposing. Um, we'll then move into ownership and maintenance and the easement uh, considerations on this project. Um, what we had proposed on July 1st and what we're, after a lot of work with our partners, what we're proposing um, as an alternative. And then finally, we'll look at the numbers and uh, have it reiterate um, the project value to the MPRB, uh, to the golf 
uh, golf community and to the park um, that this project provides. Next slide. Um, as an overview for uh, identifying the issues, um, this is a this uh, the Columbia Golf Course and Park is located within the one NE watershed, one northeast watershed. Um, this graphic shows the study area that um, our partners put together. Uh, it is about a 2,150 acre watershed area outline. Uh, the red hatching shows the there's a portion of this watershed that is untreated, uh, meaning that it, whatever falls into the catch basin goes directly to the Mississippi River. Um, there are flooding focus areas that, I, that are highlighted both in blue and uh, pink blobs and the orange blobs that I have uh, connected lines to. Those, those areas you can see that there's, there's flooding concerns outside of the Columbia Park uh, and golf course footprint. And then the, within the dash green line, you can see they're also flooding, um, flooding areas within the park that this project is meant to address. Next slide. Just some, some images of you know, the issues on the ground that we see at, at Columbia Golf Course. Um, they, they are varied in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, degree in which um, flooding is becoming an issue, but um, there are several items here, including the top, the top photo, the panoramic photo. This is right by the, you know, near the, the Columbia Manor um, clubhouse. You can see um, that dash line is kind of the horizon line that you of the land surrounding the golf course in this area. On the left-hand side is a railroad that bisects the, the park. And on the right side is Central Avenue. We're kind of looking north here. Um, the position of the golf course in this area is much lower than the surrounding area. Um, so it is inev inevitably um, a flood concern, especially um, since we also have some aging infrastructure and failing infrastructure in this area. The, the railroad in this spot is about 25 feet above the grade of the golf course. Um, turf management is also an issue. Any flooding or any, any uh, moisture can really affect um, golf, uh, the, the condition of the, the turf. Um, there's aging infrastructure that you can see on the left-hand side there. Um, we have a 1960 era, 1960s era pipe um, and infrastructure that's, that's failing or poor condition. Uh, you can see there that it's, the pipe is separating from the catch basins, and um, there's also issues with where they're located relative to um, where the flooding uh, occurs. Uh, there's complex hydrology on the site. We have, um, through our partnership with the MWMO, uh, they are providing they provided some observation wells in this area. This is in, this is located more in the southern area of the project uh, of the part of the golf course, um, trying to understand the complex hydrology in those areas. Um, on the bottom left is, you know, there's seasonal impacts where this area floods a lot. It affects when golf is ready to start in spring, when golfers are itching to uh, get the clubs out and get moving. Um, and then on the right, you can see flooding, uh, creating obvious issues with playability. That picture is actually from the southern area of the golf course, but uh, it does illustrate it uh, well. Next slide. A few more issues to go through. Uh, invasive species is a concern. Um, at the golf course and park, um, a lot of our woodlands are really choked out or uh, congested with invasive species. Uh, this is hole six that you're looking down. I've kind of highlighted the edge of the fairway, rough area. Um, it a, creates a very narrow corridor where um, it, it's a wall of vegetation and a normal healthy woodland would be, um, you could really see underneath the trees and have, have good sight lines. Um, this creates an issue uh, for golfers, uh, you hit it into there, you're definitely not going to find your ball. Um, what this project helps, uh, one of its many benefits is uh, opening up that understory and the ground cover so that um, we have a, a better ecological project, but um, it also helps with, with golf and opening up those corridors. Um, wet conditions and rutting happens when we have flooding, so any golf carts that are being used uh, can really uh, mess up the turf. Again, aging infrastructure on the site. And then there's some pretty flat, low-lying areas. But both of those, uh, these photos are in the uh, northern part of the, the golf course. Uh, next slide. So as part of the goals, again, we, we took a, a, this is a joint effort between the MWMO, and the MPRB, and the city of Minneapolis. 
really with identifying common goals that have been approved by our board that since uh, 2017, the initial MOU agreement. Uh, the overarching or overlapping goals include improving stormwater management, increasing flood resilience or reducing flooding, uh, reducing pollutant loading to the Mississippi River, improving the eco ecological function, and, um, and also the improving the playability of golf uh, at the golf course and for park use, improving playability. Uh, next slide. Um, in the, within one any watershed, there is work already happening outside of the uh, footprint of Columbia. Uh, you can see the, the um, green dots show other activities that are working. Oops. Okay. Um, those stormwater BMPs are either under construction or being planned in, in a sequence that would match up with um, construction within Columbia Park and Golf Course. Uh, things like um, pretreatment uh, pre-treatment filters so that any water that does eventually enter into the system on the golf course and park would be uh, cleaned up and filtered, uh, which is which helps with resilience and, and long-term benefits of, of uh, how these proposed BMPs will operate. Uh, next slide. So what we've done so far, this is the timeline that we're looking at. Um, we've if you look back on the left, in May of 2017, over three years ago, we had our initial uh, MOU that was signed and approved by our board um, that sets out the, the primary goals for ourselves and our partners um, that uh, I outlined the, in the last slide about our shared goals. Um, th then we had in February of 2019, um, the Columbia Park Master Plan or East of the River Plan was adopted and that included um, spaces for stormwater BMPs within the golf course um, and park. We had a, in June of 2019, a design agreement was based, basically preliminary design that I further identified uh, the need for upgraded pipe and BMPs. We went out to the community last October, I had a, had a great open house at the manor um, in pouring down rain. So I uh, had some benefits there to, to still look out at the course. Um, got some good feedback from the golf community and the, um, the neighborhood, um, kind of reinforcing that design. We then the most recent approval that we'll focus on in this presentation is the construction cooperative agreement, um, which is between the three parties uh, that was approved in March. Uh, that really identifies the design and breaks down the ownership of the infrastructure and from water BMPs. Um, and as well as well some of the operations and maintenance. Uh, we'll look at the kind of critical feedback we're looking for on the easement agreement, and then we'll I'll touch it quickly upon anticipated construction and maintenance. Next slide. So just uh, just to get our bearings straight a, a bit, um, as I talk through the next parts of the design slide, this is just uh, uh, a, a way to um, orient ourselves. Columbia, Columbia Golf Course um, um, covers three quarters of the overall Columbia, the, the green space. Um, Columbia Park is a small wedge in the upper center portion. Um, and then we have Fifth Street Northeast on the west side, Central Avenue on the east side, Columbia Parkway on the north, and St. Anthony Parkway on the south. Um, there is a railroad corridor that bisects um, the Golf course, you can see running from the southeastern end to the northeastern end. Uh, there's also a railroad on the very north end. Uh, the white dashed line is the 1960s era storm sewer uh, that goes to the site that's in poor and failing condition, including going underneath the railroad corridor. Um, and then the blue lines on the, on the along Central Avenue and Fifth Street Northeast, uh, those represent um, existing flooding that happens uh, when we have intense rainfall events or, or large volumes of rain, um, they actually enter at those points um, get along Central and along Fifth into the golf course and and uh, and exacerbate the flooding that happens. Um, these they will flow down the golf. The they'll jump the curb or flow out of pipes or it'll backflow into our storm sewer system and bubble up out of catch basins within the golf course. So there's, again, the Columbia Golf Course is low and, and that, that's what happens in a, in a 
environment like this. Um, so we'll, we'll touch a little bit more on that in the next slides. Next slide, please. Um, overall, this is just an overview of what pieces of infrastructure and features that'll be, um, that are part of this project. Uh, if you look at the black line leading from the right hand to the left hand side, you can see flow arrows on that. That's the storm sewer pipe upgrade, the replacement, replaced pipe um, for the project. Um, they're including going, pipe going through the railroad corridor. Um, in terms of the blue highlighted areas, those are the stormwater BMPs or best management practices. Those are kind of on the ground footprints that you can see. Um, starting on the west side, you'll see that it's a northwest infiltration basin. This is where we have good soils to infiltrate stormwater. Move into the center, into the park itself. There's a dry basin next to the multi-use field that's located there. And then on the right-hand side is the Northeast Wet Pond, which is, you know, that's currently a water hazard, according, um, and it's been, a, it's an expanded water hazard to all the, to the pond that's um, there, uh, to all to create um, water quality benefits. One thing to point out on this, along Central Avenue, you'll see a circle with two arrows um, kind of pointing in different directions. Uh, that indicates how stormwater comes in to the project. So off of Central Avenue, their existing storm sewer, um, there'll be a, a manhole that'll be installed to split some of the flow into the uh, Columbia Golf Course and Park. And then in more intense rainfall events, higher volume rainfall events, it, the water continues, stormwater continues to use the Central Avenue storm sewer system. Same thing goes for the Fifth Street Northeast. Um, there's a split flow there. The drainage area to this site is from the 1NE watershed is about a thousand acres. So that's, that's, that's a really big number on its face, but with these split flows, um, the way that it's set up off of Central and Fifth Street, it peels off some of that initial water um, to get the water quality benefits and help with flooding for the golf course and some of the neighborhoods but it doesn't all flow through this site. There's still existing infrastructure that is that is there and utilized. Next slide. Mr. Shilley, I just want to note the time. I'm hoping you can wrap this presentation up so we can get to questions here in the next couple of minutes. Okay, I'll move on forward here. Thank sure. you. Um, the, uh, the, these are the kind of the a focus to show really the benefits to Gulf. Um, we've modeled the events for rainfall um, for this site. Each for each of these basins under a two year rainfall event, which is 2.8 inches in 24 hours. Um, the Northwest infiltration basin will, will flood for about a half a day today, uh, but in proposed conditions, it'll be five hours. Uh, similar for the multi use field, the Northeast wet pond is a, the biggest problem within the north part of the park, where it'll pond for three and a half days, um, but proposed conditions will be one hour. It affects seven to eight golf holes. Um, throughout these scenarios. Next slide. For a 10 year rainfall event, which is 4.2 inches, it will, um, if we go through them again, one day of flooding today, uh, proposed five hours, same for the multi use field, and then Northeast Wet Pond, really, again, multiple days, uh, we're reducing it down to five hours. So, helping with increased playability. Next slide. For the 100 year event, you can see the line, the area's blobs get larger and larger, flooding more and more areas, um, including, um, and you can also see on the southern end, um, the Northwest Infiltration Basin and all of these items, all these areas, uh, we're reducing flooding by at least two days, two days or more. Um, next slide. So really that reduced flooding by two days or more, um, really equivalates to uh, loss of golf revenue. So you can't have people out there playing golf. So if you take uh, somebody who's uh, playing a $5,600 per day, if you assume 40 rounds um, with full force and playing, you can see two days, that's over $11,000 just by having to reduce uh, some additional time because of the reduced flooding. You'll also see in the Southern end, there's a big issue down there um, that's hatched with the green lines, that's another phase of the project that needs more uh, analysis. Um, and uh, that would be a future phase. If, uh, this phase that we're looking at here is kind of a low hanging fruit. Uh, so Columbia has a lot of 
need, um, and this is kind of a, a phase, address it in phases. Next slide. Quickly, golf improvements, going through these sites, um, we're improving golf course play, um, improving fairway slopes on, on holes one, two, and seven. We're adding uh, new forward and back tees, cart path extension, and uh, vegetation management in that area. Next slide. Golf, again, the railroad, this is a critical piece, about a million dollars just to jack through uh, underneath the railroad. The city would take that on, so that would be their primary benefit. Or that would be a huge benefit to golf and uh, a huge liability that uh, we can get rid of. Next slide. Within the multi-use field, we're increasing, uh, reducing flooding, which increases recreation time, and we'll have uh, vegetation management throughout, creating a great space um, for recreation. Next slide. On the northwest infiltration corner, we'll um, we're adjusting the the uh, golf there to a par three on hole 14, but we've added a par five on the earlier slides. Uh, so we're not changing any of the golf um, holes or overall strokes on this project. Um, we're improving drainage here and having um, a lot of vegetation management um, with prairie and restoration. Um, we're also creating a new trail along fifth and creating um, a really great user experience, not just within the golf course, but on the, on the edges. Next slide. Um, the habitat value, again, the brown areas, like the tan and, and brown areas are uh, over 17 acres worth of habitat restoration as part of this project. Uh, again, creating a, a scenario that meets our goals as a, as a MPRB. Uh, next slide. Water quality, we're getting over, um, we're tr this project would help treat over 600 acres that currently are untreated entering the Mississippi River. You can see the photo here is the pipe outfall. We're reducing phosphorus to the Mississippi River by over 170 pounds a year. One pound of phosphorus, just for reference, is almost 300 to 500 pounds of algae. So you can see what benefit that provides. Uh, we're also reducing sediment to the Mississippi River by 37 tons per year. Next slide. Um, this is just a rehash of what we're constructing and just to note the MPRB is not responsible for any of the construction capital costs associated with, the, with this project. So we are not paying for capital costs for this project. Uh, that is done by our partners. Next slide. So let's move into the easement uh, agreement consideration under the big arrow um, where we're at today that we'd really like some more feedback on. Next slide. Our initial easement agreement that we brought to the board on July 1st that was defeated in committee had the following setup. Um, the MPRB, um, what, actually the city, was it would own and operate and maintain um, the pipe system through there that's highlighted in black, as well as the two, um, two of the three BMPs, the multi-use uh, dry basin, field dry basin, and the northwest infiltration basin. Uh, since there's really just local golf benefit to that northeast wet pond. Uh, that was always going to be our um, operations and maintenance responsibility. Again, this was the scenario that was defeated uh, because we, we would have to have easements over the BMPs um, and the pipe, um, and that brought some consternation from, from commissioners. Next slide. So a new easement consideration that we're proposing would like discussion on is that the new storm sewer pipe would still still be within an easement agreement with the city to own, operate, and maintain, uh, be a long-term permanent easement for the pipe. Um, that's a typical piece of infrastructure that uh, NPRB has done with the city before uh, under that um, circumstance. Uh, however, the the two BM all the BMPs would actually be um, NPRB responsibility. Um, we would manage those BMPs for their useful life, estimated for 30 years. And um, um, that way, there's no easement over that. That's the above ground land. We would have more control of what those look like based on maintenance um, of the BMPs. And if after 30 years, we feel that they're not needed or we have a new, a new use that we want to have in those locations, we would be able to take those out um, under this easement agreement. Uh, set up. 
Uh, I should also point out that we, under this agreement, we would have the city um, agree to cost sharing on major maintenance efforts with those BMPs, so that we're not taking the front of of the major maintenance on that project on those projects. Hey, and all hey, the Andy. Yeah. Hey, Andy, and in the, for the sake of time, maybe this is a good place for us to stop and take questions, yeah. and we could refer to other slides if there are particular questions. That'd be great. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Schilling and uh, uh, Director Swenson. Uh, we do have a couple questions here. Uh, Commissioner Steverson. Thank you, President Colville. Uh, can you see me? Yep. All right. Um, so this appears to be a little bit better. I'm happy that we're having a conversation around uh, the longevity of the easement. 30 years uh, is a long time. Um, my concern about 30 years is um, I don't want this to turn into a Hiawatha situation. I already feel like a lot of planning and management um, aren't huge supporters of golf uh, along with others. And, and I want to make sure that uh, we're setting so, uh, golf up to be successful in Minneapolis. Um, is there any way we can get that down to 20 years or, or maybe even 25 years? President, President Colgill, uh, Commissioner Severson, that, that's a really good question. And I think it's really important for uh, the board to understand that, you know, beginning in 2017, our goal was to increase playability at, the, at, at Columbia. So that's been primary for us. Uh, 30 years is a, is a number that we've worked out with the city and with our uh, other partners. It, it's, typical, it's a typical number if we think about um, money that's going to be used from um, uh, grants and city bonds to pay for this. Typically, it's at 20 to 30 years that's used for payback. So we feel that if we're, if we're in managing those BMPs, uh, especially in the northwest corner, if it's not functioning, we're letting the city know well before 30 years that there are issues going on that need to be corrected. So I, 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 you know, we've talked about different numbers with the city, but right now the city feels comfortable with this and it matches our co construction cooperative agreement uh, that was approved by, by the board in March. Well, to be a little more comfortable, I, I hope that we will at least ask the question. Um, can you also tell me how this is going to be different from Hiawatha? How can you ensure me that this, you know, this is a, a, as great a plan as folks are trying to make it seem? Sure. Uh, President Cogill, uh, uh, Commissioner Severson, thank you for asking that. You know, I think over the years we've learned quite a bit. And again, I, I want to reiterate, I want to make sure board understands that uh, staff here have been very supportive of golf and want to make sure that we increase playability within this course. So these designs, there's a, there's a good engineering firm that's been involved in this. You know, um, uh, Deb Pilger's staff, Rachel Crabb, Andy, myself, uh, others have been reviewing, and, as well as Joe Green and uh, Larry Humphrey from Golf, have been reviewing these designs. We, we hired our own um, golf course designer to review uh, the, uh, the, the design and engineering of the, the golf course improvements to align so they make sure that it's a good playable course and it, it meets the requirements. Um, I think we've learned a lot since Iowa. You know, certainly the engineering that's gone into this uh, uh, greatly surpasses what was done at Hiawatha. You know, so far, MWMO has spent $1.4 million in engineering for this uh, studying the 1NE, looking at Columbia, and then finalizing the design for Columbia uh, for the North Half. So there's been a, a, a big focus here to make sure we've got the best, uh, uh, the best design and best engineered solution for, uh, for, to solve our flooding problem on, on Columbia. So, with every plan, good or bad, there is um, there are drawbacks. What are the drawbacks of this plan? There are none. Right, right now, the park board does not have the money to replace the infrastructure that we have right now. There's a five to six million dollar liability that we're carrying right now. We have the ability for through city funds and MWMO grant funds to pay for these improvements. In the north half, there, there are no draw, drawbacks for us. That's why staff 
even though uh, an item did not make it out of committee, we went back to our partners, we went back to commissioners, we went back to legal counsel, and we're back to you today to show you that this is a really good plan and this makes sense for, for the park board, for golf play, and for the enterprise fund. Well, I, I mean, I really want to thank you, and, and I appreciate the, the work that you guys have put in this, into this. Um, I know it's been a lot of work um, and a lot of good effort, but I, I hope you understand my concerns um, just from the, the Hiawatha conversation and how tense that got and how golf is actually making a lot of money for us this year and how we can go off of that. I guess my last statement would be I would hope that you guys can uh, try to push the envelope a little more and try to uh, get that uh, easement uh, down to 20 years would be great. Um, but I just want to thank you for all your work you've done on this. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. <clears throat> Commissioner Forney. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, Thank you, staff, and, and really, um, you have worked so diligently on this, and as I think you might know um, or remember and everything, I am so supportive of this. I feel like it's a complete and absolute win-win. Uh, it addresses so many issues and makes a far more playable, exciting, you know, golf course, you know. Um, so um, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, I just would like to get some clarity, though, um, as to the cost share on major so do we have anything definitive, like if it's 50, you know, um, anything like that that's been thrown out? Yes, um, Commissioner Forney. Um, the, that is part that we'll be working on the operations and maintenance ag agreement on the staff level after this that um, will lay out those specifics of what, um, what does uh, constitutes a major maintenance activity, but they would fall underneath like, um, if there was a like dredging need on on any of these BMPs to clean them out after time, if they've slowly reduced their ability to filter and, and infiltrate water, um, in terms of an actual cost split, that would be part of our conversation for sure. And um, you know, we can identify that there's more water coming in from the city side versus um, versus the golf course internal drainage. Um, that'll help inform that cost split, kind of on a um, back it up on a scientific way. Great, and and just remind me, it, it seems to me that we were actually giving an easement to the city, okay, um, and they were going to do the maintenance and the cost of the maintenance. Is that correct? The original yeah. easement that that was defeated, um, yeah, had that set up. Right. Yep. So in other words, now we're paying to do the maintenance. I mean, mind you, that we're doing the supervising and everything. But um, I, I, in some ways, I feel like we've lost something in this. But I, I just I want us to move forward on it. I really cannot urge you enough because number one, if I understood your timeline, we would not be interrupting too much of our playing time um, this season or next season. So um, I would um, request the staff come back as soon as possible. You know, with um, with this, um, I, I prefer the the prior one, but you know, we're at this one. Um, draft it and let's vote on it. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Commissioner Meyer, followed by French. Thank you. Uh, I, I won't take much time. I don't have any questions, but just want to reiterate that I think this is a very good proposal and that I hope we vote for it soon. Commissioner French. Sliding rule. Is there a sliding rule over there? There's the, uh, uh, a sledding hill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that won't be affected with this project. Um, that is something that um, is maintained as a local community benefit for sure. Um, that, and that'll still be available. That's right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Seeing no other questions. Uh, seeing no other questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation and um, for taking the questions. That um, appreciate the work on this. Uh, thank you, President Kogo and Commissioners. Appreciate it. Good one. All right, uh, moving on. Um, we have a motion uh, on Resolution 2020-270. Uh, 
uh, the second and final reading of resolu the resolution to repeal PB2-21 of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board Code of Ordinances. So moved. Uh, and a motion. Is there a second? Second. Then a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Uh, Commissioner Bita. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I'd like to make a motion to table resolution 2020-270 um, in the hopes that staff can bring back a park, a park rule that accompanies the repeal. Uh, there has been a motion to uh, table the resolution. Is there a second? I will second that motion. Um, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll on tabling resolution 2020-270. One second, so I'm just pulling up the um, visuals. Commissioner Bourne. Pass. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. No. Commissioner Meyer. No. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what Commissioner Burns said. He said hi. Hi. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, pass. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Bourne. Secretary, the the votes are four to table two in opposition as of right now. President Cogill, Commissioner Bourne, that's correct. I will abstain. Commissioner Hassan. There are four ayes, two nays, one abstain, one absent. What about no, Commissioner Forney? She passed. Oh, my oh. apology. Uh, Commissioner Forney. Aye. There are five yeah. ayes, two nays, one abstain, one absent. Uh, motion to the table carries. Um, moving on, uh, we have no new business. Uh, I'll move on to petitions and communications. Commissioner Bourne. Pass. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Musich. I'll pass also, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Uh, Commissioner Severson. Thank you, President Colville. Um I just want to uh, thank Superintendent Bangora and Assistant Superintendent uh, Barrick uh, Storms got pretty evil up here uh, over the weekend, and um, it was uh, nice to see that our staff was out there working hard, and uh, our, our community is thankful, and we're still trying to pick up the pieces. Uh, specifically, the Camden neighborhood got nailed pretty hard, um, so I, I want to make sure that uh, you, your work did not go unnoticed, and, and we appreciate you and, and value you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Um, I will bring something forward working with staff um, to try to bring something to the September, first September meeting uh, so we can put to use the vacant residential space at 1828 Marshall. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Um, Commissioner French. 
Yeah, I just I want to I know I talked uh, last meeting about uh, an investigation being done about who or Minneapolis Police Department to bring uh, unsheltered folks to our parks. I want to know if that in progress. What are we doing? Is that a hold? Uh, that's a question I have to ask. And, and I also want to close out by saying um, we, we've got to figure out a better way to do what we're doing. It's not easy. It's hard. I mean, we moved 30 folks and put people in hotels before that Friday hit. You can get folks a little bit more time. We wouldn't be dealing with a lot of the, the, the pushback that we're getting from activists right now. Patient. There's one thing I learned working with kids. It's patient. And so I, I would I would love for our staff to figure out some type of non-police intervention way if we if we needed to um, disperse encampments because of safety. Because of safety. We need to figure out a different way to do it. Because at the end of the day, there are neighbors, there are friends, there are relatives. So uh, it's it's not going to be easy. It, it, it hasn't been easy. Uh, we just got to keep, you know, keep keep treading forward. And I just want to say thank you uh, to Superintendent uh, Bengora. We have had some really, really interesting conversations over the last uh, month and a half, and, and he, he has been patient with me, and I've been patient with him, and we have developed a, um, a relationship that is tumultuous at times and, and very supportive at times. So, but I really do appreciate. Uh, his his leadership right now, I really do, and I, I I don't know if I say that enough, but I really want you to know that I appreciate your leadership. Uh, we we have some very tumultuous conversations, but at the end of the day, I still say, hey, I, I like that guy, and I'm glad we picked him. So thank you, Al, and I'm done. thank you, uh, thank you, President Carver, for letting me speak. Thank you, Commissioner French, uh, Commissioner Forney. Thank you, President um, Colville. The past couple of nights speeches for an endorsing convention of a public servant has renewed my oath for this office. Michelle Obama and Jill Biden reaffirm my belief in our role as commissioners. Statements like going high is the only way it works, power of our example, example of power, characters when nobody is looking, see yourselves and others in the goodness of people. I want to acknowledge the works of our own staff. We commissioners have received an inordinate amount of emails, phone calls, and voicemails. I've struggled to stay on top. And I know other colleagues have full mailboxes, one not yet set up. Our constituents deserve to hear from us. I am humbled that our customer service staff has actually been filling, filling so many of these gaps in our responsibility as elected servants to the people. Our IRS Paul Burke Peterson, candor in responding with information that is realistic and complete. Forwarded responses from Jim Rath, reflecting our constituents' frustration. Our customer service director, Annie Olson, steadfast nurturing of our staff. I'm grateful for our work, grounds workers, whose jobs have expanded to maintaining the encampment, particularly about Paul, all of us at Loring. Our feet on the ground community outreach workers working day after day to build relationships with our unsheltered homeless with dignity and steadfastly connecting with community to resources. I am grateful to Athegra Williams and her brilliant smile shared at every encampment. Amazed by our community outreach director who has severe underlying health conditions. Cookie Wiseman's warmth and grace radiate for all. Maybe it's a new bride we should be thanking, which by the way, congrats, Corky and Kim, on your wedding and best wishes for your endearing partnership. And the unexpected acts like Woody or Officer Woodland assisting Commissioner Vita to her harrowing visits to the encampment. And how utterly impressed I am with our own Chief of Police, Chief Ohado. Your strategic mind and skillful experience made possible to have but only one injury in the movement and closure of unauthorized encampments. Thank you for your compassion, your stewardship, 
your leadership. Please all know, as was stated in this past year, uh, night's convention, we see you, we care. And lastly, I just would like to wish a happy day of work, birth to our President Colgill tomorrow. Best wishes for you turning, um, tuning out of the internet land in your upcoming week of rest. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Forney, uh, Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Colgill. Happy birthday! I didn't know it was going to be your birthday tomorrow. It, um, it's actually the 23rd, but thank you, Commissioner Forney. <laughs> Very close. Whenever it is, happy birthday. <laughs> Um, I first want to start out by um, apologizing to the superintendent and his family um, for the protests that happened at their house today. I'm not apologizing because folks don't have a right to be heard, but I'm apologizing because I was out with park police and park staff all last week, and I don't know if these organizers understand that. When they post these calls to actions, when they send these tweet outs, and they organized for these um, opportunities to protest. Black and brown and indigenous bodies are, in, are being put in harm's way. Some of these people that are showing up to these protests are definitely white supremacists. I, I was a victim of white supremacy at Powderhorn. I had more white men yelling in my face, telling me what I should and shouldn't be doing, than I had peaceful protesters speaking to me. So I'm really sorry that that happened to you and your family. And I'm so sorry that these folks who are really organizing around the movement is being preyed on by white supremacists, by anarchists, by people who just hate police and are not really working to change homelessness in our city. It is very unfortunate that a real movement is, is being abused by white supremacy. Um, I would also like to say, as I said earlier today in my comments, that um, this board has done more. I've been on this board for three years, and under the leadership of President Cogill, we have done more around our unhoused, more for our unpop unhoused population than in the past couple of years that I've been on this board. We've took strong action. We've done what we could do. Uh, you know, there was people sleeping in parks last year and the year before that. And from what I remember, park police was going there serving 24 hour notice and removing people from parks after 24 hours. So this year, the park uh, board, the board of commissioners has took a strong stand and we've allowed spaces in 25 parks for our unhoused community. And we are in 20 parts, and we allow for up to 25 tents, and I think that's a lot to pat ourselves on the back. We have definitely stepped up when others have stepped back, and again, that has been under the leadership of President Cogill. I appreciate you, President Cogill, and I appreciate all that you do to make this board solid. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Vita. Um, Thanks everybody for the birthday wishes. Uh, I, I just had to say what the date was because I am on the cusp and I, I'm actually Virgo. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, being away for a few days in the Boundary Waters. Um, I just wanna say a couple of things here uh, regarding the work that we're doing this year. I think it has, as, as I've said before, been very difficult for everybody, but um, there's a, a a quote that I think of often from James Baldwin that nothing can be changed until you confront it and you're not going to know how to change it unless it's being confronted. Um, and while it's been a messy time, I think that um, we've made major strides in how we uh, uh, think about and uh, address uh, the unhoused populations and uh, neighbors of our city. Uh, especially in this difficult year, but I think that the learnings can be um, instrumental for how we how we proceed in future years. And I look forward to working with all commissioners on how we can take our learnings, both the mistakes and the, the successes, um, into our future work um, and turn it towards actionable work that is really directed towards the 
the, the housing of people. Um, because as I've heard from all community members, housing is the solution. Um, and uh, it's certainly the case that we all agree that uh, the park system is not the space to provide that uh, housing uh, solution at the scale that is necessary. Um, I am proud of the sites that we have permitted and the work that the staff has done to get permitted sites around our system. There was a lot of concern that no one would uh, sign up for a permit. Well, that has not actually been the case. Um, I also have learned a lot about what it takes to do the person-by-person -person work that's necessary to get people um, out of what are often really not uh, dignified situations in parks and into other uh, supportive settings. Certainly there are there is a dearth of certain kinds of supportive settings and I'm very happy that the city of Minneapolis and county uh, have worked uh, so hard to get additional um, specific types of shelters uh, available for folks coming online this fall. But there's a lot more work to do and I, I really believe that the way to address this is collaboratively um, across uh, institutions, individuals, uh, congregations, and community members uh, to to really realize uh, the goals uh, that, that we all share of everybody having a right to housing. Um, I also recognize that we don't fully have the tools that are necessary to uh, to to truly uh, and fully address the needs of some of the folks that are in our parks right now. Uh, it, it is uh, unfortunate that we've had situations where we've had to go in very quickly to disband what are dangerous encampments, and I do appreciate all the work that staff has done. I also uh, really echo some of the sentiments of uh, the, police, the chief of police in, in uh, Dallas, Texas, who has said that, you know, our police are uh, folks that ha are having to be tasked with every single major issue that are that is going on in, in the cities that other folks aren't able to deal with. Um, you know, we had volunteers and Mad Dads and other organizations um, in at those sites and, and at a certain point, no one's willing to do that work. Um, and we need to change that. We need to provide more tools for, for our staff, for our officers, and we need to find uh, the investment that's necessary so that we have the, the right tools in the right situations. Um, and uh, I appreciate all the staff stepping up, even when those right tools aren't uh, fully available. Um, and again, I, I look forward to moving forward into the fall and work with all commissioners in building the support that we need to other levels of government uh, to ask for the, su the, the support and the housing investments that are necessary to uh, address uh, a really intractable and um, uh, really difficult um, and, and, and hard issue that I think has hit us all pretty pretty hard. Uh, with that, uh, thank you all for your time, and I will uh, ha ask for a motion to adjourn the regular meeting of the park board. So moved. Resolution Second. has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll on adjournment. You can just adjourn it. Okay, I will, I will do so. Thanks for the motion in second, but I will just use my privilege here to adjourn and I will turn it over to uh, Chair Meyer to uh, reconvene the planning committee. Time being 9.33, I will reconvene the planning committee. We have five emails to read for testimony on the ecological plan. Um, I'm going to limit these to one minute each in the, in the interest of time, um, but staff can send out the full emails uh, to all the commissioners uh, if that doesn't get to them. Uh, so first up, we have Linda Johnson. In the, oops. in the ecological plan, it recommends to continue partnerships with local and state agencies to remain aware of and address emerging contaminants. I agree with the recommendation in the life section in number 36, limit use of pesticides and fertilizers. In the Roberts Bird Sanctuary, the sanctuary water needs protection from the fertilization contaminants of the fertilization of Lakewood Cemetery. Perhaps a holding tank before the sanctuary water to collect the Lakewood fertilizer from leaking into the sanctuary water. 
The use of pesticides in the bird sanctuary is taken from my volunteer work by the Lindale Park Rose Garden. The Rose Garden does not use pesticides. The new Rose Gardener says that roses live with other flowers. That's because the other flowers attract beneficial insects that could, would destroy the destructive pests in those rose beds. Some flowers are native and they come from other areas. They also come from other areas. Thank you, Linda. Uh, next up, we have Kit Hansen. Thank you for the opportunity to submit these comments to the Ecological Systems Plan. They focus on the recommendations within the plan. The recommendations within the chapters of water and air allude to the improvements of, in reducing pol pollution in these critical areas, but they are overly vague and risk not leading to concrete results. For example, underwater discusses reducing trash, A3, but would specifically, but should specifically address limiting the use of plastic in the park system. Under air, it's not enough to document and communicate options of, for hybrid and electrical vehicles, A-11.2. It must include requirements to actually choose such vehicles. It shows foresight to have the section on mitigating climate change, including sequestering carbon D-17, but it must provide substance with requirements to maintain and expand the urban forest and its quality, in particular, the use of appropriate native tree species. Thank you, Kit. Uh, next up is Carolyn. I'm, I'm Carolyn Carr, resident of Hiawatha neighborhood in Longfield community of South Minneapolis. I'm trained as a conservation biologist and have worked for the last 15 years to engage thousands of volunteers to help care for and improve the natural habitat of one of the MPRB's key natural areas, the Mississippi River Gorge. Thank you to the MPRB planning staff and the MPRB commissioners for this call to action, the Ecological System Plan. I applaud the MPRB for taking a long view here. The detailed plan has a broad scope and has identified many specific tasks and the departments of the MPRB responsible for implementation. Many of these details are about the management of the developed parts of the MPRB's park system. To many people, developed parks are the most familiar. But all of us in Minneapolis are enormously fortunate that the MPRB's land includes land that is still natural habitat. These natural areas should be understood to be the gems. Thank you, Carolyn. Next, we have Prasanna. Comment one, given that life is one of the sections and priorities of the MPRB ecological system plan and humans are a key element of ecological uh, and uh, ecosystem designs and that just harmonious relationships between all forms of life in an, eco in an ecological principle to strive for. How will this plan also include homeless humans as part of the park community, actively engage houseless humans and various other community members and groups, especially those in social work, public health and education in these discussions and implementations and compassionately educate our communities on how and why climate health, housing crisis, ecological design and community health are inextricably interwoven. Question, how are we reducing vehicle emissions if we are bulldozing parks uh, through encampments. Question when. Thank you. And finally, Jim Proctor. I'm a powder horn resident and volunteer leader of the Friends of Eloise Butler Invasive Plant Action Group. I want to thank the staff and the board for the ecological system plan. This kind of thinking is so important going forward for the health of our city. All of us who engage in volunteer efforts to restore degraded native plant communities will be particularly pleased with the point number 37, which includes replicate and expand effective current volunteer projects and activities and train field staff to coordinate with the support, coordinate with and support volunteer efforts. 
Volunteers are essential to making restoration efforts successful. In my view, the most thorough, well-maintained, and ever-expanding native plant communities in Minneapolis involve volunteers heavily. Volunteers are force multipliers, and they are well-suited in the ongoing monitoring and maintenance required to ensure long-term preservation of hard-won gains. Thank you. That concludes our testimony. Uh, next, we have a presentation um, from Adam, Adam Martin on the Ecological System Plan. Thank you, Commissioner Maya. Commissioners? I'm, I'm almost there, Adam. There it is. That's all right. Thank you, Secretary Ringgold, again, for being the, the slide uh, master here. Um, I want to begin the presentation tonight um, as I began this project many years ago. This was the first image that I showed when we kicked off the Ecological System Plan way back in 2014. Um, this is a photograph called the Blue Marble. It's probably very familiar. In fact, it's considered to be the most reproduced photograph ever taken. It was taken in 1972 from the Apollo 17 spacecraft as the astronauts on the final mission outside of our orbit were heading to the moon. The first time people took a picture of the entire Earth was just three years prior to that in 1969. In the entirety of human history, there's only been three years, a period of three years, where we have been able to actually, with human eyes, look back on our entire Earth. During that time period, 1969 to 1972, when the entwined environmental and civil rights movements were, were uh, reaching their peak. Um, this resulted in a perspective on the earth that went beyond just setting aside wild places and really started to focus on the quality of our air, water, protection of endangered species. And right along with this, next slide please, in 1969, the landscape architect Ian McHarg published a book called Design with Nature. This is a book on sort of how to look at landscapes and design appropriately for them. It's a pretty technical volume and it still sold a million copies. Next slide. What was interesting about this book is that it mapped, it showed a technique for mapping spaces. These are sketches of Staten Island looked at through a variety of different lenses. This was done physically on trace paper in the 1960s. Next slide, please. And then they were overlaid on each other to find an overall suitability map for the ecological performance of a particular site. Next slide. The ecological system plan for the park board is really founded on this principle of really thinking about ecology as a whole to look at the different slices of our landscape in Minneapolis and then to try to plan for them with specific policy direction. Next slide. We also produced a lot of maps and I'm going to scroll through these pretty quickly because the maps are kind of the heart of this, but they're also at this scale a little bit hard to read. So what we looked at were things like carbon sequestration and effectiveness across the system. Next slide. MPRB buildings with solar potential. Next slide. Geothermal opportunity areas. Next slide. Plant communities and biodiversity across the 6,700 acres of the Minneapolis system. Next slide. We looked at urban heat island and you can see disparities there that can be corrected. Next slide. We also looked at the habitat corridors, including the Mississippi Flyway, and the important bird areas of Worth Park and the Chain of Lakes. And we began to draw new corridors on a new map using um, uh, new science like pollinator sweet spots in order to try to connect our neighborhood parks into that overall ecological system uh, that uh, flanks our waterways and is well known. Next slide. So tonight what I wanna take you through, we've heard a lot, we've heard um, some uh, uh, great commentary from members of the public what I want to just do is talk about um, kind of what we heard in the broader uh, public comment periods that took place for this plan, um, and then obviously open for questions for you. So next slide. I'll try to very efficiently go through a basic timeline of the ecological system plan because it's been a long and winding road. I'm going to give a brief overview of the plan, and then I'm going to review the public comment that we heard 
during two different public comment periods. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the ecological system plan started actually in May of 2014. And it has a soft spot in my heart because I began at the park board in January of 2014. And part of the reason I came here was actually to manage the ecological system plan way back when I was working for Cliff Swenson. So from August 2014 to April 2015, um, we held four CAC meetings, three CAC meetings, we had staff meetings, and we did a lot of community engagement on, at that time. In June of 2015, the project was put on hold for almost two years because of um, uh, some staffing departures and some changes in roles. Um, uh, that was the time that I was also named Director of Strategic Planning and could no longer manage the project. So in March of 2017, we restarted the project under the new project manager, Ellen Kennedy. Many of you may remember Ellen. She managed seven CAC meetings, additional CAC meetings, and a lot of direct community engagement. And also uh, got us set up for a February to May 2019 public comment period. During that public comment period, Ellen Kennedy departed the park board. And so though there was a presentation to you during that public comment period, as is customary, a long period of time passed um, before we were able to tabulate that comment and then uh, revise the document. So in uh, 2020, this year, we did another community check-in on a revised draft that had been modified based on the earlier public comment period. So that, and then um, based on the community check-in, we revised the draft again uh, into the version uh, that is before you today um, in the public hearing. So next slide, please. The plan has a couple of key purposes. First of all, it strives to compile, create, and illustrate citywide ecological data. So those are some of the maps that I mentioned earlier or that I showed earlier. It's meant to outline guiding principles for environmental management within the park and also to challenge the community itself to rethink the city around them in terms of ecological function, benefit, and health. Next slide. We developed with the CAC a set of lenses. Basically, what are the problems that we were trying to solve? We know that these are all interconnected, but we also know that our policy language needs to have specific direction, sometimes for specific staff positions. So the seven pieces that we looked at, the lenses that we tried to solve, were air quality, habitat connectivity, biodiversity and habitat quality, stormwater runoff, sustainable energy generation, carbon sequestration, and the urban heat island effect. Next slide, please. Based on those lenses, the plan is divided into four different themes. Now, I recognize that water, air, land, and life are inextricably interconnected in our city and everywhere. But again, to have themes and to have a way to digest this is important for us to be able to operationalize the policies that we put forward. Underneath the themes, there are 13 goals and 50 strategies uh, for a more environmental future. Next slide. The next slide is going to show just a sample. Oh, I haven't frozen up. Oh, it seems I have. Yeah, I think you did. Okay, am I back? I think I, I think I froze up for a minute on my end, but I think it feels like I'm back now. Okay, so this this slide and the next one are just uh, some examples of the policy uh, uh, language as they appear in the document. Um, so that one was a water, and this is a life. Basically, we have a goal, and then under that we have a strategy, and then recommendations beneath it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We also include some implementation tools as part of the master plan. So in this chart, every single park is identified with which of those seven environmental lenses are going to be the most impactful in that park. For instance, and some parks just simply aren't suitable for geothermal generation or alternative energy. Some parks are not suitable for regional stormwater management. So we um, are, are giving a guide for what to focus on in a particular park. Next slide. In a, oh, I need to go back one. I think. Um, there's also a chart, I'm not sure where it, uh, where it ended up in the presentation, but there's, oh, here we go. 
Um, there's also a chart that identifies each department in the organization and which of the strategies and goals that they would be naturally responsible for. So this is a way, again, of making sure that the plan is implementable by assigning different um, uh, strategies to different departments. And you can advance, uh, Jennifer. And go forward one more. Sorry, I, I must have been uh, frozen when that one was uh, moved forward. Um, sorry, I want to go back one to the summary of the public comment. There we go. Um, uh, so uh, I want to have a couple of slides really quickly on the public comment summary. Um, there was no PAC recommendation against which to weigh these comments because the um, recommendation was not a charge of the CAC. They were primarily a community and technical advisor. We did have an official comment period in 2019, which garnered 49 survey responses. The formal tabulation for those were included in your board packet. The major themes there did guide revision of the document. The revised document, it had been a while, as I mentioned, so we did a community check-in on that document. We received 48 responses, almost about the same, as well as a redlined document of goals from a coalition of environmental groups. Constance Pepin spoke earlier this evening as a representative of those groups. Those comments are included in the board packets in attachment A, including the redlined gold document. Further revisions to the document did transform it into the version presented today. And I'll have you go ahead uh, and skip to the next slide. The, um, the official comment period in 2019 included several major themes. Um, I, don't, I won't uh, necessarily go through all of those. They are included in the board packet. So I'll skip to the next slide and focus a little bit more on the revisions for the most recent community check-in. So there's a couple of topic areas that really rose high for people in the most recent community check-in. One of them was habitat. So we did include more specific language about the habitat corridors. In addition, there was a request to talk about the Mississippi Flyway and the important bird areas. We specifically included the Mississippi Flyway in recommendation 38.1 about habitat corridors. Um, suggestions about uh, carbon, having stronger language about carbon, led to a new recommendation 17.2 about carbon sequestration in the park. Bird and wildlife safety was one of the most commented on aspects of the plan. And so we bolstered the recommendations there. We have a new recommendation about built infrastructure. Um, we talk about wildlife being specifically included um, in construction practices in strategy 25, uh, where there's some new language about um, construction specifications. The water quality goal was changed to uh, refer to improving water quality rather than just maintaining water quality. And then there are new recommendations about stormwater. The heat island uh, recommendation was actually modified to actually address um, equity concerns. Um, there is some disparity across our city in terms of urban heat island and tree canopy access. We wanted to recognize that. Next slide, please. With regard to education, we added strategy 40 and recommendations uh, those were revised and strengthened to talk more about public education. There was an additional recommendation about habitat alteration with regard to geese. And then volunteers, as Jim Proctor happened to mention in the letter that was read, we added a completely new strategy um, on, uh, on uh, utilizing volunteers. Um, there was a request to talk about more smart goals, uh, the idea that the plan would be more implementable and goal oriented. So we did strengthen the recommendations throughout and made them more active. And we added a new strategy 48, which will lead to specific SMART goals for those strategies that require them. And we also did strengthen the language in multiple examples throughout the document. Next slide, please. Uh, that concludes my summary of the public comment we heard during the two public comment periods and a brief overview of the plan. I'm happy to answer any questions that the commissioners might have. Chair Meyer. Thank you, Director Robertson. Uh, do commissioners have questions? not seeing any at this time. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, is there a motion uh, for resolution 2020-287? I will. Um, that's the resolution approving the ecological system plan. Um, is there any discussion on the resolution itself? I, I, I just want to say thank you to staff. I mean, 
<laughs> this has been long and laborious, but it's been worth it. And thank you, thank you, Adam, uh, for your stewardship as usual. And I will second that gratitude. Uh, Sorry. Seeing, seeing no other hand raised. I, I would like to just quickly say, Commissioner Meyer, that I'm uh, very excited for this plan and thank you for the overview, uh, Adam. Anyone else? All right, seeing no other hands raised, Secretary, please take the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Did French. Aye. I'm not able to see. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Aye. Commissioner Cogill. Or President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. Awesome. That passes. Is there a motion? I'd like to move resolution 2022-88, a resolution approving temporary occupancy under section 4F of the Department of Transportation Act of 1966 for the CSAH 5 Franklin Avenue at Chicago Avenue 2021 Highway Safety Improvement Project, a portion of which is within PV Park. Thank you. Is there any discussion for resolution 2022-88? Commissioner Forney. Yes, I, I just would like a clarification of temporary occupancy. Um, seems to me a, a, a relatively newer word or phraseology. Uh, let's see. Do we have staff available to answer that question? Is that, I think it was Carrie? Yeah. So. Chair Meyer, Commissioners, good evening. Um, Secretary Ringgold, there's a presentation and I can show a a, a slide or two just from that to clarify te temporary occupancy and what we mean by that. I also want to note that we have um, Josh Potter from Hennepin County on line here too to answer any questions, but I will jump in on this one. Thank you, Josh, for sticking around. Yes, thank you. Secretary Ringgold, are you able to find that? I am looking, Carrie, do you remember how you labeled it? Um, it was 2020 Hennepin County. Um, I, Chair Meyer, I might make ask a clarifying question of Commissioner Forney. Franklin yes. Avenue, Improvement, MCRB Board. You see it there? It. Yep, got it. Oh. One second. Please do, Dr. Arbertson. Yeah, Commissioner Forney, are you curious about what a temporary occupancy is or how it applies specifically to this project? Yeah. Um, temporary occupancy is a method under 4F that applies to parks and trails where they're not going to permanently use or occupy the land on which okay. they're building. Okay, no, that's, that's all a clarification Great. I need. Okay. And we've got, on the third slide, I think there's a breakdown of the... Um, okay the qualifications for temporary occupancy as okay. you advance to the third slide. Here we go. It's just different language. Maybe that fourth slide. Okay, yeah, it is. Thank you. Yep. So temporary nature results in no change in ownership of the land, has minimal scope of work, no anticipated permanent adverse physical impact, and the land will fully be restored to the original condition. Good. And, it, and it's just the 4F portion that, that <laughs> terminology. Thank you. That's, that's the clarity I needed. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Is there any other discussion on the resolution? Uh, seeing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. 
That carries. Their motion for resolution 2020-289. Oh, I'd like to move resolution 2020-289, a resolution approving operations and maintenance declaration for Green Fourth Street in the Towerside Innovation District, a portion, a portion of which is within the park currently referred to as Towerside Park. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this resolution? Commissioner Forney, are you for this one or for the last one? Oh, last one. Sorry about that. Seeing no other hands raised, uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Chair, Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to uh, discussion about the 1720 Marshall Northeast site. Um, if we still have Assistant Superintendent Schroeder with us, um, I'd like to get just a brief background on that before we move into discussion. Oh, Chair Meyer, I was hoping I could go through my 40 slide presentation. <laughs> Um, it, actually, there, there is a presentation, and um, I, I will uh, move through it um, really quickly to just get to the proposals that were received, um, because it does help to provide some context, and because the board um, may be seeking a direction um, relative to the use of park board owned land, it's important that you understand that we have gone through a process of uh, publicly soliciting uses. And um, I will note in the very beginning that this already has an error on it. It's 1720 Marshall Street Northeast, um, an error that's repeated on every on every one of these slides. I apologize for that. Um, Secretary Ringel, if you could just um, scroll through several of these because um, we can place this on on the uh, um, uh, on, on the website uh, just to provide some background, which is all <laughs> really doing uh, explaining the 1720 Marshall is uh, a parcel of land that was um, purchased by the park board in 2012, originally intended to be uh, a maintenance facility and, and no longer used for that because we built on the other side of the river. So we try to explain the context of this. It's within the above the falls. I, um, you can continue to move through here, uh, Secretary Ringgold. Um, it's got a 37,000 square foot building on it. Um, the building is vacant. It's deteriorated on the interior and what's no longer accessed by NPRB staff. And that's a significant consideration as we move into this. The, the guidance, uh, we have guidance from the above the falls uh, regional plan. It's actually designated as the Northeast Riverfront Park um, in, in the above the falls plan. Uh, please continue. Um, our, our major interest here is in finding a way for a pathway to move along the river. Um, as we're looking at some other uh, projects, we looked at the relative uh, spacing needed to uh, accomplish that uh, trail through the site. Um, it's also designated the dot um, in the map, um, right in kind of the, the upper center, thank you. Uh, that is the site there, and it's uh, Parks and Open Space Guidance in the 2040 uh, plan prepared by the city of Minneapolis. This is the building, the rather nondescript building. It's actually two levels on the riverside, uh, one level on the street side. Um, it's all brick, um, very simple, open interiors, mainly was used for uh, warehousing, and, and we have not used it for anything since uh, we've acquired it. We did a letter of interest. We tried to make this a very simple way for people to respond, um, simply outlining how, how they would propose to use it and trying to relate that to some of the things that we were interested in, uh, metrics that would be used to determine success, for instance, uh, how it related to our equity uh, goals, and also looking for a schedule for implementation. On the next slide, you'll see that we received four responses to our letter of interest. The first one, if you can advance to the next slide, um, we received one from an organization called Optimistic Partners. They would propose the site be used for a sauna. 
wilderness inquiry would create a facility called the Minneapolis, the Mississippi River Center. Um, and I'll go through each of these very briefly. Uh, the, the third uh, one was from an organization that would create a bicycle skills fitness center. Um, and then Elon Church, uh, you've heard several people spoke, speak to this, um, a 24 hour center for homeless. Uh, that proposal has been expanded to include um, uh, uh, another another idea uh, posed by a group called Envision that I'll get into in a very highlighted way in, in just a minute. Then the next slide, I just go a little bit into what each of these is, and um, I think we can skip fairly quickly past some of these. The, the first one is a sauna, um, basically someday being looking like something that would be uh, like the lower right image but initially using uh, mobile saunas um, and with the intent of using the saunas to create community. Significantly, uh, the saunas would not be free. Um, the proposal or the, the letter of interest stated that they would be charging $25 per hour. The next proposal was Wilderness Inquiry. Wilderness Inquiry is looking to build a new facility. They're, they are in a process of selling. Actually, they have sold, I believe, their existing facility near Dinkytown. Um, they would propose to build a building that would house their operation plus opportunities for community space and other nonprofits, uh, possibly even with some uh, housing as, as a piece of it. Uh, depending upon several factors, they estimate the construction cost of their building up to four and a half million dollars. They do note that they provide a lot of uh, services already to Minneapolis residents. And being in this location, being on the river, they would propose to expand uh, the way that they're serving uh, Minneapolis uh, neighborhoods and underserved groups. And there was just a quick sketch of what that might look like uh, on this site. Um, basically, office component, they have some back room uh, storage or warehousing components as they store canoes and things for some of their trips. And in this case, they show some housing on the site also. Uh, the, the next uh, response uh, was from the organization looking to create a bicycle center. Um, the, a, an organization called Factory Action Sports Gym has been operating. I believe they're out of the uh, their, their current space and are looking for a new space. They were actually quite detailed in uh, spelling out the details of their lease agreement, but it provided little in the way of a direct response to the questions posed uh, in our resolution. They do show an image of what that space would look like. Basically, they're looking for a large empty space where they could move their skills facilities. The last one was from Elam Church, and um, they they actually have expanded beyond the idea of a 24-hour center um, that they would propose to rebuild, or reuse the, the existing building, which um, I think at the time they didn't understand the conditions of that building. Um, they further proposed working with Envision to create what they call a two-year live demonstration, looking at a new model of housing with eight to 12 micro homes. They actually got into a fair amount of detail on the cost and investment. And on the next uh, slide, uh, they demonstrate what that might look like. It, was, it essentially is what they call a common house in the image on, on the lower right, you can see where that's pointed out. And then a series of micro homes that provide uh, housing that are somehow attached or related to that. So on the next slide, we just get into some of the discussion points. Um, we would like some direction. If there is a, a desire uh, to advance discussions on this with any of these groups, um, we would want further, we would want help in discerning which of the responses we actually pursue. Um, and if you don't like any of these, we're wondering if we should pursue this again or simply set this process aside. Um, if, I don't know that we would want to take any action uh, tonight, but if there are some of those that just don't seem to align, we could eliminate those. Um, I think a big question about ownership of the property uh, needs to be considered as we compare the merits of any response. Um, one more slide forward, please. Um, um, and, and basically, if, if we get into this, what kind of, the, the biggest question would be what kind of priority should staff be directing to this effort? Um, I don't. I don't want to frame the uh, these as yes or no questions. We're really looking for direction, and to tell us, I think, to move us in a direction uh, would be appreciated. 
to tell us that for now we don't have enough information and we would prefer that the land be what it is and we wait until we develop a park there that's a fair response as well so really we're looking at uh, we're looking for any kind of direction that the board might be able to give us um, to advance towards some uh, goal that they might have the last slide just simply recaps uh, what the four responses were um, copies of the of all the responses were emailed to all the commissioners uh, this afternoon oh. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder. Um, I'm going to start off with my initial um, thoughts on this, and then I'll uh, go to Commissioners Music and Forney. Um, so, like, I, I feel like I would be open to uh, turning this entire space into park. If we can't do that, uh, then, and, you know, there, there's been kind of an assumption that there would be a building there. Um, you know, if, I, th I think we should proceed with demolishing the existing one uh, and, and going with the new one. Um, but if there's going to be a building there, uh, then I think what probably makes um, the most sense to me is to have uh, some kind of park-like uh, recreation activity on the ground floor. And then I would be open uh, to partnering with, with some other organization uh, to put something above the ground floor. Um, so I, I think my initial thought is that a combination that could work well is a combination between Wilderness Inquiry and uh, ELIM slash Envision. Uh, if, if Wilderness Inquiry had something on the first floor, uh, then there could be um, some type of shelter or housing for people transitioning from homelessness above that. I, I have heard um, a lot of feedback from people who don't want to feel like they're in someone else's backyard when they're in a park. Um, I feel like it would be possible to design a project in such a way that you didn't feel like that, like if you had um, the housing part kind of more centered on the, on the street and well there's inquiry and that recreation activity uh, focused toward the river, I think that um, could work. Uh, but that would be, you know, something new for the, the park board to take on, so um, I definitely want to hear what the thoughts of other commissioners are on that. But that would be my, my initial thought is I, I think it would be great to, to partner with those two if we can make that work. And I know that um, Greg Weiss of uh, uh, Wilderness Inquiry was, was definitely interested in that. Um, so it seems like at least at this point something that, that could work. Um, what I don't want is to just leave it sitting there. So the, the last option you mentioned, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, is the first one that I would eliminate. I'd, I'd like to use this for something better than a dilapidated old, old building. Uh, Commissioner Musich. Mr. Musich, are, are you there? Can you hear, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Uh, thank you, Chair Meyer, for letting me speak. I'm not on this committee, so I appreciate that opportunity. Um, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, were state park acquisition funds utilized to acquire this property? Um, Commissioner Mishich, we looked into that and we don't believe that they were. We have some funds that were uh, used from uh, uh, WMO, um, but we would want to look at the source of those funds also. But initially, we didn't think so. Okay, but we did receive grant funds from another institution to acquire this property for parkland. We did. Okay. And <clears throat> so in order to sell the property or repurpose it for some use other than parks, would we not have to prove to a court that this is no longer needed as parkland? Uh, Chair Meyer, Commissioner Musich, in fact, we would need to go through some kind of a process. I don't know if it would include a district court process. Um, and one of the things that I noted um, or and probably skipped over is I don't know that every entity that we uh, would talk to 
uh, would want a uh, like fee simple ownership of the property. Um, some are willing, or maybe most are willing, to enter into some kind of a lease agreement with the park board. But but still, uh, your your question is on target because we would have uh, a necessary due diligence period to understand if there are implications on moving from uh, the the uh, what we show in the above the false plan to some of the direction. Okay, thank you for that information. And then this area of the city is designated as an area as part of our, um, whatever it's called, <laughs> um, comprehensive plan, the one that we're currently under, as being undersourced in parks for um, the city. Is that accurate? Uh, Chair Meyer, Commissioner Musich, I think that's correct, and I think that um, the the notion of the above the falls plan, even though when you look at the land area, it doesn't provide for lots of land acres, um, it provides for lots of uh, linear recreation opportunities. Um, we know that there we have a long ways to go in acquiring land along the east bank of the river um, because there are so many parcels, um, and in fact. Um, Trying to get there is going. It, it will. It will be continue to be a long and difficult task. We've looked at the property immediately to the south of this as a potential acquisition, and it was um, it was significantly uh, expensive for us to even begin considering it. We haven't given up on that yet, um, but acquiring properties and, and getting to the end of this is going to be a long road. Okay. Um the other question I had for you was around the CIP. Where in the CIP is this property right now? Uh, Chair Meyer, Commissioner Musich, um, because this is uh, not designated as a park, it's actually in the CIP, this was designated as the operations center, and I don't think that we've ever moved away from a designation as the operations center. We haven't um, looked at it as a leased property, like. 1828 Marshall, which we discussed a few minutes ago. It's basically park board, uh, park board owned, but not park land right now. So it's not okay. in the Okay, and then um, going back through uh, the information about this property, I came across the affidavit concerning real property contaminated with hazardous substances, <laughs> um, where we outline a number of environmental issues with this building, including concentrations concentrations of trichloethylene, trichlochloroethylene, um, which is detected in soil vapor samples um, exceeding 10 times the industrial intrusion screening value. Yada yada yada. It goes on and on about um, various pollutants that have been located on this property. So <sighs> um, I know that was a big part of the reason that we decided not to move forward with just remodeling to make this an operations center because it was not safe for people to be in this space. Was that information provided to the people um, that have reached out to us to say, yep, we're interested in doing something here? Do they understand the amount of environmental remediation that would be required in order to do something here, such as they've proposed? Uh, Chair, Chair Meyer, Commissioner Musich, we didn't provide that level of detailed background information. We would if we proceeded with any one of them. We, um, we recognize that this site, like every other site that we'll probably ever acquire along the river, will require some level of remediation. Uh, for some, we got into a fair amount of detail about the building. Um, and we've told, I think, all of them in the RFP that we don't go into the building uh, because of environmental issues. Um, the environmental issues now are even probably greater than what you're describing. Um, but one of the things that, that we recognize is that any development, any activities that we do on this site will require remediation. Um, soil vapors are, are not unlike some of the things we came across at uh, the shear site when we acquired and remediated that. So there would be significant activity related to environmental analysis uh, that would be required here. Okay. Um, and then I looked into Envision Community a little bit, and it seems to be a program of Hennepin County. And so I guess I'm wondering why it is that they're not utilizing any of their vacant properties <laughs> to do this, but rather expecting the park board to use land that's 
slated to be parkland um, in an area that has significant um, access issues to parks to turn it into a homeless shelter. So could you help me understand uh, what Hennepin County's logic is around not using their own properties for this housing experiment that they're proposing? Chair Meyer, Commissioner uh, Musich, I can't help you understand why Hennepin County is not looking at their own properties. Um, what I will tell you is that the proposal or the response came from Elam Church, and it was only at some point after that that uh, they started talking about um, the, the uh, relationship with uh, Envision. Uh, to be fair about what we've done, we haven't had uh, really any discussions with any of these groups, even though it's been several months since they've responded. Um, so there, the likelihood that some of these groups have moved on to other ideas is possible. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, I, I appreciate the context that you've provided. Uh, I, <laughs> we've been experimenting with temporary housing. It's been a total failure. I have no interest in seeing um, any housing proposals for properties owned by the park board uh, taking place. I would, I would not be able to support them. That's so far beyond our mission and it's really damaging our ability to do our core work that I just, I can't support that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Research. Commissioner Forney. May I? Oh yeah. Um, thank you, Chair Meyer. Uh, first of all, I'd say I'm really excited that we got um, as much interest um, and varied. <laughs> um, Thing I was on the original Bow the Falls. Um, to me, the number one thing that has always been paramount is activating a riverfront. Um, and and so uh, whatever it is that you said, um, Michael, about um, the homeless, um, uh, the 24-hour center expanded, whatever, that they necessarily don't want to be close to parkland is yeah, you know, doesn't doesn't um, connect, you know, with what the vision, you know, for above the falls is. So, um, and I agree, you know, wholeheartedly, you know, with uh, Commissioner Musich that um, we are not um, in unsheltered business. Although I, I voted for that just because uh, the governor, we had no other choice. Anyway, um, so I, I, I would, you know, shy away with it from that. I'm, I'm excited though that, you know, there's groups that are, are looking into every nook and cranny, but I do not think it's appropriate. Number one, on the river. Number two, um, in the above the falls. Um, and, uh, number three, it, it just, it, it is counterintuitive to everything that we want to accomplish, um, with our expansion, um, above the falls. So, um, what I'm seeing is basically um, what was envisioned for um, the shear site, parcel D, um, might potentially be 1720 Marshall. And, uh, you know, are, are we looking at uh, a new or a, an alternative or a, a whatever, different way of what the LOPIT basically uh, proposed? Um, and, um, I find that very exciting, I, I, very, very exciting. Um, you know, I'd heard before about, I'm sorry, I did not, you know, pick up your um, report there um, before, Michael. So, but I've, I had heard the inter wilderness inquiry. So I'm probably the most prone to that. Um, I believe that they bring, you know, great field resources. Um, I, I could see a long-term MOU with them. Um, like I said, very similar to um, what we um, were able to accomplish with the LOPIC. Um, so uh, I think it's almost more a, a background check of each one of those, the, the first three, you know, who brings perhaps, you know, um, resources to be able to, as I say, I think the number one imperative is activating our riverfront. Um, that, that is what, it, what the master plan was put there for. And um, so um, I, I would, you know, um, probably right now um, move towards, you know, wilderness inquiries and developing a conversation with them 
but I, I think that resources is an important thing that we should be um, um, researching, you know, on these, the, the first three of those um, um, interested parties. I, I think it's very exciting. Um, the whole mitigation, you know, of the, uh, the remediation, um, yeah, that's going to be a huge lift. And um, how we put that in, whether or not it's going to be in a bonding, or you know how how we deal with it. Um, but um, and we've already done it once with Shear, so I, I would imagine that um, we know that route. So um, particularly under your stewardship. So thank you for seeking these out, and I hope that gives you some guidance of what I would like to see um, on that parcel. Thank you, Commissioner Forney, Commissioner French. Uh, uh, Sister Superintendent uh, Schroeder, uh, I, I think I contacted you or somebody else from planning maybe a maybe a couple of months ago and, and inquired about this 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 building, and I was told that it 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 it, it was it's beyond repair. It has it's going to cost like five or ten thousand dollars to get the asbestos out. I was told basically don't even like it's, and I'm trying to figure out what changed in the last couple of months that made this. Uh, such a um, an attractive site for for what, what for what we're trying to do, Chair Meyer, Commissioner French. I I don't think things have changed in the last couple of months. The conditions in this building remain the same. As we've talked to people, we've told them this building should come down right now. I really consider this building to be a liability for us. Um, and once we do that, the the, the question would be, uh, is absent someone coming in investing really, I think, a significant amount of money in an old building that has real problems, the, the better opportunity is to demolish the building and start over, if, if, the, if something else were to go here. Yeah, that's what I was told by staff uh, man, only a couple months ago, but maybe even, uh, I think, when we first was trying to change the name or do something with it. Uh, and I, I, I want to, I kind of want to uh, make sure that we're, we're learning the lessons that we have already been taught in the last few months. Uh, and, and if we we are not in the business of housing people, and to create a situation where we are going to create permanent housing on Parkland, I think we need to have a greater discussion with with, with folks in the community. Uh, we've made enough mistakes in the last uh, couple of months that we we need to learn from that, and we need to um, have some community some community buy in, some community investment in this. Uh, if the community isn't bought in, I don't, I don't see it working. I don't see it being successful. Um, so that's, that's how I'm riding right now. Commissioner Vito. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Um, I don't have any questions, but I just want to say where I am right now on this project. Uh, at this point, I support the demolition of this building because I was told previously that this is not good. Um, and that there's a lot of problems with this site and that the best value would be um, the demolition of this site. And also, um, just in the future, I'm only, you know, willing to have conversations about recreation space. We're a park board, and I think we need to create recreation opportunities. I, I'm, I recall having a conversation with staff about this being an area in our city that has fewer parks and we need um, more in this particular area. So I am, um, at this point, I'm only interested in having conversations around this site being used for some type of recreation services. That's it for me. All right. Any other commissioners? I guess I'll add just a final thought that I don't feel that housing on top of a building would interfere with, you know, recreation activities that I feel that for a lot of our buildings, the airspace above them is wasted and not used for anything. Um, so um, I feel like if we were to, like, I, I think, you know, we, we absolutely should demolish this building. If we were to create a new one, I, I think it would be a little bit wasteful to have it just be a, a one story building. Um, but I will, Leave it at that unless there are any further comments. Uh, seeing none, I believe that was the last item on our agenda. I have to pull it up again. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you.
All right. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Or actually, I I'm, keep forgetting. I'm just going to declare the meeting to be adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay, then I will convene the Administration and Finance Committee. Would the Secretary please call the roll? Commit or Vice President Vita. Present. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner French. Here. Here. Vice Chair Hassan. Here. Chair Forney. Here. You have a quorum. I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Okay. Um, just wanted to say all those in favor. Secretary, please call the roll. <laughs> Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. I'll take a motion to approve the minutes Wednesday, July 15, 2020. So moved. Secretary, would you please call the roll again? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. Okay, we have a few action items. Um, the first one is a really big one, which is uh, Resolution 2020 to 90. Uh, resolution. Do you want to move it? <laughs> yeah, if you want to call, read it, that's fine. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll move to Resolution 2020 290, a resolution requesting the Board of Estimate and Taxation set the mo maximum property tax levy for the 2021 budget at an estimated amount of $70,326,000, an increase of 1.18% to be allocated to the park and recreation levy in the amount of $68,911,000 and the tree preservation and reforestation levy in the amount, in the amount of $1,415,000. Okay, so this is a biggie, you guys. So we've got a presentation, I think. Coming up here. And I believe it's Julie and Jennifer. Is, this, is that my correct? Chair Forney and commissioners, I have a presentation for the maximum property tax levy. Uh, and um, this is a presentation that I feel like I need to give. It's important information. Um, I will try to be as succinct as possible. I want to start with the uh, mayor's budget address that happened last Friday. The 2021 mayor's recommended budget, if you advance to the next slide. During his budget address, uh, it, he used it to serve as a budget snapshot in time. So because of COVID, because of their um, needing to do a revised city budget, uh, there is not a detailed budget and budget book available at this time. That will become available by the end of September. So a lot of the information that has been um, provided thus far from the city of Minneapolis is very high level um, and um, very consolidated. Uh, so when you look at the city's general fund, uh, we've had these presentations at our budget retreat. 55% of ongoing general fund revenues are garnered from sources outside of property taxes. The city is um, expecting to experience a, a negative $35.5 million shift 
in those general fund revenues due to the recession and due to the impact related to COVID. The mayor in his address is utilizing a combination of cuts, reorganization, and an increase to property taxes to address this shortfall. If you direct to the next slide, please. The top part of this shows all of the city of Minneapolis revenues, and you'll see charges for services, state government revenues, which is the local government aid cut, sales and other taxes, license and permits, franchise fees, federal government fees, and other revenues are all experiencing decreases. So the impact of COVID and the recession is hitting the city of Minneapolis to a great level. The last line on this chart shows the estimated city of Minneapolis operating expenditures, and they are expecting to need to cut 8% of their operating expenditures, and that's even with a slight increase to city property taxes. If you advance to the next slide. This chart that the mayor provided in his documentation is the six-year capital investment allocation, and what this outlines is a support for the continuation of our 20-year neighborhood park plan, as well as the 20-year street program. So at this point, there are no reductions in either of those programs. Advance to the next slide. The mayor's recommended property tax levy increase is 5.75%. For the city's general fund, it's an estimated 8% increase. So again, the city's general fund is estimated to be reduced by $35.5 million in revenues, so they are planning to increase property taxes to make up part of that gap, $19.2 million. The mayor has recommended a 1.18% property tax levy for the park board, and then you see the other adjustments. So the overall property tax levy increase of 5.75%, I will show a little bit later how that's going to impact or how they're estimating that will impact property owners. There is a tax increment financing district that is dropping off of the property taxes, which means there's a larger property base available in 2021, so the impact is going to be felt a little bit less for homeowners. If you advance to the next slide. For the park board, what's significant about the 1.18% levy increase for the park board, our increase is $820,000. That's the amount that the city had been transferring to us or transferred this year to us for the common. The city transfer would be eliminated, and the commons, as we have taken over the operations and maintenance of the commons, would become a part of our property tax base. We also are experiencing a reduction in our tree preservation and reforestation levy. That's a planned reduction as we phase out that levy, which next year, the 2021 is our last year of that levy. And that decrease was transferred as an increase to our general fund. So basically, even though we're getting a 1.1% increase, in essence, it's a 0% increase in total for the park board with the other reduction. Advance to the next slide. 
So this is a chart that the city provided uh, with the p potential um, impacts to property owners. So homesteaded residential um, properties will actually see a property de uh, a property tax decrease. Uh, the items that will have an increase or could experience an increase will be apartments and commercial properties and uh, potentially some non-homesteaded residential property. So before you, you have resolution 2020-290 for the uh, park board uh, recommendation for a maximum property tax levy. Uh, advance the slide. In our budget retreat conversations, I will remind this board that we had a lot of conversation about COVID, about the recession, about the impacts to property owners. And what we heard from this board is that um, there was not support for a current service level budget when it came to property taxes this year. And what we heard from commissioners is that they were willing to go anywhere between a 0% property tax levy increase up to a 3% property tax levy increase. So with this in front of you, if you advance the slide, the impact of us going into uh, the superintendent's budget development as he works on a recommended um, budget if this um, resolution is passed with the recession and with the COVID combined, we will be looking at a $6.4 million deficit going into this budget cycle. That equates to about 7% or that equates to 7% um, of our estimated budget. So we, at this point, um, are slightly in a slightly better position than the 8% cut that the city of Minneapolis uh, is facing. Next slide, please. For the 20-year neighborhood park plan, I wanted to just touch on this a little bit because I've, I've heard a lot of conversations um, amongst board members and amongst city council members regarding uh, the 20 year neighborhood park plan um, and whether we whether there should be a pause in that plan in 2021. If you remember in June during the budget retreat, we talked about our 2021 budget framework. In June, this board adopted the 2021 budget framework included in there. Uh, was item E that the board remained committed to the $10.5 million investment and that this board recognizes that um, during a period of recession, they understood that capital construction during those periods has the potential to stimulate the economy and it could result in more attractive bond interest rates and may drive bids to a more favorable uh, position for capital and rehabilitation projects. So um, when we entered into conversations with uh, the mayor and with city staff, uh, the superintendent, the president of the board um, and park board staff made it very clear that we were very much in support of retaining the $10.5 million uh, for the 20 year park plan if you advance the slide. The other thing that I would like uh, to point out is again, the ordinance does have um, an unanticipated critical need or exigent economic event where uh, the city would have the ability to put a pause on our um, neighborhood park plan. If this did occur, this would impact um, 23 positions that are either fully funded through the capital and rehabilitation funding or partially funded. And those positions, uh, there's 12 or there's 14 positions in environmental stewardship, including asset management and trade. 
Uh, there's seven positions in planning, one position in finance, and one position in communication and marketing. So if commissioners are thinking that pausing um, the NPP 20 part plan uh, would not impact full-time uh, positions, uh, these positions are the ones that would be impacted by that type of pause. The mayor and city staff at this point have indicated that they do not believe uh, that this is a time to disinvest in our neighborhood park. Um, and the mayor um, at this point is not uh, recommending a reduction in MPP 20 funding. Next slide. So what are the next steps um, if the committee advances uh, this resolution to the full board, the full board will need to um, adopt this resolution or some amendment to this re resolution on September 2nd. Uh, we will make our formal presentation to the Board of Estimate and Taxation on September 9th. And then the Board of Estimate and Taxation sets the 2021 maximum property tax levies on September 23rd. With that, I will open it up to any questions. I'm looking to see if there's any commissioners that have their hands raised. Yes, okay, Commissioner French. Oh, my, I didn't even realize, but I do have a question. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we're 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 asking for more money than we we asked for last year. Is what we're saying? We're asking for a higher percentage of, of taxes, right? Um, Commish, uh, Chair Forney and Commissioner French, uh, we are asking for a one point one eight percent property tax levy increase. So what? that is. Um, that is slightly more, $820,000 more than what we levied in 2020. I, 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 guess, I, am, I guess I am kind of, last year there was a lot, of, a lot of debate, and there was a lot of resistance on having a higher tax levy. Uh, this year we are in the, last year was a, it was a was, the economy was booming, right? This year we have a, a budget, Sure, Paul, we're, we're sliding to a recession, maybe even into a depression, uh, and we're asking for more money. And I'm, I'm just, I'm like last year we had tons of money and we didn't want to fund the park system at the level it should be. This year we're in the economic crisis. And so I, I just want other commissioners to, to, to think about some of the debates we had last year about the scarcity of, of funds and the scarcity of resources. And now we're, we're going to ask taxpayers, uh, to pay more in the time where they're making less probably and they're bringing home less. And so I'm just, I'm curious of where the quick switch was. Uh, when, when, there's a, when there's an abundance of, of resources, uh, we don't ask for what we need. And then now there's, a, there's kind of a, uh, a restriction of resources and, and, we're not, and we're asking for more than more. I'm, I'm just confused, so thank you. I don't know if you can answer that question or not, or maybe I'm just making a comment. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringel, would you mind putting slide nine back up? So uh, I just want to uh, just highlight that our 1.1% property tax levy increase equates to a 0.2% overall city um, tax levy increase. So we are very, we are, even with a $820,000 increase, we are very close to being at zero. And, and I guess uh, the other thing that I would say is that the $820,000 uh, put the common funding into a funding source that the park board um, controls. 
instead of having it be the city's um, allocation to us, which we then need to negotiate with them each and every year. Thank you, Director Wiseman, for explaining that to me. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, I see uh, Commissioner Vita. I'm sorry. I didn't have it up. Oh, okay. Is there anybody else that nobody else? Is that correct? Okay. So, uh, Commissioner Forney, I would like to speak if you'd allow me. Oh, please. Please. That's nice. Thank you. Oh. Yep. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Corney, for allowing me to speak, uh, though I'm not on the committee. I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, so to Commissioner French's question, um, you know, there was a lot of debate in past years about uh, going beyond uh, level of service increase uh, for our property tax levy. Uh, we are not getting a level of service increase here with a 1.18% tax levy increase. Uh, we're really not getting anything. It's effectively zero percent. If you'll recall, last year we were given, you know, given the commons back um, and was given one-time dollars for that, and this essentially covers that. Um, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we don't have uh, additional, um, uh, really, a lot of wiggle room when we're talking about raising property taxes in a difficult time, uh, and I, I certainly. Uh, kind of agree with you there, um, but I, I do think that it's um, welcome that the mayor acknowledged uh, that we, we essentially have an unfunded mandate with taking on the commons and building that into our levy is pretty critical going forward as we figure out how to um, manage and maintain that additional space which we've taken on and which I'll remind you that, that most commissioners voted for to have, have us maintain and have our union staff maintain going forward. We need to be able to fund that and fund the people that are doing that work. Um, so that's just the context that I would I would give and I encourage commissioners to support uh, this levy increase. Thanks. Thank you. I don't see any, I see uh, two hands raised just because they haven't gotten lowered. So uh, if you guys could do that, I would appreciate it. Um, information, I Chair Forney, I think you can put their hands down as the um, chair of the meeting. I don't see it, but um, I, I don't think. OK. I've been, like handed, forgot I've been handed the, you know, whatever um, reigns. But um, thank you. Everybody's taking their hands down. I appreciate it. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, President Colgill that I think this is an, an amazing um, uh, turnaround. Um, first of all, I would, it would I don't know if delight's the right word, but it, it, to me, it, it just speaks volumes that um, the mayor um, is seeing the benefit of the MPP 20. I think that is 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 huge. You know uh, that that commitment is there. Um, it, you know what is the extent? You know whatever. Um, it, these times are those, um, but he, he understands that, you know, and, and that the the value of having um, uh, the continuation of the MPP-20. Um, and then also the, the fact of acknowledging the fact that, uh, you know, instead of us having to go and ask for the comments, anyway, I, I appreciate, you know, whatever the finance uh, director, Rose Corber, you know, was the one who created that. Um, is, is um, it, it puts more into our control, and I think that's um, um, a value. Um, and and I do agree that you know really this is equivalent to a zero uh, service uh, level um, level. Um, so it, I would encourage everybody to vote for it. And um, so um, with that. Uh, would the secretary please call the roll? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. 
Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. Thank you, and I apologize. I just saw that you had said something in the chat, um, President Cogill. So moving on then to our new uh, two next action items, would um, somebody please um, uh, read Resolution 20, 2292. 2291? 202291, yes. Yes. Well, I'd like to move sorry. Resolution 2291, a resolution approving the lease agreement with Take Action Minnesota. Education fund lease and commercial space at 18, 1828 Marshall Street, Northeast, suite number 16, located within the above the Falls Regional Park for a term of six months, effective September 15, 2020. Great. Um, any presentation that people need on this? Any questions they have? I'm sorry, I got to look for a raised hand. I'm not seeing any raised hands. Nobody's interested? Okay. Going once, going twice. Uh, Secretary, would you please call the roll on this resolution? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. I would like to accuse myself. Uh, Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have four ayes, one recused. All okay. right. Somebody move resolution 2020 this time. I'll move resolution 2020 a resolution approving lease agreement with Jamie Ross leasing commercial space at 1828 Marshall Street Northeast, suite number 3A. Located within the above the Falls Regional Park for a term of one year, effective September 15th, 2020. Thank you. Anybody need to have a presentation on this? Any discussion? I'm not seeing any hands. Going once, going twice. All those in favor? Oh, excuse me. Secretary, would you please call the roll? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. And I will declare this meeting adjourned before 11 o'clock at 10.30.